Test, test. Oh, good one.
Good morning, Judge. Ready when you are. Okay, I don't want to go on the record right away. Yeah, before we go on the record, um, I just wanted to mention one thing. Uh, I've been told that um, today is Mr. Lee's birthday. And uh, so I want to wish, Mr. Lee, I want to wish you a happy birthday. Thank and, you, Judge. Uh, Kind of sorry that you need to be doing this on your birthday, but uh, <laughs> there's no, I would rather be here with you people than with the finest people on earth. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are the finest people on earth, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, happy birthday, and uh, everyone uh, is asked to be good to the hearings to the, to the hearing today, that's for sure. but well also, to the hearing examiner too <laughs> but also be good to the court reporter today so <laughs> that, that's my request for today okay all right um david you want to go on the record now yes sir examiner Shinar, may i just raise something before we go on or if we after it i don't know you you choose i think that thank you for your order this morning and happy birthday Mr. Lee, um, I believe wait, that there's- Wait, 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 wait. We're, we're not on the, we're going on the record now. Let's go. Good morning, uh, Mr. Nazi. Uh, what did you want to speak about? Good morning. Um, and again, happy birthday, Mr. Lee. Um, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I believe that there's a, a slight error in your order this morning. Um, thank you for that. Uh, there, it exhibit, Revised exhibit need 22 is not the answers to interrogatories um, of new energy economy. It's the answers to interrogatories of NM area. And that's the only slight um, correction I would ask you to consider. Okay, thank you for that. I, I believe you're correct. And actually that's why I wanted to uh, put these into uh, an order so that, so that it can be clear uh, in the record and to the court reporter uh, what is actually being uh, admitted. So, so thank you. Uh, I will uh, make that change. Um, so with that, I have a few more things to bring up. Oh, uh, Mr. Albright. Uh, yes, sir. Um my apologies to the group there. You may see an email. I was uh, trying to connect to the wrong Zoom link. So my apologies to my colleagues uh, for that. But I did have one administrative uh, matter that I wanted to bring up. I can certainly wait until you're finished as well. Uh, no, bring yours up because I'm maybe thinking that it might be one of the things I wanted to talk about. Go ahead. Okay, just uh, from my procedural point of view, I had some time reserved for uh, Mr. Small. And uh, I'm going to waive my cross-examination of Mr. Small. I would like to shift that time to Ms. Crane. I doubt if I will need all of that, but whatever I don't use, we'll just revert to the, uh, for the good of the whole. So 35 minutes for Ms. Crane and nothing yes. for Mr. Small. Correct, I'll just waive Mr. Small. Okay, I was thinking you might be talking about uh, Miss Seg Seguin. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. Seguin. Uh, See, her, her name is pronounced Seguin. This is Joan Drake. Oh. Uh, is that Se Seguin? Seguin, right. Seguin, okay. I'll try to make note of that. I know there were only a few minutes, but I did have a couple of questions uh, related uh, to her uh, okay. most recent uh, testimony that she filed with regard to the stipulation. Okay, all right. Well, then we will get to her today. Um, the, and, if the matter- And Mr. Hearing Examiner, on that same note, or di slightly different, uh, we went back through uh, what, what we uh, 
put on the record uh, with our cross-examination of the other two PM witnesses. And uh, we're willing to waive uh, the 15 minutes that we save for Mr. Fridley so that we can get through. I know we're behind, so we can get through stuff today. Okay, thank you. Well, is anyone else interested in waiving any uh, cross-examination? Okay. Um, I wanted to bring up a few matters. <clears throat> One is um, I uploaded to Dropbox uh, yesterday a, uh, a document that I'm titling Commission Exhibit 11. It's the uh, Joint Applicants August 12, 2021 Notice of Filing of September 2019 Internal Audit Report with all annexes. Uh, I'm sure you remember that uh, during the questioning of Mr. Azagra Blazquez last week on uh, Commission Exhibits 7 and 8, uh, those, that questioning regarded uh, the uh, internal audit report and Price Waterhouse Cooper's uh, report that was done uh, in connection with the, uh, uh, the events underlying the criminal investigation in Spain. And uh, there was uh, omitted from those exhibits uh, certain uh, appendices. Uh, and uh, those appendices and the entire internal audit report were filed on Thursday, late Thursday of last week in Spanish and in English. And the filing that was made uh, last Thursday is what is contained in Commission Exhibit 11. So I'm going to be offering Commission Exhibit 11 into evidence. And uh, I don't know if anyone has paid attention to that filing or reviewed it. Uh, uh, I guess I would be asking now whether there's any objection to the admission of that uh, exhibit or whether anyone needs more time to review it before they decide whether uh, it should be omit admitted or not. Okay, I don't hear any objection. I don't hear any requests for uh, delay in regard to that. So I'm going to admit now uh, Commission Exhibit 11. The other item, uh, Ms. Nanazi mentioned the, the order that I issued this morning about uh, the NEE exhibits from the August 11th hearing. Uh, this morning, we were going to uh, also deal with uh, the objections that the joint applicants have or may have to the exhibits that uh, NEE asked to be admitted at the August 12th hearing. Uh, and uh, with the, the detail that uh, uh, was provided on uh, was provided later in regard to that, that request. Um, did the joint applicants have any objections to those, uh, that second set of exhibits? Hey, Your Honor, Rick Alvedris uh, on behalf of PNM and PNMR, and we do have uh, objections that we're ready to um, lodge right now at your, at your convenience. Yes, let's, let's take care of that then. So the um, exhibits were pre presented in um, not in a numerical order. So I, we, I've, I'll take them in the in the order in which they appeared on the sheet that was provided by NEE. Or, or would you rather me go go through starting with the smallest numbered exhibit first and, or, and uh, working up? It's up to you, Your Honor. Now go ahead with. Go ahead with the exhibits as they were labeled on uh, NEE's uh, sheet. Okay, for uh, NEE 32, there is no objection. For a revised NEE Exhibit 9, which we understand to encompass NEE inter interrogatories 9 1, 9 14, 9 16, and 9 28, we don't have any objection to. Any interrogatories 9 1, 9 14, or 9 28. We do object to 
NE 916 on grounds that it was not timely provided and is not relevant. Okay. Your next so moving, one. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so moving to uh, any exhibit 9A, which uh, is an entirely new exhibit, uh, we have no objection to uh, 928 or 928 SIC. There were duplicate uh, 928s, and the latter one was denominated SIC. Uh, we do object to uh, any 9 9. It was not used in cross. And uh, it's not relevant. Uh, we object to 912 as it was not used in cross and also on relevance grounds. And we object to uh, 913, which was not used in cross, is not relevant and was not timely provided. Can you continue? Continue. Uh, NE 31, we have no objection. NEE revised exhibit 12. Uh, we have no objection to NEE 12.5, which we understand was the only uh, additional uh, interrogatory that was part of that. Uh, I, I'm question. sorry, but 12, 6, A, B, and C were also yeah. questioned about. Actually, right, I have, I have, those are separate exhibits, and I haven't gotten to them yet. So, uh, turning to any exhibits 12A, B, and C, uh, there, were, there was no substantive cross about um, the contents of these exhibits. They were simply acknowledged that they were, you know, produced, but there was no substantive cross. And so we object, uh, as these could have been brought forth in the uh, uh, NE's case in chief. Mr. Hearings, I mean, would you like me to respond about those three right now before we go on or no? No, uh, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with regard to any Exhibit 24, uh, we previously uh, moved to strike. Uh, we simply reassert our hearsay objection on that. Uh, with regard to any Exhibit 25, there's no objection. With regard to any Exhibit 26, there's no objection. With regard to revised any Exhibit 1, uh, we understand the two interrogatories uh, for which any seeks admission are any 16, 1-16 and any 1-67. We have no objection to either of those. With regard to any 27, we have no objection. With regard to NE28, we have no objection. With regard to NE30, we have no objection. And with regard to NE uh, revised four, uh, we understand that the only uh, interrogatory that is the subject of the motion to admit is NE455, to which we have no objection. With regard to uh, revised any Exhibit 5, uh, we understand that the only interrogatory at issue uh, in that uh, specific exhibit is any 27, uh, and we object to that on uh, relevance grounds. And I believe that covers the list of, of the exhibits that any moved last week. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Nanazi. Yeah, the only thing that I, I um, have a problem with is uh, 12, 6, A, B, and C. I believe there are questions um, on all of them, and Mr. Davis specifically asked about them, um, including the 282 pages of poll violations. I believe that you, can, you might remember that the cross-examination about that. Um, 
and A and B were specifically asked about. Um, there was not extensive cross-examination, but um, Mr. Kump definitely acknowledged that these were his answers and um, this, this was the production that um, he gave um, as a result, the A and B and C. So other than that, I think that um, I, I just haven't looked at 916, but other than that, um, which I'll look at right now. Well, It's, I mean, it's clearly relevant, but it was asked in, in Mr. Davis's testimony, 916, about does Central Maine Power have a political action committee? The answer was yes. And I think he was asked specifically about that. Um, and he, but it, yeah, so um, it, it, it was timely and it is relevant. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll issue an order that, uh, uh, which uh, exhibits I will be uh, admitting, just like I did uh, uh, this morning. Thank you so much. Next item uh, is really just briefly talk about the order of witnesses for today. Uh, we're starting with Mr. Fridley. I see he's on the, the screen. Uh, then we're going to move to uh, Andrea Crane. And at, at that time, we'll also have uh, Mr. Hempel's uh, prior testimony be uh, uh, admitted. And then uh, Mr. Small, uh, well, I guess maybe we should take uh, Ms. Seguin for Mr. Small, just to uh, make sure that uh, we get her done today, because uh, that will only take a, a few minutes. So. Uh, unless there's a, anyone has a problem with this, we'll go with Mr. Fridley, Ms. Crane, uh, Ms. Seguin, uh, Mr. Small, and then down through the regular order there, Noah Long, Ona Porter, and Doug Howe, uh, and see how that goes. Also, just uh, to give people a heads up, um, I can see that Tuesday is going to be uh, very light in terms of the, the witnesses that are uh, identified there for cross-examination. So I, I wanna move witnesses from Wednesday up into Tuesday. Uh, and uh, to the extent we can get those people on on Tuesday and which will also maybe move people from Thursday into Wednesday. Uh, but we'll see how that all goes. But I think we're going to start moving faster uh, once we're finished with uh, Mr. Fridley, Ms. Crane, and, uh, and Mr. Small. Uh, so just a heads up, we we're gonna need to, we're gonna want to uh, keep moving with witnesses. And so <clears throat> the witnesses that are on this list will likely get moved up. Um, Mr. Hearing Examiner? Yes. There's an echo, I hope it's not on my end. Um, Doug Howe is available tomorrow but he's not available the rest of the week. So if we don't get to him today, I think we probably will, but I'm not positive. He is available tomorrow. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, uh, well, let's, uh, let's start then with uh, Mr. Fridley. Uh, I don't know who's presenting him. Mr. Hearing Examiner, before we get to uh, Mr. Fridley, can you hear me? This is Peter Gould. Yes. Um, this issue has come up. We haven't uh, with uh, some of the cross examination of the joint applicants witnesses. Um, and we've not raised an objection to any of that testimony. <laughs> but as, as you have noticed during the cross examination, um, PNM renumbered their exhibits according to some numbering system that's different from the filed numbering system. So as long as we're admitting joint applicants and PNS um, testimonies, if we could get uh, your permission to 
use on cross-examination if we need to the filed page numbering rather than the new page numbering that that has been introduced in the Dropbox. And, and we'd like that understanding as well for uh, the post-hearing briefing. Um, we don't object to them numbering at the top of the page, but it, we think it's confusing if we cannot, if we can't use the actual filed numbering. Um, and so to the extent that we, I, I just wanted some clarity on that and, and uh, at, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, if I may respond, I think this would be helpful. Yes. Um, on uh, Thursday, we indicated to you that uh, in the process of uploading certain of the testimonies, uh, a few of them uh, omitted, for whatever reason, the page numbers at the bottom. And with your permission, we uploaded uh, corrected version so that everything that is in our in the PM Dropbox or the Joint Applicant Dropbox, I should say, uh, is is now um, you know identical to what was filed uh, in the in the case, including the the numbers at the bottom, uh, with the exception of any typographical changes, which uh, you know we've been reading into the record as we present the witnesses. So I, I think this obviates the concerns that Mr. Gould has. Yeah, I, I don't understand that there has been any change in the numbering. Uh, my understanding is that the numbering on the uh, the documents has just been made more apparent. Uh, okay. That there, there's a page number on the bottom of, of some pages, and then there's then they've labeled exhibits up in the type top right hand corner with a a page of of 42 for example or page of 45 you know page 2 of 45 and that page 2 of 45 might not correspond to the page number on the bottom but um, there hasn't been any change in the numbering as far as i'm concerned uh, or as far as i'm aware so uh, it's up to you in terms of uh, how you cite to those documents in, uh, in whatever brief or whatever uh, cross-examination you do. Um, if you're gonna be citing to the page number on the bottom of the page, indicate that. If you're gonna be citing to the page reference on the top right-hand corner of the page, indicate that. And uh, I think that would be clear enough for my purposes and I think clear enough for the record. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go ahead with Mr. Fridley. Your Honor, we call Todd Fridley. Mr. Fridley, would you raise your right hand, please? You saw me heard the testimony you're about to give in the matter of opinions. Be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Fridley, will you please state your name for the record? Todd Fridley. And where do you work? I work at PNM. And what is your position with PNM? I am Vice President of New Mexico Operations. And Mr. Fridley, did you uh, prepare or have prepared uh, direct testimony that you filed in this case? I did. And let me uh, direct you to what we've labeled as uh, Joint Applicant Exhibit 34. And can you confirm that that is your June 18, 2021 direct testimony uh, in support of the Second Amendment stipulation in this case? Yes, it is. And let me ask, do you have any changes or corrections to make to that testimony? I do. Can you uh, take us through uh, page and line number of those changes? On my direct testimony? Yes, sir. Page 16, line 13. The correction is delete the J. And on page 19, line 22, Rule 17.7.3.9, parentheses A, parentheses 12, should be 17.7.3.9, parentheses C, parentheses 12. And with those corrections, if you were asked the, the same questions uh, today, uh, would your answers be the same? Yes, they would. And is the uh, information and testimony contained in Exhibit 34 true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? 
It is. And have the corrections that you just read into the record been reflected in the uh, exhibits that were uploaded uh, to Dropbox in this case? Yes, they were. Uh, Mr. Hang Examiner, we move the admission of PM Exhibit 30, I'm uh, sorry, Joint Applicant Exhibit 34. Any objections? Okay, Joint Applicant Exhibit 34 is admitted. Okay, and uh, turning to what we've marked as Joint Applicant Exhibit 35, can you confirm that that is your July 29, 2001 rebuttal testimony filed in this case? It is. And do you have any changes or corrections to make? I do. Can you take us uh, again by page and uh, line number to those corrections? On my rebuttal testimony, page number six, line 11, the word Ariel, A-R-I-E-L, should be spelled A-E-R-I-A-L. On page 16, line 14, small s should be small a. On page 35, line 6, delete the words proposed and the word the. And on my exhibit TF-2, page 3, fourth line from the bottom, delete the word may. And do all of the corrections uh, except the one to exhibit TF2, are those all reflected in the documents that were uploaded? They were. Uh, and with regard to your correction, your proposed correction on exhibit TF2 to exhibit 35, uh, when did you discover that, um, that typographical error? Uh, I believe it was after we uploaded. Okay. With the corrections that were uh, just read into the record, if you were asked the questions that appear in your July 29 rebuttal testimony today, would your answers be the same? Yes, they would. And is that testimony is corrected, true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is. Uh, Your Honor, we move the admission of Joint Applicant Exhibit 35. I have a question. Uh, remind me what the change was to uh, JA Exhibit TF2. Uh, exhibit TF-2, page 3, fourth line from the bottom, Delete the word may. And uh, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, are you going to upload the uh, corrected version of this to Dropbox? Uh, with your permission, Your Honor, we'd be happy to. Is that last change is not indicated in the uh, in what's currently there. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Okay. Yeah, please upload the, the corrected version to, to Dropbox. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and with that, are there any objections to uh, the admission of uh, Joint Applicants Exhibit 35? Okay, Joint Applicant 35 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor, and, and Mr. Uh, Ridley is ready for questions. Okay. Uh, First on the list is the Water Authority, uh, Ms. Winter. Uh, no questions for Mr. Fridley, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Albright, you have, uh, oh no, you gave up your 10 minutes, right? Uh, no, I gave them up to Mr. Small. From Small, okay. So you have 10 minutes from Mr. Fridley. Uh, yes, sir, I think that's correct. Uh, good morning, Mr. Fridley. Morning, Mr. Albright. Um, I'm Jeff Albright with uh, J. Albright Law LLC, and I'm here uh, on behalf of uh, Bernalillo County. So I do have uh, some questions, starting with your direct testimony in support of the second amended stipulation. I have that. That was the June 18th uh, filing, I believe, correct? That's correct. Okay. There's uh, getting a little bit of feedback and I'm not sure why. Okay. We 
Could you uh, please turn to page, page three of that testimony? I have that. And on lines five to nine, you talk about the installation of the of the substation to support the, uh, to the airport. And then you also at line seven through nine, talk about work with governmental entities regarding street lighting pole attachments for broadband equipment. Do you see that language? I do. With respect to the uh, street lighting pole attachments for broadband equipment um, and working with government entities, what do you mean by that? Well, we, we would be working with uh, city and other government agencies to uh, provide it, it additional uh, access to our polls. And again, that relates in my testimony later in other sections to PNM waiving those attachment charges for a period of three years. Okay, and that would be uh, th three years from the date of the, uh, assuming there's uh, an approval of the of the uh, stipulation, or would Correct. it be that from the merger? Uh, I would be from the close of the merger. Close of the merger. And governmental entities, that would include Bernalillo County, correct? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. But it would be limited to the governmental entities within PNMs, obviously, correct? Correct. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I, the, the... Our sound went down. I didn't hear Mr. Albright's question. You like me to read it? Read it, please. But it would be limited to the governmental entities within PM service territory. Obviously, correct. Answer: Yes. Yeah, I was also uh, directed that some questions related to the regional transmission organization, the RTO were best uh, directed uh, toward you, uh, Mr. Fridley. Do you recall that from, um, from previous testimony? Yes, I did. Okay, so I'd like to turn to page uh, four, again, of the same testimony, your direct testimony. And uh, at lines five through eight, you state that uh, customers and stakeholders can also benefit from long-term transmission planning and the increased opportunities to access new resource options and regional markets that may develop in the future. Do you see that? Did I correctly state that? That's correct. And there, are you referring to the RTOs with regard to regional markets that may develop in the future? Well, yes, there's currently a regional market for energy uh, in the West called the Western Energy Imbalance Market uh, hosted by the California ISO and which PNM has recently become a member and has been participating. So again, there's the initial reference would be to that existing regional market whereby transmission allows and enables uh, PNM to trade uh, wholesale energy th through that market. Any subsequent markets related to, again, as you've referenced in previous questions about a new or uh, emerging RTO in the West, uh, it would also apply to that market as well. Should with regard to the West, with regard to the Western EIM, that's for sales on the spot market, though, correct? In in very short time frame increments or uh, on a very short time frame basis. Isn't that correct? That is correct. In general, uh, energy markets, as we know them today, have about four levels of activity. And the first level that EIM represents is the inter hour market, which means wholesale energy is being traded within the hour. Uh, the, the next version of a market, the next level of market is the day ahead market, which you've seen or heard the term EDAM, that's referenced in our testimony as well. And that advanced market is day ahead, which again provides additional market benefit. 
But on the Western EIM, that can be as short as five, 10, 15 minutes, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, I'd like to pursue a little bit with regard to when you talk about regional markets and specifically with regard to the RTO. Uh, there was statements uh, made by, um, by Mr. Blasquez with regard to the RTO and the opportunities there for, for an RTO. Do you see PNM participating in the RT in an RTO, or do you see PNM creating an RTO? Well, first, let me lay a little premise on what the RTO would be doing. And again, in the West, we are uh, without a region-wide RTO, as you well know. Correct. Uh, uh, again, the, the the concept of an RTO that exists in other areas of the country provides advanced energy markets, as I was starting to mention earlier, several levels of energy market benefit, trade and benefit. It also provides regional transmission oversight and planning and transmission operations uh, that are beneficial generally to the, the participants. It provides higher levels of reliability grid-wide, and it provides a more holistic re regional transmission plan to enable market benefit. Uh, since that does not exist in the West as we know it today, that would have to be uh, something that we are going to have to pursue as utilities to provide another option in the West for a new RTO that would be advancing those principles and benefits. Again, PNM is committed in the stipulation to pursue that endeavor through uh, starting a, a stakeholder committee in January of 2022 with the idea that if that produces benefit through a new, new RTO established in the West, PNM would submit those kinds of uh, applications to the commission for approval. Again, they have to come together to benefit customers. And again, the market benefit and the transmission benefit typically do when, when it's large enough and a wide enough scale with all the utilities. You see, without the, and the RTO would have to include the other IOUs and it would also have to include the electric co-ops, correct? Well, it would not have to include all, but it certainly would only be beneficial if most all are participating, and that's tr traditionally what occurs in the other RTOs. Most all do participate, and most all do find benefit. Could you please turn to page 18, again, of your direct testimony in support of the second amendment tip? And I appreciate the uh, lengthy uh, discourse and explanation, but my time is short. So if we can keep, keep the answers a little bit to, to a minimum there, that would be, uh, that would be most helpful. Certainly. On, page, on page 18, um, at lines 11 through 13, you indicate uh, the regulatory commitment provisions uh, found in commitments 42 and 50 relating to long-term transmission planning for PNM system and within regional market footprints. And in regional market footprints, um, are you including Mexico as part of that regional market footprint? No, not currently. Are you including Arizona and California as part of that regional market footprint? Well, we haven't established the market footprint, but presumably it would be in the Southwest region and it could include California. We have two minutes, Mr. Albright. I'm sorry? sorry. Two minutes. Two minutes. On page 22, again, of your direct testimony in support of the second step. You indicate at lines 11 through 13, joining an RTO means that a utility must transfer functional control of its transmission system, become responsible for a proportional share of regional transmission investments and be subject to regional tariffs. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay, who would pay for the regional tariffs? Well, the tariff is a region-wide tariff and it eliminates the individual transmission, we call it pancaking effect for individual companies. I'm sorry, Rather sir, you broke up there just for a second. The tariff is a region-wide tariff and? 
region-wide tariff, and it, it eliminates what we term pancaking effects of multiple entities' transmission rates, whereby it's a single regional rate. Uh, we, there is cost allocation related to transmission investments, and all of those RTOs that exist today have various principles around that uh, aspect of, of cost allocation. Okay, and, and one final question that I have for you. Uh, are you aware that there's a recent investigation in Spain with regard to Iberdrola having emptied uh, its water resources for two reservoirs that uh, it has under its control? I'm not aware of that. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. I have no further questions, Mr. Herring Examiner. Thank you very much, Mr. Fridley. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, staff, you're next. You have 45 minutes. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Herring Examiner. Um, and good morning, Mr. Fridley. Morning, Mr. Barber. <laughs> um, I guess I'll first start by just identifying the documents that we'll be looking at. So you, I'll make sure you have them all. And, and it should be pretty self-explanatory. It would be your uh, direct testimony in support of the stipulation and your rebuttal testimony. That would be exhibits 34 and 35. Um, it would also include joint applicants exhibit two, which is the, uh, I guess, the notice of filing amended stipulation. And then um, Mr. Evans' testimonies, which are uh, staff exhibits two and three. Do you have those available? I do. Okay. So let's start with uh, your direct testimony. Um, that's JA exhibit 34. And in this um, testimony, you, you, you testify in support of the second amended stipulation, correct? I do. And, and specifically, you address regulatory commitment number 36. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Do you, now, now you have the second amended stipulation joined uh, applicants exhibit two. Um, can, can you identify the provision in regulatory commitment number 36 that specifically guarantees that service reliability will not be diminished for PNM's distribution customers from the levels they have historically experienced? Well, as we've stated in our commitment number 36 regarding reliability, we provide um, a system-wide safety and safety reliability uh, baseline with the years 2016 through 2020, representing current performance of PNM, which, as we've stated in the testimony and other places, is adequate and it's it's uh, moderately improved over other utilities in New Mexico as well as uh, in, across the nation for other utilities. As we look at quartile performance, Mr. We are Excuse me, Mr. Fridley, uh, for the benefit of the record and for the benefit of the court reporter, could you spell out those acronyms that you just uh, mentioned, SADI and SAFI? Sure. SADI is the System Availability Index. Um, let, let, me, let me get that for you just so we don't. Repeat it off, off my memory. System availability uh, interruption duration index. Sorry. And, and that's S A I D I, right? That is correct. S A I D I. And then and the other one is S A I F I, right? That's right. S A I F I. And it is the Uh, system Average Interruption Frequency Index. 
Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to apologize. Go ahead with your previous answer. I just, I have a feeling we're going to be using those terms a lot. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so back on our commitment number 36, as I mentioned, we have the system uh, baseline uh, performance target for safety and safety reliability metrics. We also have uh, additional individual distribution feeder reporting that would be provided. Uh, PNM would provide the top 10% worst performing feeders, and each of those feeders would have a performance improvement plan annually submitted to the commission. We also would report feeders that are 300% of the average individual feeder safety and safety performance being reported mm -hmm. and each of those would have a improvement plan and those feeders that exceed 300 percent of the average uh, would only be triggered for two consecutive years of those performance metrics additionally um, pnm is committing to uh, meeting with staff and the uh, Consumer Relations Division uh, to further establish any additional service quality uh, performance or reliability metrics. Um, and we, again, would support in the stipulation uh, staff and PM working together towards providing a rulemaking proceeding to further expand these kinds of penalty based metrics. Uh, thank you. Is that complete? I'm sorry, Mr. Borman, you broke up. I'm sorry. Does, does that complete your answer? I, yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to cut you off. So, so you've identified um, a number of reporting requirements and the, I guess, the the meeting um, with with staff and the. Um, our customer relations division, but I haven't heard anywhere in there where uh, this regulatory 36 provides any specific guarantee that service reliability will not be diminished. Did, did I miss something in there? Uh, well, Mr. Borman, you're using the word guarantee, and I, I don't think we have uh, testified to anything guaranteeing service quality. PNM has submitted in its testimony that it's providing adequate service and will continue to do so based on our normal course of business with our capital investments, our O&M expenditures, and managing customer liabilities we always do. Okay, so, so in commitment number 36, can you identify any consequences or other enforcement provisions that would apply if PNM customers experience diminished service? Uh, in that commitment in number 36, we also provide that staff can petition the commission for appropriate enforcement action, including penalties should PNM's reliability uh, become an issue related to its past history and performance. Doesn't, doesn't staff have that ability already? They do. Okay, so this doesn't really provide anything new, does it? No. Okay. In um, terms of in terms of the petition for penalties, no. So so let's look at the Q and A that that's on. Um, what it's it, it looks like it's on page nine of thirty, and I must apologize because my copy of your testimony that I downloaded from Dropbox doesn't have page numbers at the bottom. It just has the page nine of 30 at the top. Do you? If you could give me the question, Mr. Borman, I think I have it here. Okay, well, let me find it first. Um, it is. Um, so the question is, 
how do the regulatory commitments support the ongoing maintenance of this infrastructure? Do you see that? Give me just a minute. I believe it's page seven from the, um, how would normally be paginated, but I don't okay, have I page think, numbers. I think on. I have it here. Okay. Do you see that? You see that Q and A? Yeah, give me a minute just to read that again. Okay. okay. So again, to confirm Mr. Borman, uh, the question is how do the regulatory commitments support the ongoing maintenance of this infrastructure? Correct. How do the regulatory commitments? Uh, regulatory commitments support the ongoing maintenance of this infrastructure. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Barn. Okay. okay. So, so what guarantee is provided in um, regulatory commitment 36 that the joint applicants will fill at least 20 of the new service, or excuse me, 20 of the new jobs to be electric service business unit crafts personnel at PNM. Is there anything that guarantees that's going to happen? I uh, know you're using the word guarantee and I would say it's not a guarantee. Uh, we've committed to pursue up to 20 additional craft personnel related to the service um, response for PNM. And again, we look at those numbers for labor and personnel each year based on the workloads and performance we see of our reliability. Uh, are there any consequences in the um, regulatory commitment 36 uh, for the joint applicants if that does not happen? No. Okay. Is there any specific commitment that any of these positions will be line service personnel as opposed to meter readers, meter technicians, power plant operators, or, or the like? No, but again, the, the verbiage that's that's been included in the stipulation implies that it's service related. So it's a number of things we do. It could be substations, relaying, uh, system protection, linemen. Uh, there's a number of craft individuals that work in my division that respond to uh, system uh, emergencies and take care of our operations and maintenance activities. Okay. So now if you could turn to, I think what is, would normally be page 10, but on my copy says page 12 of 30. Can you, can you get there? I have it. Okay. And lines five to 10, um, you state that um, specifically under regulatory commitment 36, the joint applicants commit that PNM will maintain a SADI SAIDI metric of 94.3 minutes or less on an annual basis. PNM will also maintain a safety SAIFI ex excluding major event days metric of 0 0.88 or less on an annual basis. Do you see that? I do. Can you point out where in commitment number 36 those um, commitments are made? Sure. It is in the uh, first item relating to the system performance. And that system performance for both SADI and SAFI is based on PNM's historical 2016 to 2020 reliability performance. So, so I'm missing this. Where is, I mean, where is this in here? Cause I'm, I'm not seeing these numbers. Where are they? Is this, let, let me, let me ask it this way. Is this in that third bullet point where you're using the five year, five calendar year period, 2016 to 2020? Correct. Okay, so so basically, you're taking you're taking the the base period, and you're you're just identifying that 
uh, with these, I guess, metrics, um, specific metrics. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And and with regard to this, once again, are there any enforcement provisions that apply if um, the joint applicants don't meet this commitment? Only those that I mentioned earlier about the staff petitioning the commission for any penalties related to that performance. Okay. Um, I guess, let me go back to, um, I believe it's page uh, nine of 30. Um, and starting on line 13, Actually, um, go a little further down the page. Starting on line 20, um, you talk about where well, you note that the operating environment for PM is different than um, the Avon Grid network utilities located in the northeastern part of the U.S. Is that, do you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, now, is it correct that the Operating environment for PNM is also markedly different than um, that of utilities along the Gulf Coast. Yes. And and the um, operating environment for PNM is also different than utilities based in the Great Lakes region. Yes. Okay. Okay. And that's true throughout the country, the Northwest, um, you know, California, all of them have different operating environments, correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Well, let's turn to your rebuttal testimony now. That's JA Exhibit 35. I have it. Okay. And again, I don't have page numbers on this except for the, the ones at the very top of the page where it says page blank of 48. That's fine. Um, but here, let's go to page four of 48. And, and we'll go to line 12. Um, and you state there, staff assumes without support, p &M service quality is inadequate. Do you see that? Yes. Can you show me where in staff's testimony it states that p &M service quality is inadequate? Well, I think as outlined in Mr. Evans's testimony, uh, Repeatedly, he makes the claim that PNM's service reliability has degraded over time, and is is uh, is is not performing as it has been in the past. So again, he asserts that throughout his testimony that PNM's current reliability performance is subpar. Oh, well, again, can you point out where that is? Uh, in direct testimony by Mr. Evans on his page nine in the testimony question, line number four, what has PNM reported annual reliability indices revealed concerning I'm its sorry. performance? I'm sorry, sir. You broke up a minute. 
What has PM? What has PM's reported annual system reliability indices revealed concerning its performance? And he asserts in line six that PM's system reliability indices reveal a substantial decline in reliability over the 15 year period. Okay, and is your testimony that um, Mr. Evans is wrong when he says that there's a substantial decline as, as shown in those indicate indices? I do. Okay. Now on, um, if you go to page six of 48 of your um, rebuttal testimony, I have it. And it looks like, um, I'm trying to get there on my, uh, starting at the very bottom of the page and carrying on over to the next page, you say staff instead continues to insist that the commission should immediately impose a penalty system on PNM. Do you see that? I'm sorry, Mr. Bornham, I'm trying to find that piece. Tell me again the page reference. Okay, the page is page six of 48. And it's at the very bottom of that page, the last line. And then it carries on over to the following page. Yes, I'm sorry, I have it now. Okay. Um, do you know when the reporting requirements begin in staff's recommendation regarding service quality? Uh, if I recall, I think you're referencing when the PM reporting would be required and it would be um, would be presumably the first year post closing and reporting beyond. And the penalty that is being proposed by uh, st the staff position would take place in the second year of that reporting based on having missed, for instance, either SADI or SAFI reliability indices for two consecutive years. So, so I mean, you, you kind of, and I appreciate this, you kind of jumped ahead and sort of answered my follow-up question is that the penalty provisions in staff's recommendation would begin in 2023, is that correct? Uh, it would be for performance of 22 and 23, yes. So the penalty would presumably occur if, if applicable in the early part of 24. If applicable. Yes. And is that considered immediate? Again, what we've test what I've testified in my direct and re rebuttal testimony is the fact that Mr. Evans's proposed penalty matrix is selecting a very uh, select set of years of performance. It's not indicative of current levels of performance of PM system, where again we provide adequate service and relative to other utilities in the state, moderately improved levels of performance. So with that baseline of those years he has hand selected, along with his 10% proposed bandwidth, yes, PNM would immediately have penalties on the system of very large scale for its current level of performance. So, so in immediate mean to me would mean when this transaction closes. So, which would be, I presume, late 2021. So you would be subject to penalties in late 2021? No, but the performance of PNM system during the years 22 and 23 would 
again, presumably be similar to what it is today, and that would be translating to a penalty immediately for the outlined matrix that Mr. Evans is suggesting. Let's turn to um, page eight of 48 of your testimony. I have it. Okay. I have to get there now. So give me a second. So starting on line 15, you state, however, the commission might find it valuable to explore why one utility it regulates consistently ranks in the top first or second quartiles of reliability among many utilities. I'm sorry, Mr. First or second, and you dropped it. I couldn't hear oh, the. I apologize. I will. Um, consistently rakes, ranks in the top first or second quartiles of reliability among many utilities and other utilities within its jurisdiction might land in the bottom two quartiles. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Are you stating that there are utilities in New Mexico that are in the bottom two quartiles? Uh, I don't. I don't recall if that's the conclusion I'm making there. But but again, the reference is stating that again, PNM is as I mentioned in my testimony, ranking in the top first or top part of second quartile amongst all of the utilities in in the nation. Now, if you turn to the next page. Um, there's a question that starts on line eight, and it states, how do you respond to staff's testimony that PNM should use regional metrics for comparison rather than natural national metrics? Do you see that? I do. Um, can you point out where staff's testimony states that PNM should use regional metrics for comparison? Uh, Mr. Warren, I, I'm not sure I can recall where that testimony is in staff's position. Again, um, in, in Mr. Evans's testimony, he repeatedly asserts that comparing PNM against other utilities, for instance, in the East Coast, should not merit any significant consideration, and thereby it should be based on the region in which PNM operates, again, alluding to the fact that it's in a specific geographic area, which, as you mentioned just earlier, is true. There is some differences. But again, the point of our my testimony in this particular section is simply to state that there is value in comparing PNM's performance against all other utilities. Uh, again, as I put in my testimony, the EEI or the Edison Inst Electric Institute uh, reporting does compare 82 utilities across the country and their relative performance. And in that relative performance, PNM's reliability performance is in the top quartile or the top part of the second quartile. Does that does that complete your answer? Again, I don't I don't recall the specific reference you're mentioning, but it is certainly implied with with uh, Mr. Evans's testimony that comparing it across other regions would not be um, of value and, and, and I take issue with that. Okay. So let me ask, let me ask this question. If PNM's SADI and SAFI are increasing, but those same rely, re reliability metrics of neighboring utilities are increasing at a faster rate, 
is the reliability that PM's customers are experiencing improving or diminishing? Well, as we've said, I've said in my testimony, we believe it's adequate service and its performance is on par or better than utilities, other utilities in the state. However, uh, I also mentioned in my testimony, one of our primary uh, drivers is to provide the requisite uh, capital and O&M improvements necessary to make improvements. And that's exactly what PM is doing. We've had a market shift in our capital investment in the last uh, year, and we plan on making those same uh, high levels of capital investments uh, year over year in the coming years to make those improvements. Because again, utilities, a utilities reliability performance is a number of factors related to weather and uh, system equipment issues, uh, all kinds of, of factors that can add to those numbers. Uh, again, we have the unique issue of balloons in, in New Mexico here in Albuquerque. We've had incidences that cause outages there. So again, our capital plan uh, is a primary way in which we intend to continue to make improvements. Uh, we do see a trend in the industry. We see it both in the numbers that uh, Mr. Evans submitted, the numbers that Mr. Small uh, submitted his testimony, and those in the EEI groups uh, that there's a moderate uh, uh, incline in, in the rate of, about it, of, of reliability performance in the negative, and so we are addressing that. Uh, our performance over time is more consistent uh, and, and smoother than, than some of our counterparts, and again, that shows I think a testament to what we do to make sure we make the requisite investments to help improve customer service. Well, I thank you for that extensive answer, but I'm still not, I'm not clear if you've answered the question. Um, p and reliability metrics aren't really dependent upon the reliability metrics of other utilities in the region, are they? No. And the trend, of PNM's reliability metrics um, is is independent as well. If the other utilities in the area are experiencing um, increasing um, safety and safety, that doesn't really affect whether or not PNM is experiencing an increase in safety and safety as well, right? Well, I would take issue with that. I think the, the two main drivers that relate back to a utility's performance on reliability is uh, weather patterns and weather frequency and volume, which again, we see changes. We are certainly seeing changes in the weather uh, impacts and that would affect all utilities, uh, again, depending on the location, but general, general trends continue to show a higher impact to weather conditions than in the past. Secondly, the age of the system continues uh, for all utilities in which our infrastructure, again, becomes of age that it needs replacement and refurbishment. So again, all utilities are facing those same challenges and those same drivers uh, affect the reliability performance. Based on PM's filed reliability metrics for the period of 2005 through 2020, are the years 2013 through, through 2017 the five best years for PM's reliability performance? No, but it certainly has uh, a number of very low years that, again, uh, as we see in the performance both with PNM and, and some of our counterparts in the state, there is a great fluctuation in the performance based on, again, weather patterns and incident rates. So under staff's proposal, under what circumstances would penalties be applied for system reliability under performance? Under staff's proposal for the system reliability itself for the overall system reliability, PNM would be penalized for 
SADE performance outside of a 10% bandwidth on a five-year basis of average, which translates to a five-year baseline average of 79 minutes. That is a very low number. Uh, again, that is something that we are not seeing today in current performance, and that would trigger uh, for two consecutive years, um, starting with a penalty of $340,000. So it must happen for two consecutive years, correct? Correct. That's right. And, and it must exceed 110% of the average SADI or SAFI for that base period, correct? That's right. Okay. Mr. Borman, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, so, so on page, I guess it's page, you can find it, but it, I think it's 17 of 48. Um, starting on, you got that? I do. Okay, starting on line 16, you state, Staff's artificially selected baseline also causes PNM to immediately start its benchmarking by being out of compliance rather than starting from the actual system baseline. Do you see that? I do. What is PNM's actual system baseline? Well, what we're proposing is 2016 to 2020, which represents the current performance again, for any of the utilities that re report the reliability indices annually, these numbers vary widely uh, given the years. Um, so again, we believe in what I've testified to is that it should be on a baseline of the current conditions and performance of the system, uh, not hand selecting uh, uh, a token set of years in the past that, that are, again, not representative Okay. okay. Let's talk about the, the feeder um, performance issue that staff raised. Sure. Um, do you believe it is reasonable for customers to be served from feeders that are chronically in the worst performing 10% of feeders? No. Should the perform performance of those feeders be addressed? Certainly. Okay. okay. Now you raised a concern about PNM being forced to chase feeders and not having sufficient time after a feeder is in the worst performing list for one year to avoid being on the list for two years. Are you familiar with that? That's correct. Okay. Is it common for a feeder's performance to be average in one year and then drop to the worst 10% for two consecutive years without any warning? It certainly could be. Um, as you look through our data for feeder performance, there's a host of reasons why a feeder would land on the 10% worst performing. Um, it, it only takes one uh, construction firm to cause a dig into our, our infrastructure to create that feeder's performance to be on the list, given a cable fault that, that has to be uh, identified, located, and, and re-terminated and repaired. Uh, it's hours on, on those kinds of effects. Uh, the next year, it could be, um, uh, again, a balloon into the line. And, and so, again, what our issue with Mr. Evans' suggested penalty matrix around feeders is it is very narrow. And again, we believe it should be uh, not simply a penalty the first time it, that feeder lands on the second year in a row. Because again, it doesn't give us, uh, as a utility, uh, the proper analyst, an analysis time to, to determine whether that feeder has a problematic nature or not. So, so you raised the um, instances of, in year one, um, a, a dig safe event where a construction company might, might uh, cut a line and in year two, a balloon might hit a line, that same line. Is this something that 
are either of these events things that normally happen to any lines on PNM system? Well, again, there's a number of reasons why uh, an individual feeder's performance would be um, causing it to be in the 10% worst performing. Again, we, we have proposed in our stipulation and item number 36 that we will be reporting those, but more importantly, we're reporting uh, not just the list, but a plan of improvement for any of those feeders that, that would require a plan. Again, in some instances, it wouldn't require a plan because it's a random event. In other cases where there's a systematic issue, whether it's uh, uh, failed cables or failed equipment or trees, trees in the line, you know, whatever the issues are that we can address, then we would put an appropriate plan together for those. And we believe, again, that's a much more appropriate way to address individual feeder reliability rather than essentially triggering penalties, uh, financial penalties, the second year. Isn't, isn't a feeder being in the bottom 10% of um, reliability, isn't that something that happens over a period of time? And at a, in a, at least in a general way, I mean, you don't go from you don't go from eighty percent to ten percent, right? Not normally. Well, uh, yeah, to to be quite honest, when you look at the data, uh, because of the customer count for individual feeders, the SADI number that's calculated is a very um, unique number. It's it's not like the system Sadie because the system has all customers dividing into a total number of outages, outage minutes for the system. When it's done per feeder, it can be dramatically different because of the smaller number of customers on that feeder. So again, it's a very unique bell-shaped curve for all of our feeders performance. And what we're committing to is addressing the top 10% with commitments to, for plans that have cost-based uh, analysis to them instead of penalties. But again, you're talking about particular unique situations that might result in a feeder being in the bottom 10%. I mean, if, but those sort of unique situations are not annual events, are they? Well, again, they're fairly regular on our system because our, our top cause of uh, outages are cable dig-ins and lightning and, and those kinds of causes. So it's weather related and, and third party causes many times. Are they regular on any single particular feeder? Uh, occasionally, mm -hmm. yes. When, when we have a lot of work in the area, there's lots of those kinds of things that can happen. Occasionally, like how often? How often? Uh, I, I wouldn't have those numbers in front of me. So it's pretty, actually pretty rare, isn't it? Uh, not, not the weather-related ones, no. Again, uh, feeders that are located in the uh, foothills of the mountains take lightning shots every single storm. <laughs> Thank you. I have no further questions. I appreciate your time, Mr. Fridley. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Fridley. I have a few questions for you. Could you turn to your, uh, your uh, June 18 testimony? And I'm looking at uh, the page numbers on the bottom of the page, uh, page 16. I have that. Okay. Uh, there you, in the, I guess it's what, uh, lines 14 through 16, you talked about the, the company's distribution feeders. And we've had testimony about what feeders, about reliability, of, of feeders. Could you just more generally describe what a feeder is and what its uh, fu function is in the company's distribution system? Certainly. Uh, as we refer to distribution feeders in the industry, they're, they're simply a single distribution circuit that leaves our substation and they run out throughout the neighborhoods uh, at a lower voltage, it's a 12 kV, 12,000 volt uh, distribution feeder. And it, it's um, 
representative of, again, a single circuit back at the substation. So think of your house uh, electric panel. When you click the breaker off and on, that is, that is supplying power to one section of your house when you click the feeder, when you click the breaker panel. Uh, it's the same thing in our substation. There's a breaker, if you will, at the substation that opens if there's a fault on that feeder. But again, the feeder only feeds a certain portion of the neighborhood. So, for instance, an individual feeder will run down uh, several streets, cover uh, four or five blocks of, of area in the city, and they, they may be as many as uh, 1,200 customers on a feeder. And what is on the uh, end of a feeder? Is that the customer service line? Uh, the feeder is just simply the, the backbone, if you will, for the distribution line feeding all the neighborhoods. So it's tapped off of the feeder are businesses, business loads along each street. Uh, so all along the streets, we have uh, connections to that feeder that feed businesses and homes. So for, for my house, the feeder runs down in front of my house and then there's a, a service line that goes from the feeder to my, uh, my electrical panel? That's right. Okay. And you said there's, there may be 1,200 customers per feeder? Uh, that's, that's the high end, yes, but they vary. Uh, they could be as few as five or 10, but generally in the city, in the, in the metropolitan areas, they're, they're rather large. They're, they're near the, the higher numbers where it could be 800 to 1200 customers in general. The, 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 with the smaller number of customers, uh, where are they located? So the, the, the feeders that have the smaller number of customers are generally um, long distance feeders in rural areas where we've, we've run a distribution line to go feed a more rural and uh, uh, dispersed load. So generally those will have smaller levels of customers than we would in the Metro. What about an industrial customer? Would an industrial customer have uh, its own feeder? Certainly, yes. Um, you know, certain customers that are uh, rather large will have their own individual feeder or feeders, plural, uh, in order to support their load. What's the maximum number of customers that you'd want to have on a, on a feeder? Uh, generally in the industry, we all design the system generally the same. And again, those numbers I'm giving you are very typical for the load capability of a feeder. If you're talking, again, residential service. I'm sorry. Her, I, I'm sorry. Those numbers are typical in the next statement? Uh, those, are, those are typical in what we do in the industry at large. We generally build the same level of distribution systems, especially for metro areas. And those numbers are relatively the same for all utilities, 1,200. It could be 1,500 maybe. Again, it just depends on the loads. Um, if you add, again, too much to that feeder, it's beyond its capability and you'll have to have additional feeders. So there's always a physical limit to the number of customers and load we can connect to the feeder. What about transformers? How many transformers would you expect to be on a feeder? Uh, the transformers that are feeding individual loads off of the feeder uh, vary greatly. Again, I wouldn't have those at my number. There could be um, several hundred. Could you turn to page uh, 22? So the June 16 testimony. I have it. Uh, on lines 11 through 13, you describe what, a, what joining an RTO means. Uh, and one of the items you, you mentioned is uh, the transfer of functional control of uh, a utilities transmission system. Uh, does, does joining an, an RTO also involve uh, uh, transferring functional control of the uh, utilities uh, generating resources? Yes, that's a great question. When we talk about functional control, that's generally a federal uh, energy regulatory commission term that relates to RTOs. Essentially, it means operational control for transmission. You still, uh, the utility still owns and invests in its transmission 
it operates the transmission locally. The utility operates it locally, so it does remain under the control of the utility locally. But from a regional standpoint, it's operated at the RTO. So think of the RTO as the air traffic controller, if you will. It's looking at the regional system altogether, and it could have operating instructions for the utility based on the region's requirements that would it instruct the local utility to take. So that's the case in transmission, where it's a functional control at a kind of a high level, regional level. For generation, the same is true. The utilities would still own the generation. They would still invest in the generation and procure its own generation. It would still meet its own reserve margin for its utility uh, reserve net needs. Uh, but once the utility submits the generators to the operations in the market, then the market instructions do come from the RTO and it would be operating the units through its regional market signals, which are optimizing the generation uh, for economies of, of the system and economies for each individual utility. So the RTO would control the dispatch of the PNM's uh, generation resources? It would do that only in advanced market features. Again, to, in today's system, it's operating our units in the uh, Western energy imbalance market, uh, only on the intra-hour uh, signals and not uh, day ahead, for instance, or next hour. It's, it's within the hour. It's a shorter term control signal, if you will. That's the EIM. Yes. But the RTO, what would the RTO do? Uh, presumably, if an RTO were formed, it would also have, as I started to mention in my previous statements, on the levels of generation market uh, mechanisms, it would have about three levels of potential uh, generation uh, market controls. One would be an inter-hour market signal that we see today in the EIM. So again, if there were a new RTO in the West, it would presumably have this same inter-hour market signal. It could also have a day ahead market, which again would be an advanced market feature. And in that case, it would be uh, moving the units or controlling the units uh, for the full day, uh, all along the day, not just inter-hour. And then the third level of market uh, that is in other RTOs that we see in the, in the Midwest and in the East and in Cal ISO's case, there is a, that they're working on is, is there could be a single balancing area control where they would balance the region together as a whole um, and control all the generators for the good of the overall uh, grid um, needs. And we see that this is the case in the fact for in Midwest in both uh, MISO and the SPP's RTOs, they have this area-wide or balancing area-wide uh, market signal. And each of those three levels of market uh, mechanics each provides its own holistic set of trade and market benefit. And the numbers are typically quite large. They're very large savings uh, when you implement those markets. Did you so spell MISO? M-I-S-O. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do it, does each RTO have those three levels of control, or is that something that uh, and the creators, of, the members of the RTO decide about? What number of levels of control there will be? Well, Mark, these markets have been in place for a number of years. So, for in the case of MISO and SPP, as I referenced, they both provide those market signals today. They have been for a number of years. Uh, PGM in the East has similar markets. They even have a capacity market. Again, that's a whole other level of market that most RTOs do not have. The Cal ISO in California simply has its inter-hour market only, and they do not have these other advanced markets. But the other three markets that you mentioned, they have those three levels of control that you described? Yes. Okay. And in terms of PIM, uh, your testimony indicated that uh, you were expecting to, 
to be, that PNM would be a participant as of April 1, 2021. Is, is PNM now a participant? Yes, that was our target uh, deadline, and we hit that deadline along with the Cal ISO to implement the EIM for PNM. So we've been participating for a number of months. Okay. Could you turn to your July 18 rebuttal testimony? Rebuttal testimony? No, it's not your rebuttal. July. Turn to your rebuttal testimony. I have it. I <laughs> July, have it. July 29. 29. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, in particular, the attachment, uh, JA Exhibit TF-2, July 29, 2021. I have it. I wasn't sure what this is supposed to be. Is this a is this supposed to be proposed replacement language for uh, the paragraph uh, 36 in the uh, stipulation? Very good question. Yes, we, we simply propose this, if you will, if the commission were to attempt to adopt uh, staff's position on penalties. We, we believe, again, those are somewhat egregious and, and, and too narrow. That This is a mild proposal that counteracts that should the commission choose to implement financial penalties. Again, we are not in our stipulation asking for any of those terms, but if this, this illustrative example is a more moderate consideration if penalties are proposed. Which parts of paragraph 36 would these provisions in TF2 replace? Uh, it would be both the system-wide reliability metrics and the feeder performance metrics. So we would not be replacing, or would we be replacing word for word any particular parts of paragraph 36? Well, again, without dissecting the stipulation, it would simply be for the commission to consider given uh, the staff's position. So it relates mostly to the first several sections of item 36 in the stipulation related to either system penalties or feeder reporting and penalties. So you would leave it up to us to uh, integrate what you have in exhibit TF2 to integrate that into paragraph 36? Yes, but I, I would caveat that with saying that, again, we, we believe uh, that the, the testimony by Mr. Evans is somewhat flawed based on uh, the narrowness of his uh, metrics and also the use of the second uh, consecutive year for the feeders, for instance, some of those kinds of things. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Fridley. That's that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Alvarez, do you have any uh, redirect? Uh, yes, I, I, I do, Your Honor. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, Mr. Fridley, do you recall that um, Mr. Borman asked you where in Mr. Evans' testimony uh, that staff had, had testified that uh, PNM had um, substandard reliability. Do you recall that line of questioning? I do. If PNM, in fact, uh, doesn't have substandard reliability, would there be any basis to implement uh, penalties uh, in accordance with the system that Mr. Evans is proposing in this case? I'm sorry. Can you ask again? I, I missed what you're. Yeah, yes. If, if in if in fact it is um, uh, staff's position that uh, PNM's reliability performance is not substandard, would there be any reason to adopt uh, the, uh, the penalty system that Mr. Evans has proposed in this case? No, there would be no reason. And, and to clarify, uh, does 
do you believe that PNM has a uh, system reliability problem? Absolutely not. And are you advocating, is PNM advocating that the uh, penalty uh, outline that's in uh, Exhibit uh, TF2 be adopted by the Commission? Certainly not. Uh, however, if the Commission decides that a, a, some type of penalty provision is required, uh, what are your thoughts uh, with regard to what has been proposed in TF2 versus the Evans uh, testimony? Well, again, it, it's trying to address, utilizing his model, it's trying to address a more uh, moderate approach or a more reasonable approach to what penalties would be based on. As I mentioned earlier, using a, an optimum set of years in our history in performance, along with a 10% narrow bandwidth, is certainly unreasonable and would be uh, fraught with problems related to the penalties. Again, we, we do not believe the penalties are required nor necessary to continue our customer service to our customers and our improvements we have made and our commitments we've made in the stipulation are more than adequate to address any uh, current or long-term reliability issues. Do you have any idea of the magnitude of, of the penalties that DNM would face um, if uh, the uh, staff's proposal was adopted? Uh, it, could, it could be as much as a couple million dollars for the first two years when it triggers. And there was a lot of discussion about whether this, uh, was, whether staff's penalties occur immediately or at some point in the future. Uh, can you clarify what you were talking about in terms of the immediate nature of the effect of the staff's uh, penalty provision? Well, by immediate, I mean immediate within the pr framework of the penalty guidelines, meaning the first year that they could be triggered, they would apply and they would be in, in place. There would be penalties the very first moment that the penalties can be triggered, and that would relate to generally PNM's current reliability performance. So again, our position is that would be egregious, in fact, because we are pr providing very good service, very accurate service, and it's well below even some of our counterparts in the industry. Well, well below or well above? I'm sorry, in high, higher levels of quality, yes. Uh, what, what is the Edison Electric Institute? Uh, it is an advocacy group that uh, manages our uh, electric uh, utility business in all forms. And again, the EEI report that, we, that I cite in my testimony is simply an annual survey of all the companies that report and there's 82 companies, and these are everything from small to large investor-owned utilities that report on their reliability performance. And as we look at that report every year, we follow those uh, as kind of a guideline for our top quartile performance. And again, as I mentioned, uh, PNM is in the top portions of those quartile scores as we look at all these reliability metrics. Well, that, that's my question. Is, um what is your role as Vice President of Operations in terms of system reliability on the transmission and distribution side of the business? Well, it's, it's, it's one of our top priorities. Absolutely, customer service is, is a uh, top priority. And again, we look at that every single day and we put together our plans annually for system improvements in order to address trends. And we do see those kinds of numbers um, and, and adjust our programs appropriately based on whether it's feeders individually or the system itself. And as, as someone in your position, uh, do you find the, the, the data reported by uh, the Edison Electric Institute with regard to um, utility uh, reliability in general useful to you? Absolutely. In what way? It provides a great benchmark. Uh, it's similar to JD Powers in our in our opinion. It's it's very much like that, where you see that you're performing well against your peers who do vir who are doing virtually the same thing, albeit in different areas of the country and again with different challenges. But again, that performance for individual customers experiencing outages on the system is very prominent in our evaluation of ourselves. And again, that helps us. Uh, understand where we're uh, performing to our peers. And finally, uh, Mr. Um, Borman asked you a, a number of questions about 
where in Regulatory Commitment 36 you would find, you know, guarantees of performance. But let me ask: Does the uh, the penalty uh, proposal advanced by Mr. Evans provide any guarantees? No, and again, we, we believe that penalties are a wrong driver for utilities to make good decisions around reliability. It needs to be based on cost-effective plans to address issues on the system, whether it's uh, individual drivers, as I mentioned, with aging infrastructure, uh, uh, configurations. There's, there's a number of things we have to do, uh, both short-term and long-term, to make those improvements, and again, our capital plans are robust, and those are where we find our, our largest gains in system improvements for performance on reliability. And are these the, the types of, of things that take uh, engineering analysis? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Examiner. Those are my questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you Mr. Finley. Thanks for your testimony. You're excused. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a break, 15 minutes, uh, come back at 11 o'clock and uh, uh, pick up with uh, Andrea Crane. So we're in recess at 11 o'clock.
Mr. Lee, this is Andrea Crane. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Ms. Crane. Mr. Borman, how do you spell quartile? Mr. Borman? Yes. How do you spell quartile? Uh, Q U A R T I L E. Did you hear that? Yeah, quartile. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thanks, Dave. All right, bye. <laughs> bye. When you're ready, Judge. Okay, uh, 11 o'clock, uh, let's go back on the record. Uh, the Attorney General, uh, you see attorneys from the Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Elliott, are you taking over for this witness? Yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the Attorney General would like to call Andrea Crane. Mr. Lee. Ms. Crane, would you raise your right hand, please? You sound be sure the testimony you're about to give in the matter not opinion should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Crane. Um, would you please state your name and address for the record? Yes, my name is Andrea C. Crane, C-R-A-N-E. My address is 2805 East Oakland Park Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33306. Ms. Green, did you file testimony in this case? I did. Um, can you please identify what has been marked as NMAG Exhibit 1? Yes, that's my direct testimony and exhibits in this case. Um, and was this testimony prepared by you at the direction of the Office of the Attorney General? Yes, it was. Do you have any corrections that, uh, to this document that you'd like to read into the record at this time? No, I don't. Thank you. Um, and now turning to uh, what has been marked as NMAG 2, um, could you please identify this document for me? Um, I believe that NMAG2 is the direct testimony and exhibits of Scott Hempling in this case. And you're aware that Mr. Hempling is, has not been called as a witness, correct? I am aware of that, yes. Um, are you also aware that his testimony was uh, prepared at the direction of the Attorney General's office? Yes. Are you familiar with his testimony or have you read it? I have read it and I'm generally familiar with it. Okay, thank you. And um, now let me turn your attention to what has been marked as NMAG Exhibit 3. Do you have it? I do. And could you please identify it for the court? Um, yes, uh, this is the test my testimony in support of the second amended stipulation in this case. And was this also prepared by you at the direction of the Office of the Attorney General? Yes, it was. Um, and are your uh, answers uh, in that testimony the same as they would be today? Yes, they are. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I would like to move for admission of what has been marked NMAG1, NMAG2, 
and NMAG3 into evidence. Are there any objections? Hearing none, uh, NMAG. Mr. Mr. Ingsan, I'm sorry, Brian Haverly. Um, we just want to reassert our objection to the admission of Mr. Hembling's testimony for the record. I understand you've ruled on it already, but we'd like to just reassert that objection. Okay. Uh, NMAG Exhibit 1 is admitted, NMAG Exhibit 2 is admitted, and NMAG Exhibit 3 is admitted. Mr. Hearing Examiner, the witness is available for questioning. Okay. Uh, Water Authority, you, you reserved 60 minutes? Yes, Mr. Examiner, as a preliminary matter, in case I run over, I'm, I'm wondering if you would permit me to borrow the time we have reserved for Mr. Fisher and Ms. Reno for an additional 20 minutes. Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you so much. Good morning, Ms. Crane. I am Nan oh. uh, and I am with Stelzner, Winter, Warburton, Flores, and Dawes, and we have previously met, correct? Yes, we have several times. Yeah, fair to say we've worked together for almost decades at this point, right? <laughs> so that's fair to say. Okay. Um, and you have worked with me and Dal also of the firm um, for those decades and more recently, Mr. Herman, correct? Yes, that's correct. And you've also often uh, worked with our longtime consultant, now retired, Mr. Jim Dittmer. That's, yes, I have. I enjoyed working with him very much. Yeah, I did too. Um, Can you spell that last name? D-I-T-T-M-E-R. And most recently, I think you and I had direct communication on the EPE merger. Does that sound right? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, you've been deployed as an expert in this case by the Attorney General's office? That's correct. As you so often do for the Attorney General, correct? Yes. And you've been deployed to offer your opinion on the facts uh, in this case? That's correct. And in the development of those facts um, and, and related testimony, you generally rely on facts and data that you've personally observed, correct? Uh, to some extent that I have personally observed, I rely on a lot of things. I rely on usually uh, utilities filing, its exhibits, the responses to data requests from both the Attorney General and other parties. Uh, my experience uh, over, as you put it, decades in uh, utility regulation. Um, sometimes I rely on, you know, or news reports or at least take all of this into consideration. So it's not only on things that I have directly observed um, personally. Right. It's also on facts and data that have been brought to your attention, correct? Yes. Okay. And in the form of that, the, that factual development and data development is, I think you've indicated data requests, which we would call discovery, right? Correct. Pleadings, correct? Yes. Okay. Conversations with other consultants in the docket? Um, are you talking generally or are you talking about generally, in this particular generally. case? Generally. Yeah, generally. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, yes, absolutely. Okay. Like Mr. Dittmer. Correct. Okay. Um, conversations with other, other parties, for instance, my office on behalf of the Water Authority or Doniana County, correct? Sometimes. Okay. Um, so it's fair to say that you do your best um, when developing testimony in these cases to consider multiple points of view. Um, I do my best to consider multiple points of view, although I am representing the attorney general, um, you know, in this particular case. So I'm, I usually have a client that I'm representing ultimately. Well, and, and ultimately you do have to um, develop some of your, or you do acquire some of your facts and data from your client, correct? From conversations with counsel or staff at the attorney general's office. Correct. All right, thank you. Um, and this is not only generally true in a, in a proceeding where there's an application and testimony and a hearing like this, but it's also true when you're developing testimony in support of a settlement or a stipulation, correct? That's correct. 
Um, and now we've, we've been talking about generally your, um, your scope of work, um, but not, it's not one size fits all. And I think you alluded to that earlier in one of your answers. I would agree with that. Your scope of service changes at the direction of your client, correct? Um, it can. Okay. But it's not a one size fits all proposition. I agree that every case is unique. Okay. And you, you as, a, as a tried and true consultant, um, have, to, have to remain flexible as these documents develop. I try and remain flexible. That's true. Yeah. Um, I want to point you to your June 18th testimony um, called Testimony in Support of Second Amended Stipulation. I think it's now been admitted as AG Exhibit 3. Do you have that in front of you? I do. Okay. Can I direct your attention to page six, line three? Yes. Now you referenced the second amended stipulation filed on June 4th of 2021. Do you see that testimony? I do. You are aware, are you not, that there was an initial stipulation filed on April 20th, 2021, correct? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm aware that there was an initial stipulation. I don't recall the date, but I would accept that. That it was filed on April 20th of 2021. You would accept that it's filed, uh, that it was filed on April 20th of 2021. I, I heard your question. I was just thinking about my answer because that, um, you know, that date does not ring a bell with me, but I'm sure the record will reflect when it was filed. I see um, no reference to the April 20, 2021 initial stipulation in your June 2021 testimony. Is, is that a correct observation? Well, yes, it's my understanding that the second amended stipulation basically superseded the initial stipulation. And therefore, there was no need for me to address that in my testimony. Do you nevertheless um, consider the initial stipulations, regulatory commitments when developing your June 18th testimony? Well, if we're, if we're talking about the same initial testimony, the two documents were very similar. That's why I'm just hesitating a moment with that date. Um, the, the initial stipulation, the first stipulation that was submitted was very similar to the second amended stipulation. I believe the second amended stipulation just had an extra point or two. So therefore, yes, I considered it because they were largely the same, unless we're talking about two different documents. No, we're absolutely talking about the initial stipulation filed on April 20, and then the second, um, which you testified in support of, which I think was filed on June 4. And I think you're telling me that you did in fact consider the regulatory commitments in the initial stipulation when you developed your June 18th testimony in support of the second stipulation. Yes, because it's my understanding that those commitments are for the most part also included in the second amended stipulation. All right, thank you. Can I take your attention to page six lines 11 through 12? Yes. Okay. And I, I wanna point you to your statement that I did not directly participate in settlement discussions with the joint applicants or other parties. Do you see that statement? I do. And that's a true statement as it concerns the second amended stipulation, correct? Uh, correct. Uh, is it also correct that you did not directly participate in settlement discussions with the joint applicants or other parties as it concerns the initial stipulation filed in April? Yeah. Yes, that, that statement would apply to both. Um, if you didn't quote unquote directly participate, um, how did you get your information relative to your, um, um, relative to these discussions that you reference on lines 11 and 12? Uh, through the Office of the Attorney General. So communicating with Mr. Elliott, for example. Uh, Mr. Elliott or, uh, or Ms. Corey. And were those your only contacts at the Attorney General's office? Um, I believe that I may have had um, a call where um, a, a Mr. Baca was 
present on the call as well. Um, if I'm even remembering his name correctly, um, they're the only three that I can recall, though, speaking with the attorney general's office about this, the uh, settlement process. Okay. Um, did you also visit directly with Mr. Hempling as it concerns these two stipulations? Uh, I don't believe I did. Um, you had no conversation or email exchange with Dr. Hempling as it concerns either the initial or the second amended? No, I didn't. Um, were you nevertheless aware of Dr. Hempling's position on these two stipulations? I can guess what his position might have been, but I don't think I ever, I ever was told what his position was. I had no discussions with him on that. And I don't recall, you know, I, I don't recall knowing for sure what his position, uh, what his position was on either of those two stipulations. Now, um, you indicate that you had no direct participation in the settlement discussions. It, would it be fair to say then that you had no personal firsthand conversations with the joint applicants as it concerns the initial stipulation? That's fair to say, yes. And you had no personal firsthand conversations with the joint applicants as it concerns the second amended stipulation? Correct. Okay. Would it also be fair to say that um, you had no personal firsthand conversations with uh, attorneys outside of the attorney general's office as it concerns the initial stipulation? That's fair to say, yes. And you had no direct firsthand conversations with any any attorneys outside the attorney general's office um, as it concerns the second amended stipulation? Correct. And, and likewise, as it concerns both the first and the second, you had no personal firsthand conversations with any other consultants in this docket? Uh, I don't recall having conversations with any of the consultants in this docket. So, uh, regarding the stipulations, no. So not Dr. Hempling, not the Water Authority. Uh, did, can you answer that out loud for the examiner? Yeah, yes, I, I, I don't recall having any conversations. To the best of my recollection, I did not have any conversations with any other consultants, uh, whether that be Dr. Hempling or another party's consultants. So in developing your testimony, um, both your as it concerns the initial <coughs> and the second uh, amended stipulation, um, your source of information was generally the record as it existed on that day, correct? Correct. Um, and conversations with uh, Mr. Elliott, um, Ms. Curry, and potentially Mr. Baca. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, turning your attention to lines 13 and 14. Yes. Okay, and there you state, I did review several versions of the regulatory commitments and provide input to the NMAG. Uh, now, this is um, certainly a true statement as it concerns the regulatory commitments attached to the second amended stipulation, correct? Yes. Okay, and you referenced several versions. How many versions did you look at? Well, first, first of all, let me say that statement is also true with regard to the first stipulation and during that process that led up to the first stipulation I'm not sure how many versions I looked at I would say two to three I mean it, it, it was it, it there weren't a lot of versions that I looked at there were a few versions that I looked at well let's start with the um, second amended stipulation regulatory commitments you think you looked at at least two versions no the i'm sorry mr hearing examiner Wait. i'm going to object in so far as a lot of these communications are privileged uh there were a number of drafts that went back and forth between uh the attorney general's office and our consultant as would normally be the case mr examiner <laughs> There is no privilege that exists between Ms. Crane and Mr. Elliott. She's a paid consultant. So these are, this is the basis of our conversations with the attorney general and those are, those are privileged. Attorney client privilege. There is, Ms. Crane is not the client. 
the attorney it's, general is. It's pretty clear that Ms. Crane has already testified what went into the development of her testimony, and that included conversations with Mr. Elliott and Ms. Corey. I let's am hear, in, I am let's hear the question again. Let's hear the question again. Um, let's see. Well, I think she was answering my question. Um, it's certainly a true statement as it concerns regulatory attachment um, or several versions. I think we were on references to several versions. How many versions she looked at? Okay. Well, I don't know that that is an attorney client communication or a, a, a communication among attorneys uh, the off, in the office of the attorney. So overruled for now. Okay. How many versions did you review, Ms. Crane, um, as it concerns the second amended or the second amended stipulation? One. Just one version. Yes, that's that's my recollection. One version of the second amended stipulation. Okay. And that that document was filed on June 4th of 2021. Do you recall that date? Yes. Okay. And and at what point in time did you review the amendments or, or, or that that version that you just spoke of? Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't recall exactly, but to the best of my recollection, it would have been very, um, shortly before, um, I submitted it, it before it was submitted, um, or it, it, I mean, it may have even been after it was submitted. I, I, I just, I just can't recall, um, I was much more involved in the first, like there were two or three drafts of the first stipulation that, that I recall seeing. After that was filed, I began to prepare testimony. And then at somewhere down the line, I was informed that there may be a second amended stipulation. And, um, and, and so I know that I obviously reviewed a second amended stipulation before I filed my testimony in support, but I don't know for sure whether I actually saw that second amended stipulation in draft form before it was filed or whether I didn't see it until after it was filed. To be honest, it was so close to the initial stipulation in my mind that I wasn't you know, I didn't really um, make make note of when I saw it for the first time. And um, the attorney general had, had, in fact, signed on to the initial stipulation back in April 20 of 2021, correct? Yes. And can I can I can I assume that your scope of service as it concerns this case changed once the initial stipulation was filed? Well, I, I don't know that, um, I don't know that I would say it was, it, 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 it changed. I don't know that I would agree that it changed. I mean, I was engaged to provide services to the attorney general. I assumed that that would include testimony. Um, in many cases, as you well know, there's a stipulation that results at, after testimony is filed. And that usually then requires testimony in support of a stipulation. I had assumed all along that if there if, if there was a stipulation um, filed and, and, and if the AG was a uh, signatory to that, that I would then be required to provide um, testimony in support of the stipulation or that that would be part of the engagement. So the, the scope of the engagement didn't really change. It's just we never actually know what's going to happen in these cases you know, until they, until they're litigated and we see how they play out. Well, well, one thing I observed that changed was that prior to the filing of the stipulation, the attorney general had been propounding discovery. Do you recall that? Oh, yes, I do recall that. And would it be fair to say that after the filing of the testament or the uh, stipulation, the, the first amended, or I'm sorry, the initial stipulation, um, the AG issued no further discovery. So is that a true statement? Um, I don't recall whether they did or not. I don't, I mean, I would have to look at my records. It sounds about right though to me. I mean, I, I certainly can't remember that I issued any, any data requests at that point. 
So subject to check, you would agree with me that there were no data requests issued by the AG's office after the initial stipulation was filed. I, I would agree subject to check. I mean, generally, if there's a stipulation, I more or less stop um, analyzing uh, the case and therefore I generally stop issuing discovery at that point. And when you say stop analyzing the case, it's um, I think you just said that that includes not issuing discovery. Um, does that mean you move on to other dockets and other jurisdictions? I have, um, I've been working on other dockets and other jurisdictions the entire time that I've also been working on this docket. And so I'm constantly trying to juggle a couple of different cases, um, which is, you know, one of the reasons why if somebody tells me they have a stipulation, I generally say, okay, that's great and move on to something, to an, another fire that needs to be put out. So I have, um, I have been working this entire time in other jurisdictions as well. So I'm trying to, you know, juggle my resources. So when you also stop analyzing, do you, I mean, you're on the service list for this docket still, right? I am. Okay. I mean, and we're getting pleadings multiple times a day, even today as we sit here talking, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm going to guess that you quit um, seriously analyzing the pleadings that were coming across your desk after the initial stipulation. Well, there. I'm going to object insofar as, again, we're getting into areas of communication within the office and Ms. Crane's scope of representation has been established. We are talking about work product privilege here and Ms. Crane's work. We, we certainly can go on to her testimony in this case. Mr. Examiner, um, first of all, work product is not a privilege, it's a doctrine. Uh, secondly, um, we, I have not inquired at all as to her conversations. I'm simply t asking her what she was doing after the initial stipulation was filed. We're ruled. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Oh, sure. Um, so, um, I think you indicate, I think your words were that you, you know, once the initial, once you'd learned of the initial stipulation, um, you stopped analyzing, stopped issuing discovery. Um, and we were getting to the point where um, I think you had also, you know, said that you were returning to your caseload in other jurisdictions. Um, and so I asked you if you were paying attention to the, you know, potentially dozens of emails that were still crossing our desk after the initial stipulation was filed. Right. I am on the service list and I uh, did receive, continue to receive documents. And for the most part, I continue to review those documents. Now, I, I, I must say, I'm sure that I did not give them the same level of review that I did, for example, the data requests uh, responses that I had received prior to submitting my initial testimony in this case, um, but I didn't ignore them either. Um, so I did uh, look at uh, discovery responses that were discovery that was still being issued. I looked at other documents that were filed in this case. Um, I also, I might add, relied on uh, the Office of the Attorney General if there was something that they felt uh, to bring to my attention, anything that had been filed that they felt it was critical that I review and, um, and discuss with them. Um, so I would, I would say that I, I probably put more of the onus on the Attorney General at that point to bring to, to my attention documents that they wanted me to review. But on my own, I also continue to review the filings in this case. Okay, I want to double back. We were having a conversation about um, the versions of the regulatory commitments um, as it concerned the second amended. And your testimony was that there was at least one version that you looked at. Um, was, that in, was that a conversation you had or was it a red line that you looked at? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, again, we're talking about um, work product that's going back and forth between Ms. Crane which may include uh, recommendations that may or may not have been included in the final version. 
And certainly the communications from Ms. Crane and the opinion she provides this office are, should be protected from this sort of discovery. It's what allows us to have free and open conversations with our, with our expert witnesses. Overruled. I, I believe what I said was that I recalled seeing several versions of the uh, regulatory commitments initially, um, maybe two to three. Uh, and I also said that with regard to the second amended stipulation, I'm not even sure that I saw the regulatory, I, I saw a version of that prior to it being filed. I may not have seen it at all prior to it being filed. I do recall seeing a few versions, as I said, I'm gonna guess maybe two to three of that of the regulatory commitments prior to the filing of the initial stipulation. Um, I believe that in um, perhaps one or two cases, there, there, they were clean versions and maybe there was one or two cases, I can't really recall now, um, of redlining. So I think there was at least one instance where I saw something that was clean and at least one instance where I saw something that was redlined. And then that's as it concerns the second amended stipulation. No, it's actually as it concerns the initial stipula stipulation because as I indicated, I, I, I really didn't, don't even think I, I saw the second amended stipulation until it was filed. And then I reviewed it, you know, because I needed to know whether or not there was anything in there that was, in my view, problematic. Um, so it, the, the uh, recollection that I have in terms of seeing various versions of the regulatory commitments all was prior to the filing of the initial stipulation in this case. Okay, so let's get to that then. Um, you said you reviewed several versions of that, both clean and red lines. Um, and, and I think you, you know that that was filed on April 20 of 2021. Um, how long before the filing of that document on April 20, were you looking at these red lines and clean versions of the stipulation? I can't remember how long before, but I can tell you that um, I, I can tell you that there wasn't a lot of back and forth. I mean, it, it, I, I can t I, I can tell you that the um, I was not involved, for example, in extensive uh, modifications or anything like that. I mean, I, I was asked to look at um, some regulatory commitments, um, provide some input to the Office of Attorney General regarding my opinions about the document did so, and that happened once or twice. You know, I, as I said, I think I probably saw a clean version, provided some input, then perhaps had been asked, sent a red line version and asked to comment on that. So that happened in total, I would say, I would guess, because I don't have a record, two to three times. It wasn't something that was done, you know, repeatedly. And, um, and I don't know over what period of time that transpired. It seems to me that it may have been a, a couple of weeks. You know, I, maybe I saw, I, I saw something and then maybe didn't hear anything back for 10 days from the Office of Attorney General. So I wasn't sure where settlement negotiations were since I was not, um, I was not directly participating in those negotiations. I was sort of out of the loop a little bit as to exactly um, what, you know, what the status of those negotiations were. And those negotiations were being conducted, not by you, as you said, but potentially uh, Mr. Elliott, Ms. Curry, and maybe Mr. Baca. I'm not really sure who was conducting, like, I'm not really sure who was actually conducting those negotiations. But it wasn't you. I know it wasn't me. Right. Um, so just just to refresh your recollection, your direct testimony in this case was filed on April 2nd. Is that correct? 
Yes, it was. And um, just 18 days later, um, the initial stipulation was filed. So about two and a half weeks later, the initial stipulation was filed. And as busy as you are, I mean, that, surely there was a crush um, from your perspective to get your testimony filed on April 2nd. I mean, I know how that works, right? True. Um, we're, you know, last minute edits, corrections, drafts back and forth on April 2nd, correct? Uh, well, very close to it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> April 1st, I'm sure. Right. So it, it's, it seems to me that almost immediately thereafter, based on what you just told me, you were engaged in reviewing um, the regulatory commitments in an, in an initial stipulation. Does that sound right? Well, I'm not sure, frankly, whether it was um, after I filed testimony or whether I saw a first uh, draft of regulatory commitments um, prior to my filing testimony. It could have it could have actually been prior. So I, do, I just don't know. I mean, I just it seemed to me, though, that it was over a course of what I would say were several weeks. And it's possible that I saw the first uh, document that was shared with me prior to my filing of testimony. I simply don't know. I just don't have a record of that. Okay. Um, so when you first saw the draft initial stipulation, and I think you're just, you just testified, you're not clear whether it was before or after your direct testimony was filed on April 2nd. Um, did you, in fact, counsel the attorney general against entering into the initial stipulation? Objection, Your Honor. This is settlement discussions that we're having. This is the context in which this uh, line of questioning seems to be going. And um, we need to be able to have open and free conversations with our expert witnesses. That is central to our ability to do our jobs. And Ms. Crane's advice to the attorney general's office is certainly privileged. Sustained. Uh, um, did you provide comments back to the attorney general on your thoughts relative to the initial stipulation? Yes. Okay. And were you supportive of the initial stipulation or the AG entering into the initial stipulation? Objection. Sustained. All right, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, Ms. Crane. Um, you've submitted two testimonies in this docket: um, direct testimony on April second, testimony in support of the second amended stipulation. Um, it, and uh, Dr. Hempling also filed testimony on uh, April second. Um, neither you nor Dr. Hempling filed testimony in support of the initial stipulation. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Now, you do know that the joint applicants filed testimony supporting the initial stipulation on April 21st, correct? Um, yes, I'll, I'll accept that. Okay. Are you aware of any reason why the AG could not likewise have filed testimony in support of the initial stipulation on April 21st? Uh, I'm not aware of any reason why they couldn't, but I just, I, I didn't. I mean, I didn't. I don't recall us making any kind of a decision not to file testimony in support. So maybe I'm not sure what the procedural schedule called for in terms of um, in in terms of filings. In reviewing your direct testimony uh, filed on April second, um, it would be fair to say that you collaborated and coordinated with Dr. Hempling in the draft of that testimony. Is that a fair statement? No, I don't think I don't think I would say that was a fair statement. Uh, Dr. Hempling and I worked pretty much independently of one another. We did um, have the opportunity to review draft documents, and we did have some discussions. In which case, we tried to uh, to see if there was some sort of perhaps a, a common theme that could span both of our testimonies. But we worked very independently in terms of the preparation of the documents. But you refer to Dr. Hempling's testimony and opinions no less than 11 times in your direct testimony. Does that sound right? 
That sounds right. And as I said, I did have an opportunity to review his, the draft of his testimony to the extent that there were issues in his testimony that were supportive of recommendations in my testimony. I took the uh, opportunity to refer in my testimony to his. However, we did not develop our testimonies um, together. Uh, we did not collaborate in the development of our testimonies. They were done independently. In fact, I probably, you know, didn't see his testimony until very shortly before we filed. But you had to have some conversations with him in order to coordinate issues and, and um, you know, the, the, the respective job duties of each as it concerned this presentation. Well, Dr. Hempling's testimony talks primarily about the control premium. Um, which I suppose in a way um, one could say is a subset of my testimony, which I think is perhaps a bit broader in, 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 looking, at, um, in looking at other issues as well as the broader acquisition premium. He, he spends a lot of time specifically on the control premium, which I understand is an issue that um, he's done a lot of research on and um, is very knowledgeable about. Uh, obviously, there's overlap. Uh, obviously, we had a lot of the same concerns generally, as did many of the parties in this case uh, about the merger transaction. But we definitely worked independently in terms of developing the two documents. And I think my question was, did you talk to Mr. Hempling about your, each of your scopes in, in terms of divvying up the testimony? When he was initially, I was I was employed uh, or engaged, I should say, by the uh, attorney general prior to Dr. Hempling being engaged, and so when he was initially engaged uh, to file testimony in this case, we did have uh, one or two um, discussions about scope and who might, you know, who whom I, I, we knew that he. We, we knew when he began that he was an expert on the control premium issues, and he seemed um, very uh, anxious to then focus on the control premium aspects in developing his testimony. Um, and so we did have a couple of discussions in that regard, broadly to say who was going to be discussing you know, what issues. But then we basically did not communicate again um, un until our testimonies were essentially complete. And I think, um, did, you, did you indicate that you did or did not speak with Dr. Hempling when reviewing the initial stipulations, regulatory commitments? I did not speak with him on that. And were you aware of his thoughts or his, his recommendations on that initial Objection, asked and answered. Uh, I was not, I'm not, not aware. And I, I did not have discussions with him on that. Okay. Did you have discussions where anyone relayed his concerns about the initial stipulation to you? Not that I can recall. No. Okay. And I can assume that you did not likewise consult with Dr. Hempling when reviewing the second amended stipulation of regulatory commitments. Correct. Um, so you have no knowledge of any concerns that Dr. Hempling might have had with respect to the initial stipulation? Uh, no, I, I'm not aware of what concerns he may have with regard to the initial stipulation. And so then- and well, I was just going to say, once he filed, you know, once he filed his testimony, um, I, I'm not really, sh I'm not really sure I had any discussions at all with him about anything after that point. Okay. All right. So clearly, if he had concerns, they're not in any way, shape or form reflected in your testimony filed on June 18th. Is that correct? I'd say that's a fair statement. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, Ms. Crane, are you generally aware, I think you testified that while you stopped analyzing um, 
um, you know, the, the boatloads of um, pleadings that were still coming across our desks after the initial stipulation, I think you said you did not have the same level of um, review. Are you uh, generally aware of the hearing examiner's May 11th order, um, wherein he uh, required joint applicants to file um, a response regarding certain penalties, disallowances, management audits, and fines? Are you generally aware of his order on that? I am. Okay. And he requested that the joint applicants provide a list of enforcement actions and enforcement measures, management audits, and fines paid. Are you generally aware of that? I am. Okay. Now, the Attorney General filed a May 25th response. Um, are you aware of that response? Uh, I think I am aware that they filed a response, but, you know, sitting here today, I couldn't tell you what it was. Did you participate in the draft of that response in any way? No. Um, now, were you aware of the enforcement actions pending against certain joint applicants and their subsidiaries at the time the AG signed on to the stipulation on April 20? Um, I was I was aware of some of the concerns expressed in um, in in all of those documents. Um, I didn't have uh, the details of all of the actions. I was generally aware that there were some enforcement actions out there. I was generally aware of problems that had occurred in Maine, for example. Um, I was in Connecticut during the storm last summer, so I had some personal experience with their subsidiary in Connecticut, um, for which I believe they were ultimately penalized um, by the Connecticut Department of Public Utilities. So, and I, and I was also generally aware of some of the um, investigations um, that were ongoing in Spain, um, but I did not have, um, and did not have a detailed you know, a detailed understanding of, um, of, of, of each of those actions. So prior to the AG signing on of the initial step, you did not have comprehensive knowledge of the audits that were being undertaken against joint action. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You did not have? Comprehensive understanding of the, all the audits that were pending against joint applicants. Correct and you did not have a comprehensive understanding of the fines that had been levied as of April 20, 2021? Right, I, I was not aware of necessarily of all of the fines or their magnitude. Or the enforcement actions. Or the enforcement actions. Now, after your, um, after you, after the attorney general signed on to the initial stipulation on April 20, um, and your, your level of review decreased, um, are you aware that there were at least 24 sets of discovery issued after the filing of your testimony on April 2nd? Uh, I didn't know the exact number, but there were there were there were a lot of filings, so I'm not, not surprised to hear it was 24. I certainly was aware that there were a lot of filings going back and forth with okay. and a lot of discovery requests. Okay, so subject to check, and after after you quit doing discovery in March, would you subject to check agree with me that the Water Authority issued at least two sets of discovery? I would agree. And, and subject to check, would you agree with me that uh, New Energy Economy issued 13 additional sets of discovery? I know it was a lot, so I would agree. All right. Um, and the County of Bernalillo issued at least two more sets of discovery. Um, subject to check, would you agree with that? I would. Okay. Um, in fact, two parties, um, NM area and staff, didn't even issue a first set until after you had filed your direct testimony in this case. Would you agree subject to check that that's a true statement? Sure. All right. Um, now, I just named the Water Authority, NEE, NM area, county staff, 
none of these parties were signatories to the initial stip, correct? Uh, I, yeah, that sounds about right. I don't have the signatories in front of me, but, um, but I don't have the initial stip actually in front of me, but so, but I'm, I would accept that subject to check. Okay. And none of those parties are either uh, were parties to the to the second amended stipulation. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, and I, I think you indicated earlier that your review of this of these discovery responses was not at the same level as it was um, prior to um, the filing of your direct testimony. Correct. That's correct. And because it all happened after you, after the attorney general entered into the initial, um, initial stipulation, you in formulating your opinion um, did not have the benefit of any of this discovery prior to the AG entering into the initial stipulation. Is that correct? Um. <laughs> Well, I, I, a lot of this discovery took place, I think, after the initial stipulation. So I guess nobody had the benefit at that time, right? I think that's a fair statement. Um, and there was essentially, um, you know, additional discovery after the second amended stipulation that anyone who was not a party to the second amended stipulation also did not have the benefit of the discovery that followed that second amended stipulation. Is that a true statement? Yes. Now, um, this isn't your first merger proceeding in New Mexico, is it? You, 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 we've been here before, right? Yes, we have. Uh, you were engaged by the Attorney General to review and participate in the acquisition of um, El Paso Electric, correct? Yes. And you, just, you submitted discovery in that case too, correct? Yes. Okay. And that case like this one was resolved by stipulation, correct? Yes. And you were an active participant, not only as a, a, an advocate for the attorney general, but you personally were an active participant in the development of that stipulation, fair to say? Yes. Okay. And the regulatory commitments that were ultimately arrived at in that case, correct? Yes. And I think in that case, if you recall, um, you engaged on behalf of the AG directly with other consumer advocates. Do you recall that engagement? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. And it would be fair to say that you reached out directly to staff of the PRC in that docket? I, and, I'm, I may have. And, and exchanged email emails with Mr. Borman and myself and Mr. Herman. Do you recall that? Jackson, well, I we're assuming <laughs> facts that aren't in evidence. This is a separate case and I'm not sure what the relevance is here, Your Honor. Ms. Winter? Uh, Mr. Examiner, um, uh, I don't think there are, we're developing the facts. Um, and um, I just wanna get to, you know, what her, you know, what her role was in that docket and um, her conversations with other consumer advocates as to the merits. Why is that relevant in this case? Um, it's a different um, pattern and execution than she has done in this docket. Overruled. Um, I, I really don't remember once I, um, once a case is finished, uh, I don't think a lot about it. I honestly don't remember what the back and forth that went on in that case. I distinctly recall participating personally in the negotiations in terms of um, additional conversations that I that I had. You know, I, I'm vaguely I can vaguely recall that, but I can't give you specifics as to who I spoke with when or how many times or what we talked about. Okay, well, this is ordinarily where I would hand you a document and ask you to refresh your recollection looking at an email. And I've certainly scanned those emails and have them ready to shoot to Mr. Elliott. But before we go to that, um, um, 
I'm going to refresh your recollection by reading from the October 2019 emails that are from you to other parties um, in the EPE merger. Um, the first is dated October 17th of 2019. And you start, Ms. Crane, with, on behalf of the NMAG, I would also be very interested in the analysis requested by the city of Las Cruces. Does that re refresh your recollection in any way? I hate to say it, but no. <laughs> okay. Um, so on October 21, you sent an- Objection, email. Your Honor. I, I'm totally lost here. Are we reading from emails that, that Ms. Winter has personally received? I'm, I mean, this isn't in evidence. I haven't seen these emails. There's no way to, to judge the veracity of, of what Ms. Winter is stating at this moment. Are these emails uploaded to Dropbox? Well, Mr. Examiner, um, I am entitled to refresh this witness's recollection. And when you do that, you don't have to have an exhibit. If she tells me that she does not remember these things, then I get to move to the next step, which is reading from those emails and seeing if that helps her at all. And that's a, that's a different level of refreshment. Either way, I don't need an exhibit. Well, I think I indicated in my pre-hearing orders that uh, that documents that were to be used in examination had to be uh, uploaded to Dropbox so that uh, they, the witness would be able to access them and be familiar with them. So I'm sustaining the objection. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Crane, I think you've indicated that you do recall engaging directly with consumer advocates in the El Paso electric merger case, right? Yes. I'm also going to object to this line of questioning insofar as we're discussing settlement conversations that happen in another docket and they should be privileged. Ms. Winter, are we discussing settlement conversations here? No. Um, and, and you can't, you don't, again, there's no privilege between Mr. Elliott and Ms. Crane. Uh, she's not the client. Um, he's not the client. Um, this is, I am allowed pursuant to rule 703 to, to test um, the basis for her facts um, and testimony. And, and I am getting at it from this direction. So it doesn't make a difference how she formulated her testimony or who she talked to, I don't care if it's Mr. Elliott or Mr. Curry or the Attorney General himself, if it is the basis for her testimony, I get to explore that area. Yeah, well, I don't know that she said that this is the basis for her testimony in this case. So I'm gonna sustain the objection. All right. Miss um, Crane, um, did you engage directly um, with consumer advocates um, in the El Paso electric docket, merger docket? Yes. Okay. And you engaged directly with my office on behalf of Doniana County, is that correct? Yes. And you engaged directly with the city of Las Cruces and its council, is that correct? I, I, I probably did. All right. And you engaged with staff directly in that docket, correct? M most likely. Okay. And you know, you, I'm just I has, I'm not just hesitating because I mean, sitting here today, I cannot recall specific instances. I mean, that was a long time ago, and there's been many cases um, since then. So I, I'm not doubting that I did. I just can't honestly recall specific conversations sitting here today. No worries. We're not going to get into specific conversations. Um, in that direct engagement, were you, was that done on your own volition, or were you asked by the attorney general to do that, um, to do that contact? Objection. Sustained. In this case, Ms. Crane, um, you did not reach out to the city of Albuquerque um, at, at, at any point um, in your engagement in this docket. Is that correct? Objection. Overruled. Uh, I don't recall doing so. Okay. And you did not reach out to the Water Authority or its council in at any point in your engagement in this docket. Is that correct? Um, I don't. I don't. I don't think I ever did. No. I mean, I don't recall ever contacting them. Mm -hmm. 
All right. And you don't recall ever reaching out to an Emeria, its consultants or its counsel in this docket, do you? Um, I don't. And and, let, and I, I, let me just say that um, it's generally I do not reach out to other consultants. I mean, it's not unusual, let me put it that way, not to reach out to other consultants or other parties prior to filing my direct testimony. You know, we may have discussions if somebody has an issue they want to talk about, but generally, in my experience, um, we develop our our positions, our filed testimonies independently. After they're filed, to the extent there are settlement negotiations, then uh, there may be uh, more discussions generally among various consultants. Um, in those cases, for the most part, my experience has been that the reason we are talking to one another is because we are all involved actively in settlement discussions. Um, in this case, I was not involved actively in settlement discussions, personally speaking, and therefore there was no reason for me to reach out to other parties in this case, unlike many other cases where we're all, you know, sitting in a room or a virtual room, um, batting ideas back and forth in order to get a case settled. Now, Ms. Crane, since the filing of the initial and second amended stipulations, um, you are aware that joint applicants have sweetened the rate benefits, are you not? I am. And um, that would include additional dollars for rate credits, correct? Yes. And that would include um, roughly over $30 million since the filing of the initial stipulation. Uh, subject to check, would you agree with that number and added benefits? Yes. And I'm assuming that you are now supportive of these new contributions? Yes, I am. Um, back in April and June, did you suggest to the Attorney General that they attempt to add additional rate credits over and above what was in the initial stipulation? Objection. Sustained. Ms. Crane, are you supportive of the um, additional dollars for scholarship monies? Yes. Are you supportive of the additional dollars for um, apprenticeship programs? Yes, I am. Are you supportive of the additional dollars for arrearages for customers unable to pay their bills? Yes. And are you supportive of the additional economic development dollars? Yes, I am. I have nothing further from Ms. Crane. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Next is uh, Bernalillo County. Uh, you have uh, 35 minutes. Mr. Rob. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Just had to unmute myself there. It looks like we made it to the afternoon, uh, Ms. Crane. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's been it's been afternoon for two hours here. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeff Albright, uh, representing uh, Bernalillo County in this proceeding, uh, Ms. Crane. And uh, not only have we had the opportunity to uh, participate in a few proceedings uh, prior to this, but uh, also had the opportunity to visit uh, your Fort Lauderdale uh, area. In fact, uh, returned to Fort Lauderdale the day before the COVID uh, crisis hit here in New Mexico on March 13th of 2020. Oh, so, no. so it's uh, been a little, little while. Um, and you and I have also had uh, uh, participated in some previous uh, proceedings, correct? Yes, we have. And so, uh, again, I'll try to uh, uh, not to ask compound questions, which I have a tendency to do. Uh, and if you do need clarification on any question, please uh, let me know and I'll try to, to uh, be a little more uh, specific. I think as a general um, issue, uh, I'd like to focus at least for the time being on your testimony in support of the second amended stipulation. That's your June 18th uh, testimony. Okay. And I'm actually uh, 
uh, going to uh, um, start out with uh, on page three, if you would please, with regard to the conclusions and recommendations regarding the proposed business combination. Yes. Um, beginning at lines 14, you make reference to your direct testimony and speak of the benefits to the proposed merger there are with regard to strategic factors that would provide PNM, uh, make PNMR and having grid potentially good merger candidates. Would you uh, elaborate on what those strategic factors are? Yes, and, and actually that was language that was very similar to what was in uh, the my direct testimony. Um, I think the fact that uh, as I say in, in that direct testimony, the fact that PNM is facing a substantial uh, need for capital uh, in order to comply with the ETA um, and, and you know potentially with with other capital requirements, um, the uh, the fact that um, Avangrid and, and Iverdrola uh, are financially strong and have access to significant capital. Um, is, is one of the factors. Uh, and I think the second um, large factor there is Avangrid's experience with renewables and what that might, what they may be able to bring to the table with regard to renewables um, for PNM, especially given the requirements of the ETA. So they were the two primary strategic factors that I considered in that direct testimony. Okay, well, thank you for that. With regard to the capital expenditures uh, under the ETA though, uh, aren't those going to be uh, securitized by uh, the rate payers? 100% securitized by the rate payers? Well, the stranded costs are going to be securitized by the rate payers. I guess the question is though, um, Ha, what is the entire cost going to be of compliance with the ETA? I'm not sure anybody knows the answer to that question right now. So it is true that PNM, to the extent they're successful in securitizing costs, um, will have a source of capital flowing back from, uh, you know, as a result of those uh, securitization bonds that they can use to reinvest. Whether or not that will be sufficient to meet all the requirements of the ETA, though, I'm I'm not sure of that. I don't think I don't think we know yet. Okay, it's fair enough. And also, I might add, um, there may be requests for securitization or requests for recovery of uh, generation facilities by PNM or other utilities in the state. Um, which are opposed by the attorney general. And so we're not sure that every request by utility for either securitization or recovery of undepreciated investment will be approved by the commission. Okay, and, and in this, uh, in your testimony in support of the uh, second amended stipulation here, um, your rate credit was considerably reduced from what you had in your initial testimony, correct? Yes. And why was that? It's called negotiation. You know, I, even though I wasn't negotiating, obviously somebody was. And anytime you, you know, have a stipulation, you have parties going back and forth and they end up usually somewhere in the middle, whether it's the real middle or whether it's just somewhere between two bookends. And that's basically what happened in this case with regard to the, to the, um, the, the rate credits. And in, in, in all the financial, really in, in, in um, all of the financial um, aspects of the stipulation. I'm gonna follow on just a little bit with respect to that uh, along the lines that Ms. Winter asked as well. So uh, there's been some testimony. Uh, well, let me just ask a question. Did you read uh, Ms. Reno's uh, testimony with respect to the second stipulation? I, I did actually um, just a day or two ago uh, in preparation for this cross-examination, although uh, I can't quite recall what she said, but I do have it here if you'd like me to uh, look at a specific aspect of her testimony. 
Well, not at this point. Let me just ask a few general questions. So, so in that testimony, um, there were some proposals that were made and responses made there too by the uh, joint uh, participants with regard to an increase in the rate credits. And I assume that, that you would not object to an additional above and beyond what either ABCWA or other folks have proposed with an addition to the rate credits. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Okay. And the same way with regard to the increase in arrearages <laughs> credit that was proposed by, by Ms. Reno? Yes, you, you I would, would not, not object. Oppose that. Okay. Economic development, same question with regard to you wouldn't oppose an increase in the, in the economic development if that were to come to pass in some, some form. I would not object. And what about a rate freeze? Do you see that as an advantage or disadvantage or appropriate given the circumstances of COVID and everything else that we're dealing with? Um, I to, always, June, to June of 2022. I would certainly support a rate freeze to June of 2022. Okay. And uh, some of the other uh, things like the uh, relief to low income individuals an increase uh, in, in that, would you have any? Um, objection to that if it were increased? I would not. And would you support that that low income should be distributed uh, not just to the, well, that it would include distribution to low income individuals um, in, um, in PNM service, Terry, along with other areas that it might provide some kind of assistance to? outside of its service area. Yeah, I, I, I mean, now you're asking for an analysis that I really haven't done, but I mean, you know, generally speaking, I, I wouldn't have an objection to that. Okay, and something that uh, I'm not sure that you commented on in your testimony and support, but there was a proposal with regard to the uh, board of directors and having three of seven uh, independent uh, uh, directors as members of the board, uh, a little bit, different perhaps, but do you have an opinion with respect to whether that is um, a favorable um, position or condition? I think, I, th I think there, are, there are benefits and there are potentially also detriments to that. Okay. Could you exp expound on that a little bit? Well, I think that um, the independent directors um, at least provide the, um, the, the, the perception um, of, of decision makers that are going to um, have the underlying, you know, best interests of um, the company and its stakeholders at heart, as opposed to their own personal interests. On the other hand, I'm not sure that you want people who don't have um, an individual uh, background in the uh, area uh, for which they're making those decisions. So, you know, I think we heard there was some prior testimony that, you know, the problem with, um, or one of the problems is uh, that you want board members who are very knowledgeable about the industry, knowledgeable about the company, knowledgeable about the service area. And um, so, I think you need to be careful that if you are promoting independent directors, you make sure that you have individuals that have the, um, the knowledge and the background <clears throat> necessary uh, to make the best decisions uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Would you please turn to page six? Again, we're still on the uh, testimony and support. Yes. Um, and at the uh, top in lines uh, three through nine, well, actually two through nine, uh, list a, a number of uh, people that have entered into the stipulation who are signatories. Do you know how many of those are within PM service territory? Uh, I don't. Okay. You mentioned before that you seldom consult with other consultants. Did you consult or have discussions with the county's uh, expert, Ms. Reno, in this proceeding? I, I don't recall having any discussions with her. Okay.
You also stated, as far as your original testimony goes, that there were four objectives. One of those was that PNM should agree to assume all costs of abandonment of its interest in Four Corners Power Plant and withdraw its filing for the abandonment. I'm sorry, okay. after four, I lost you after Four Corners Power Plant. My apologies. And uh, uh, Ms. Crane, that's a page four of your uh, testimony there in support. Let me just go back okay. for the benefit of the court reporter here. So at, at line 18 through 21, I'm just going to read it there. And uh, it, it says, PNM should agree to assume all costs of abandonment of its interest in the Four Corners Power Plant, FCPP, and withdraw its filing for the abandonment of the FCPP under the Energy Transition Act, ETA, that sets forth an estimated 300 million cost of abandonment. Have I uh, correctly stated what's in your testimony there? Yes, I just wanna clarify that what you're reading are the conclusions and recommendations from my original testimony that I explained that they are, were included in my testimony in support of the stipulation by way of background. But yes. the, 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 the uh, information on pages three through five of my testimony in support of the stipulation basically summarized what was in my initial testimony. Now, later in my testimony in support, I also discussed the four corners issue. Um, I, so I just wanted to make that clarification. Yes, and, and I thought I had stated that uh, ahead of time, that that referred back to your original testimony. Uh, do you still have that same position with regard to the Four Corners power plant? Yes, and I have filed testimony in that case. Thank you for that. Um, in having, uh, back, to, back to the board of directors, a question I for, forgot to ask, and you mentioned some pros and cons. Uh, it's been discussed that that the board would have uh, the independent directors, a majority of the independent directors would have to have final say over certain things, uh, such as compensation and perhaps uh, dividends, you know, except for tax issues that are related. Um, in your opinion, are there other areas that should be included by the board of independent directors if the commission approves it. And if that is adopted in some, some kind of stipulation that we haven't seen yet. Um, not that I have thought of at this point, no. Okay. Could you please turn to page eight. Yes. Okay, so on page eight, you list uh, 14 regulatory commitments, when you say are not addressed in your testimony, are you referring to this testimony here or in your original testimony? My testimony in support of the second amended stipulation. Okay. And so that includes such things as RTO, carbon reduction task force, and, and the list is there. Is there anything in that list that has changed as far as you're offering an opinion? No. Okay. You mentioned in response, I believe, to questions of Ms. Winter, but it's also referred to on page 10 of your testimony. Yes. With regard to the joinder of Iberdrola uh, as a joint applicant, do you see that? language in the middle of the page? I do. Is it your understanding that Iberdrola has further agreed to be subject to the commission jurisdiction, assuming this uh, acquisition merger is, is approved? Yes. And that jurisdiction would be other than just for the, the provisions <laughs> that are in the stipulation, the amended stipulation, correct? That's my understanding. Do you turn to page 11, please? Uh, 
And I'm looking at the answer you provide, beginning at line three and running through line five. Um, you state, I recommended that the rate credits be increased to 85 million and that such credits be allocated to PM ratepayers on a per customer basis. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and I'm not so much stuck on the 85 million, but I, I am curious as to uh, your analysis in arriving that it should be on a per customer basis. What is, what is uh, the reason for that, your professional opinion? Well, I think actually, if you look at page 12, um, line six to eight of my testimony, I expressed there a concern that um, the, well, actually that's not the correct site. I, somewhere I think above that, that it doesn't matter how large the rate credits are. Uh, what really matters is what a customer is going to um, experience with regard to the rate credits. So that if, if, if the rate credits were $300 million, but for example, residential customers weren't going to see any of it, or they weren't going to see much of it, or it wasn't going to make any kind of a material impact on them, then the, the absolute dollar, nominal dollar amount of the rate credit is, is really immaterial. And so I, I had a, a concern in my initial testimony uh, about the fact that even the, the $24.6 million um, was going to, I think it was 55 cents a month or something like that um, under uh, PNM's uh, proposal. And frankly, you know, even doubling that or tripling that, it would still be, have a very small impact on, uh, on residential customers in particular. Now, I don't mean to suggest that uh, we're now up to $67 million. And even if we did $67 million on a per customer basis, you know, there's still a relatively small impact on people's lives. And that's how, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, I think the rate credits have to be evaluated. Um, but certainly I think that to give residential customers who are 90% of the customer base or approximately 90% of the customer base, um, a rate credit that will begin to mean anything from a dollar impact, I think you have to allocate it on a per customer basis. Otherwise the numbers just get too small to really have any benefit. Okay, thank you for that. Would you turn to page, uh, really, really begins at the bottom of page 14 and to the top of page 15, where we're talking about one of the favorite uh, topics in this proceeding, the jobs. And um, at the top of page 15, you state at lines one, one and two, you state, while economists disagree about the size of a labor multiplier, there is widespread agreement that there is some multiplier for each new job that is created. Do, have I correctly stated what's there? Yes. Do you have an opinion with regard to the overall impact of 150 uh, new jobs here in New Mexico that's been proposed under, under a revision, I guess, to the initial uh, stipulation reflected in subsequent testimony here? Uh, you mean with regard to the revenue multiplier or yes, in with general? regard to the revenue multiplier? <clears throat> well, my only my only point there is that let's say we get 150 new jobs that could the 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 overall economic impact of that um, could be m much more significant than 150 jobs. Um, generally when I've looked at revenue multipliers, I haven't done any original research in this area, but I've read other documents and one to five is sort of a typical range for um, labor multipliers. Some people think it's only one for one. Some people maybe could go as high as four to five, but whatever it is, it's probably more than just the 150 jobs that are being created. Now, having said that, let's assume that we go to the high end that we're talking about, you know, a five to one impact. Um, 
you might be talking about an impact that would be equivalent to 500 new jobs if you're only looking at the labor and direct benefits associated with with those jobs in terms of dollar amounts. Either way, it's um, I don't think that 150 jobs is insignificant. On the other hand, I'm not sure that 150 jobs are going to be enough to turn around the economy of New Mexico. So um, I think that it's better than um, than nothing, and 150 is better than 100. Um, but I can't give you, you know, I can't say that that's going to have a, a huge impact on uh, economic conditions in the state. Thank you. Uh, would you turn to page 20, please? And Mr. Hearing Examiner, how much time do I have left? You have 11 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, page 20 there, Ms. Crane. I do. You have a discussion there about the requirement for an independent, independent evaluator. When if, and I'm, I'm sorry, uh, strike that and I'll start over with the question. So let me call your attention to beginning about line eight running through line 12. You have a discussion about the requirement for an independent evaluator when affiliates are interested in providing certain services and regarded affiliate uh, transaction or allocated charges and appropriate allocation methods. So a couple of questions there. First of all, um, do you concur with the proposal to have an independent evaluator uh, prescribed by, but uh, from a list, but selected by the commission uh, when an affiliated interest is involved? Um. Yes, I do. I, you know, I mean, here, here again, you you want to have um, you want to strike a balance between um, making sure that um, Avangrid is not using any sort of um, market power to unfairly influence um, the bidder bidding on projects um, or to promote its own affiliates over third parties. On the other hand, you want to balance that with something that makes sense and you don't want ratepayers at the end of the day to have to pay a lot of extra dollars for an oversight, you know, that doesn't um, that that may not be worth it, frankly. So I think that um, this provision does attempt to provide a balance between those two objectives. Okay, let me ask you a couple of questions just to pin that down a little bit further. Do you think there, is, from your experience and what you've seen in other jurisdictions, in many cases you've been involved in where this, this may or may not be uh, an issue, um, have you seen any indication that there can be a chilling effect when the utility uh, does choose an independent evaluator or even provides a list where other folks are saying, well, you know, we aren't even going to bid because this is a done deal and it's uh, in-house and you know, it, uh, it, it's, uh, I'm not even going to waste my time doing it. Have you seen that in other jurisdictions as an issue? Um, I haven't actually seen an example of that. I wouldn't doubt that it could exist in certain cases, but I can't give you an example of where it's happened right now. Okay. And if, if there is not an affiliated uh, interest, we had testimony earlier in this proceeding to the extent that that any independent evaluator in that case would be at the expense of the commission or some mechanism through the commission to pay for that. Um, do you have any experience in other jurisdictions how that might be handled when an affiliate interest is not involved? Are there, in other words, are there instances where the utility has still um, included that um, as part of their, their costs? Um, I'm sitting here today. I can't give you an example. Okay. And I assume you have same, same few lines there in your testimony it says in providing certain services, I'll address my concerns regarding overall 
I assume that's supposed to be affiliated charges and appropriate allocation methods. Um, what do you mean by appropriate allocation methods? Well, I think the allocation of costs, especially costs that um, may come from affiliates um, is a very important, uh, it's a very important issue. And frankly, it's one that is sometimes very difficult to get behind um, because of complexity of organizations or um, just resource limitations that consumer advocates frequently have. So, uh, you know, all, all we really want to make sure here is that um, any costs that overall are um, charged to rate payers from anybody really are appropriate for them to pay and that they're paying their fair share. And would you turn to page 26, please? This, yes. this is an area that should be right up your alley, uh, public interest standard. So uh, at uh, line eight, um, well, beginning at line five, you list a, a number of things with regard to uh, public interest or unlawful, obviously, and you list a, a number of, uh, of uh, things to evaluate the proposed merger transaction. You see that list there, one through six? I do. Okay, with respect to number one, I just want a little clarity there. You have number one, whether the merger provides benefits to customers, and is that net benefits to customers, or is the standard a net public benefit, or what is the distinction between the two with regard to the overall stipulation and uh, acquisition or merger? Well, I'm not speaking from a legal sense. So you Understood. mentioned what is the standard. So I, I, I can't address that. But um, from, 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 in my opinion is that there should be net benefits to rate payers. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. You have five minutes, Mr. Albright. Uh, thank you, Mr. Herring Samner. One of the proposals made by Ms. Reno, and I'm gonna ask a question with regard to the, uh, with regard to the board again, back to the board, is that uh, her recommendation is to have, to have one of the independent uh, directors as the uh, chair of the, of the board. So you have three out of seven directors as independent, and one of those independent directors would serve as chair uh, of the board. Have you seen that in other jurisdictions? Uh, no. Have you seen where, um, do you see any ad advantage or disadvantage um, in having an independent director as chair of the board? Or do you, have an, do you have an opinion with respect to that? Well, I think it would be the same uh, opinion that I expressed earlier. I mean, I, just as I indicated for directors, I think to have a chair who um, is, in, is independent, um, may um, provide uh, better optics. Uh, it may provide a more um, subjective analysis of issues that arise. On the other hand, you know, utilities are very complex uh, mechanisms, as all corporations are. And um, at the end of the day, you know, you, you want to make sure that whoever your chairman is, is, you know, intimately familiar with all aspects of of, uh, of that organization and the ramifications of the decisions that he or she makes on behalf of, of, of the corporation. So I, I think there are, again, pluses and minuses in that regard. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Crane, um, that's all the questions I have for you. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your comments and your testimony. Thank and you, Mr. Mr. Albright. Examiner, I, I return the few extra minutes or seconds uh, back to the uh, greater good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to break for lunch, but before we do that, I'm going to let uh, WRA do their five minutes of questions. I see uh, Mr. Michael is jumping to do that. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Crane. It's nice to see you again. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Michaels. Um, I just have a, a couple of quick questions. Um, Mr. Albright asked you about a rate freeze through June of uh, 2022, and you indicated that you would not oppose uh, a rate freeze uh, for that period of time. Uh, do you recall that? I do. Okay, and could you, so could you explain the difference between a rate freeze and a rate increase? Sure. A rate freeze means there will be no change in usually in base rates. Um, and a rate increase means that base rates, again, we're usually speaking about base rates, have the potential to, to go up. Okay. And so you were a participant in the San Juan securitization case, case 19-00018. Do you yes. recall that? Yes. And do you recall that one of the provisions in that, um, in the outcome of that case was that as soon as the energy transition charge goes into effect, there will be an immediate and simultaneous rate reduction associated with the abandoned plant coming out of rates. Do you recall that? I do. Okay. And so if there were a rate freeze that would preclude that rate reduction from going into effect, that would not be something you'd support, I assume, right? Well, that depends. First of all, you could have a rate freeze and still require the company to record a regulatory liability for those costs, uh, for the or for those those costs that were being eliminated. So you could you could, if you wanted to, set up some sort of a mechanism whereby ratepayers would be protected from what from not getting um, a rate reduction associated with one individual event, uh, like like the securitization. That would be one option. Um, an, another option, or another consideration, I guess, is um, to consider the impact of a reduction related to one event against likely increases from all other aspects of the company's business. I mean, I have seen very, very, very few cases in my career where a company has come in and asked for a rate decrease, very few. There may, have, there may be a decrease associated with a specific cost, but generally a company will find other cost increases that they can offset against that. So I am I'm generally a proponent of rate freezes um, in order to preclude rate increases over some period of time. But this, but this is a unique situation. That energy transition has to go into effect by law um, as soon as those bonds are issued. Is that right? Yes, and you, if that's the concern, there you can set up a requirement for a regulatory liability. Well, that was considered during the San Juan case and rejected in favor of an immediate, simultaneous reduction, right? All I'm trying to get to is you don't, you don't want to preclude that rate reduction from going into effect inadvertently by a rate freeze being ordered in this case or a rate, wouldn't it be better to have at least an exception for that particular circumstance if there was a rate freeze? Well, if you can negotiate some, and I'm hearing a lot of feedback. I don't, not sure if other people are or what the concern is, but um, and, and I don't, uh, thank you, Mr. Michael, although I, apparently that wasn't the issue, but anyway, um, if I could, if you could negotiate a situation whereby a company would agree, for example, to set up a regulatory liability associated only with one event, or that they would give a concurrent rate reduction associated with one event, that would be terrific. And I would have absolutely no objection. My concern is that, again, generally, if you allow companies to make the decision as to whether or not they're going to come in for a rate increase, um, they usually find ways of at least initially 
appearing to justify a rate increase through an application. And that's what I want to avoid. In my view, rate payers are generally better off if rates are not uh, are not adjusted and if a utility is precluded from coming in and filing a rate case. Okay, well, I, I won't belabor this, but let me just finish by saying, you're, if there is a rate reduction on the horizon that's automatically going to go into effect, you would not want any rate freeze as an outcome of this case to preclude that automatic reduction. Is that a fair statement? I, I would not want to be giving anything up on a net basis as a result of this case. So okay. if I'm going to, you know, if ratepayers are going to get a reduction and they're going to get that reduction regardless of what else PNM can dig up and claim that, you know, they, they, they have to push through to ratepayers, you know, I'm all for it. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Craig. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, we're going to take a lunch break. Uh, we're going to look at uh, 1.40 and, uh, and then we'll pick up with uh, further cross-examination of uh, Ms. Crane. So we're in recess till 1.40. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
So testing, can you hear me? Yes, uh, sure can, Rick. Sure can, Rick. Yeah, Thank I can you. hear you. When you're ready, Judge. Okay, uh, let, let's go back on the record. Uh, we're up to uh, new energy economy. Uh, Ms. Nazi, are you there? I don't see her moniker on the screen, Judge. I don't either. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Yes. I guess while we're waiting for Ms. Nanazi for a moment, uh, just a procedural question that I had uh, concerning the uh, testimony of Ms. Reno, since she'll be coming up in a, in a day or two. Um, we had filed the, the corrected direct testimony of Ms. Reno. We didn't have any further corrections. Uh, the pen and ink corrections that were made to that were incorporated in a corrected version and we made that substitution. People may recall then there was no opposition at the time. I assume we don't have to repeat or to point out those corrections when Ms. Reno takes the stand. I mean, I think it will save us about 45 minutes or so. Uh, yes, you're, you're correct. And the corrected version is what you uploaded to Dropbox? That is correct. That's what we uploaded to the Dropbox. Okay. No, you don't need to further uh, describe those uh, corrections. Okay. Thank you for that, sir. Okay. Well, we can, uh, I don't know, Mr. Borman, are you prepared? I, I, I am prepared. I would say that I did get a text, not from Ms. Nanasi, but from uh, Gideon Elliott that he's in the waiting room. I don't know. Maybe oh. there's... In the waiting you room. know what? So is uh, Miss Nanazi. <laughs> I gotta keep my eye on that. So she'll be here in a moment. You're on mute, Mr. Nazi. Okay, Ms. Nanazi, you're, you're up next. Uh, you reserved uh, 25 minutes. Yeah, I might need an extra five or 10 minutes. We'll see how this goes. And then I would take something, some time off of somebody else. I think Mr. Long, but maybe I can do it 
all in the time allotted. Um, is Ms. Crane here? Yes, she is. Okay. I didn't see her, that's the weird thing. Okay. Good afternoon, I'm here. Okay, good, there we go. Um, Hi, Ms. Crane. It's Marielle Nanassi, New Energy Economy. Um, we've had the pleasure of meeting before and um, I'll be asking you some questions today, okay? Okay. Um, on page three at line 20 of your um, testimony in support of the stipulation, you say that one of the reasons um, um, here that you, that you believe that um, that Avangrid um, has experience with renewables. That's essentially one of the reasons why you believe that they could be a good merger candidate. Is that right? Yes. Um, were you <coughs> listening when in answer to Commissioner Hall's questions about upgrading PNM's grid? in order to accommodate the interconnection of small, medium, and large individual and community solar projects. Did you hear Mr. Kump testify that, quote, we're quite frankly learning on the fly as we go through this? I did not hear that testimony. And so if one of, if Mr. Kump, um, you know, on behalf of Avangrid, um, cannot provide that experience that would that would um, definitely uh, put into question one of your two stated reasons um, that that Avangrid and PNM were good merger candidates. Is that correct? Well, I don't know what the context. Examiner Rick Alvedris, that uh, mischaracterizes Mr. Kim's testimony. I believe that I, I believe that I actually quoted exactly from his testimony. So, overruled. I, I don't know the context of that testimony, so I can't really um, comment directly on on his comment. Uh, you mentioned community solar. Maybe that was strictly associated with some community solar project or whatever. I'm not, I'm not sure. However, um, you know, I have done some research on Avangrid. I've read the documents that have been filed in this case, and clearly they are a leader in renewable energy across the country. And you know that they have actually more gas um, I think 16,000 some hundred megawatts of gas um, and 3, 000, more than 3,000 megawatts of nuclear on their system. Did you know that? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me given the location of the utilities that they own. Um, so let me ask you here, you state that there are four overall goals that should be considered on page four um, and uh, when considering the public interest, um, as it as it regards this merger, um, and you concluded initially that the transaction failed to meet those four objectives, and they were electrification for all, cost-effective greening, economic development, and respect for the customer. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, then going to um, page four, lines nine through, uh, starting on page four, you state um, essentially all the major conditions you believe were required to meet the public interest that you had um, more fully explored in your direct testimony. Is that correct? Page four and five? Well, pages four and five basically summarize or actually do more than summarize. They list the, the recommendations that were contained in my direct testimony. Um, I, I don't know that I would agree that they were, you know, definitively the conditions that must be met in order to, um, to have a finding that the merger is in the public interest, but they are certainly the conditions that I recommended in my direct testimony. Thank you. Um, so let's 
I'm going to go through them with you. Okay. So, okay. On, um, so nine to 11, the first one is about that Ibadrola um, should be included as a joint applicant um, and that they should, that Ibadrola should be subject to their jurisdiction going forward um, of the NMPRC and the state of New Mexico. Is that essentially what you're saying in the first condition? Yes. Okay. And you do know um, that Ibadrola and Avangrid vociferously fought against Ibadrola being made a party and then said in the newspaper afterward that after the hearing examiner ordered the joinder of Ibadrola that they were happy to join as a party. Yeah, I, I don't know how how hard they fought, but I do know that they um, they fought to not be a party. And then after the hearing examiner's ruling, they changed their minds. And is it your understanding that either in the application or in the stipulation that um, Ibadrola will subject itself to the... Um, the regulatory authority of the PRC and the laws of the state of New Mexico? Well, again, and I just should state, you know, I'm not an attorney, so I'm not answering as an, I'm not providing any legal conclusions with regard to their, to jurisdiction, but um, it is my understanding, first of all, that as one of the merger conditions, as I say on actually page 10 of my testimony, um, that Iberdrola authorizes, had authorized Avangrid to represent that it, it would agree to submit to New Mexico jurisdiction with respect to the enforceability of these regulatory commitments and the services each may provide in New Mexico and to PNM. Um, and then subsequent to that on uh, June 8th, hearing examiner um, Sean Auer issued his order and it's my understanding that they've accepted that order. Right, where in the stipulation does it say that, uh, that it's enforceable that, um, that Ibadrola will submit to the jurisdiction of the PRC in the state of New Mexico? Well, again, when you use the word enforceable now, I think we're starting to get down a legal avenue that I'm not really qualified to go down. Um, so I can't tell you what enforcement mechanisms may be available or what steps someone may have to take if they feel that um, the company is not meeting any of its merger commitments. Okay. And that was a concern of yours in the direct testimony because you raised that um, Ibadrola has fought against um, being included, for instance, in the class action lawsuit against the fraud allegations relative to the billing, what happened with all the billing in um, like the billing disaster in, in, in Maine with CMP and Avangrid. Is that right? Yeah, and I was concerned because in Maine, they were not an applicant. It's my understanding they were not an applicant in the merger proceeding, and they were an applicant in the merger proceedings in many of the other jurisdictions. Okay. Um, now, the next, the next um, condition um, that you talk about is the rate credit. And there's, there's actually three elements I want to talk to you about. Not only the amount, which you, know, you said $24.6 million was inadequate, you also said the, the allocation, the basis of the allocation, which is per customer versus kilowatt hour. And then you also disagreed with the fact that the joint applicants were going to um, distribute it over three years as opposed to one year. Those, that's correct, right? You know, I heard you say that the other day. Um, I certainly, I agree with your first two statements. Um, and this is something I meant to check and I, and I failed to do so. Can you point to where in my direct testimony um, I objected to the three-year period? I just, I just didn't recall that. I heard, there was some, I heard that during cross-examination the other day, and I was kind of surprised because I didn't actually remember, remember that I had made that recommendation. And as I said, I, I failed to go back and check that before, before okay. well, this hearing. I'll look at that in a minute. 
Um, maybe I'll have my co-counsel find that in your direct testimony, the one year um, request that I thought I remembered. Um, but let's focus on the other two. So on, uh, you know, Ms. Winter had said to you that the initial stipulation was actually filed on April 20th and you accept that as a fact, correct? Yes. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to ask you about that initial stipulation. You disagree that 24.6 million was adequate. You had recommended 85 million. Um, and the AG, the attorney general, um, so if I say AG going forward, I mean the attorney general, okay, um, agreed on April 20th to a $50 million rate credit. Uh, correct. And um, the other thing is, is that in the April 20th uh, initial stipulation, it he ignored your per customer basis requirement, but agreed with PM and and Avin Gritty Bedrola to to allocate it on a KWH basis. Well, I, I don't know where he agreed and by he do you mean the attorney general yes i i'm not sure that the, i don't think the stipulation addresses that allocation can you point me to where and the stipulation addresses the allocation well i i didn't um <laughs> i didn't upload it as an exhibit so we're not going to be able to okay. refer to that well, but um, but if, 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 if it was silent as to the distribution, then it didn't include your your request in your direct testimony to to um, allocate it per customer. Let's put it that way. That right. Be but if you that is correct. But if you read pages starting on page 11 of my testimony in support of the uh, second amended stipulation, I have a discussion about this very issue. And I, I mean, it's my um, hope and expectation that that will be allocated on a per customer basis. Uh, it's my understanding that the stipulation is silent. Um, but I think I've made it pretty clear in this testimony, as I indicated in my earlier cross-examination today, that um, I, I think to allocate it in any other way would, um, would certainly reduce the impact dramatically to the residential class. So I stand by that recommendation. Now, how that actually happens in this proceeding or who can make that happen, I'm not sure. Um, so let me just ask you this. Did you read um, Ronald Darnell's testimony um, in support of the stipulation of July 29th? Yes. And, did and you I know that he disagrees and I know that he has a schedule in his testimony that um, you know, indicates that he's accepted, you know, an alternative uh, recommendation. I can't remember whose recommendation he accepted, but it was an alternative recommendation that would not really have a material change from the joint applicant's original recommendation with regard to allocation. Thank you. Um, so the, the um, third condition is essentially that um, re regards Four Corners Power Plant, correct? Yes. And um, you know that in the abandonment case, um, p and is asking for $300 million plus interest in a non-bypassable charge um, from ratepayers for 25 years. Is that correct? Yes. And you, it's your position that, um, that shareholders, um, whether that's PM or PM Avangrid, should, um, should bear that cost, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, because Mr. Davis is now working with New Energy Economy, um, I'm able to find that find that um, that statement where you say that I'm just reading it per 
over a three year period. And I think that, ooh, here in your direct testimony on page 18 and 19. Um, well, maybe I can't find it quick enough. Could you just look and see if it says that he, she would prefer one year as opposed to three years? Okay. All right. We'll move on from that. Back to the four corners issue. On page 12 um, and 13, 11, line 11 on the first page on page 12, going to line 11 on page 13, you um, discuss this in further detail. Um, and you basically say that the stipulation is largely silent on the issue of Four Corners power plant. Is that right? Correct. Um, the stipulation and uh, joint applicants testimony does not address what might happen if the joint applicants receive an unfavorable ruling in the Four Corners power plant proceeding um, and, it's, and what its effect on the merger would be. Is that correct? Yes. So this, the Four Corners power plant remains an unresolved issue. Is that also correct? Correct. Okay, if we could go back to page four, line 21. And here you're talking about economic development. Um, and your original proposal was for there to be $80 million worth of economic development, correct? Yes. And um, the original stipulation signed by the attorney general um, on April 20th provided for two and a half million dollars of economic development, seven and a half million dollars of economic development and 12 and a half million dollars for impacted communities equaling a total of $20 million, correct? I'm sorry, you said that quickly. Um, can can you just give me that again? The 420 uh, initial stipulation that the attorney general signed on to provided for two and a half million dollars over two year period for economic development, seven and a half million dollars of economic development programs over three years and 12 and a half million dollars for impacted community groups totaling okay. $20 million. Yes. And um, that's $60 million less than you suggested, correct? Um, that is $60 million less than I suggested, although I talk in my testimony in support of the second amended stipulation that there were also 50 incremental um, new jobs that were not included in the original application. Um, I talked about those having an impact of at least just the incremental now, not the base jobs, the base, the base new jobs, but to increase from the application to the stipulation of at least uh, $25 million over five years and potentially much higher depending on what, what somebody thought that revenue multiplier may be. Um, so that was another consideration in, um, in evaluating the economic development factors of the stipulation. Okay, and if there was, let's say that $25 million added to that, that would be $45 million total, but so still approximately half of what you originally um, suggested, correct? Unfortunately, I have to settle a lot of cases for half of what I have originally suggested. So I, I think once you get to half, you're probably in the in the ballpark. Okay. Um, five, five minutes, Ms. Nanazi. Okay. Um, I will definitely ask for 10 minutes 
off of Noah Long. So for him, 50 minutes and 10 minutes more with Andrea Crean, please. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Um, now, if we could go to page five, um, and that's uh, lines four to six. This is um, these. What you're essentially asking for is a penalty provision if um, Avangrid fails to to um, create the jobs um, and retain them. Um, is there any penalty provision if Avangrid fails to produce these jobs and no retention requirement? And there and there is no retention requirement of five years in the in the stipulation, is that correct? Either the initial or the second amended. Uh, I just don't recall. I'm sure the stipulation will speak for itself. There, 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 there may not be. There certainly is no penalty provision in the stipulation. That much I do recall. Okay. And again, I, I address that on page 15 of my testimony and support. Okay. Um, and regarding your seventh condition, um, which is on line seven through 12. Um, is it also true that there's no penalties, automatic penalties um, for reliability performance um, and customer service, um, anything and anything to do with billing or customer service in, the, in this stipulation? Yeah, I don't believe there are any specific uh, or explicit penalties. And so, Ms. Crane, I noted that you were concerned and mentioned in your direct testimony um, about, about Avangrid's past actions, especially regarding Maine. Um, you mentioned those in your direct testimony, correct? Yes. Um, are you aware that the main public utility commission, which is, is noted on knee exhibit 27 identified 70, 70, that's seven zero different types of defects about smart care billing system. And that Avangrid CMP only addressed 45% of the customer complaints regarding that system and took three months um, to address them and that 1,247 customers' complaints were never resolved to customer satisfaction? Okay, I'm certainly aware, generally aware of the um, issues with regard to the billing system. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with the level of detail that you mentioned regarding, for example, the number of customers that have yet to be satisfied. Okay, and then on page five, level, uh, level I don't know what, line 13 through 15. Um, could you explain what you mean by this eighth con condition? The, the condition that's on page five from my original testimony was that PNM should seek NMPRC approval for allocable charges and allocation methodologies related to any merger integration projects or any service company functions transferred from PNM services company to another corporate entity. So um, basically there are kind of two aspects to this. One is just looking at service company functions. I presume that there are a number of service company type functions that will perhaps be transferred out of the PNM services company and into a, an Avangrid services company. Um, and I'm just concerned that the, the commission make sure that services provided by an affiliated service company are necessary and that the, the costs are reasonable and that the charges are allocated appropriately. Now, similarly, I feel that especially given the problems with central main power, um, to the extent that the company um, begins to take on any large merger integration projects, whether that be done by a service company or not, um, the commission should monitor and make sure that those costs are appropriate and, and the allocations are, um, are reasonable. And I mean, obviously the commission always has the ability to monitor that in a rate case, but I think that they would, should take a more proactive approach given the problems that were present in Maine. 
And, and, and Ms. Crane, that's to avoid wasteful expenditures for ratepayers, correct? Um, yes. And, and not, not even just expenditures, certainly the expenditures for sure, but also the aggravation and the other problems that result from, from, um, so from system integration, whether those be billing issues or whether they would be operational problems or whatever those problems may be. Excuse me. And so were, were they, when the New Mexico Attorney General signed on to the stipulation on April 20th, and are they now, are any of these concerns specifically addressed in the stipulation that we were just well, talking about? Well, the stipulation um, does have language with regard to um, allocation methodologies, um, cost allocation, uh, you know, approval by the commission for, for cost allocation methodologies. Um, uh, some, I think some, some reporting requirements and, um, so they, they were not explicitly direct addressed to the extent that um, I recommended in my direct testimony. Um, however, I think that there is, um, uh, there's enough in the stipulation, given the underlying jurisdiction of the commission, uh, that the commission does have the tools that it should need to make sure that those charges to ratepayers end up being appropriate. And so similarly with um, your ninth condition, I mean, this is somewhat related to the eighth one, um, but essentially here, I think that you um, were really uh, explored the ninth one quite considerably in your direct testimony, which is a concern that there might be essentially a behind the curtain um, problem with finding out what were the costs that were um, allocated by Avangrid to Ibadrola, for instance, and making sure that, that, that us, that you, <laughs> and that um, new energy economy, and then ultimately the commission could, could finally unearth and try to find out what these different um, cost allocations were from the parent company. Is that, would that be like a fair assessment of, of the ninth condition? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very, it's a very complex issue. There are usually, you know, millions and hundreds of millions in some cases of dollars involved. And frankly, it's a very tough issue for consumer advocates to investigate properly because we just don't have the resources. We don't have the ability sometimes to get into these systems at that level of detail um, to determine, you know, what's behind all of these affiliated charges. And um, Ms. Crane, Based on your review of the evidence, is it your opinion that Four Corners is a is a conditional precedent of the merger? I'm sorry, is a conditional precedent of the merger? Condition precedent. Um, that sounds like a legal term to me. I, I do say in my testimony in the Four Corners case that in my view, it is a condition of the merger. And I think it should be, I recommend that it be treated as a transaction cost of the merger and absorbed by shareholders. Um, now, there was, Ms. Winter had asked you a question about the rate credit and she says, well, now it's about $80 million, but isn't it really the second minute stipulation? It's 65 million and if, the Albuquerque Water Authority agrees with conditions made in during this hearing, it's going up to $67 million. That's the actual rate credit that, that if this merger application is approved. Is that your understanding? Yeah, 67 million would be the max. Okay. Do you, um, your testimony that it's disingenuous for PM to argue that the ETA overrides PNM's prior agreement in 16276, which you, you know you're familiar with, to have a prudence review. Um, Mr. Yeah, again, Examiner, I, I, this, I, Mr. Examiner, this is Rick Alvedris. I I object. We're getting into uh, legal issues that are at issue in the Four Corners case, and they're not uh, not germane to uh, this merger case. Mr. Nazi. I mean, it's, it's a condition, as you know, in the merger. 
it's it, four corners divestiture is a condition in the merger in a particular fashion, which is includes the NTEC, um, NTEC sale. Um, and I believe this is not far afield at all. It's about if this, I don't want to say anything further. I hope that was is enough to over. Yeah, the, the merger agreement has nothing to do about uh, you know re recovery under the ETA or otherwise. There's simply two two conditions which have been satisfied. That's undisputed. Uh, sustained. Um, you believe that um, failure to have a prudence review denies the signatories um, to the modified stipulation in sixteen two seventy six to challenge the prudence of Four Corners investment. Um, well, I recommend that the investment be challenged. Obviously, in my testimony in Four Corners, I've challenged recovery of that investment. Um, so I don't think that the, um, I don't, I think that in this particular case, because I view it as a, as a merger condition and a transaction cost, um, I, I, I believe that there is a basis, again, I'm not speaking as a lawyer, but I think that there is a basis for excluding those costs. Now, whether or not from a legal perspective, the ETA has provisions that somehow trump an earlier um, order or settlement agreement, you know, I can't respond to that. Okay, thank you. Um, you have three minutes, Ms. Nazi. Thank you so much. Um, you would prefer a rate freeze for 18 months as part of the merger agreement, would you not? Oh, I'd prefer a rate freeze for as long as you could get one, but you know, I, I would I would prefer 18 months over zero. Um, your opinion, I think what you what I wrote down was that the I think it was in in response to Mr. Albright, was that the public interest means that there must be a net benefit to rate payers. Is that, is that? That's how I interpret it, yes. And so if, whether it's 50 or 65 or $67 million for four corners, isn't it true that if rate payers are stuck with a $300 million um, cost of the four corners divestiture that there will be no net benefit to ratepayers from the merger. Mm -hmm. I, I think the problem with that um, with I think the problem with that analysis is that you you're attempting to put everything into known dollars and cents. So you know if we're looking at the 300 million dollars on one hand and we're looking at the um, stated and quantified uh, conditions like the rate credits and the economic development, then I may very well agree with you that 300 of, of, uh, of harm outweighs, you know, half of that in benefits or whatever. I, I think, though, it's fair for the decision makers in this case to take a somewhat broader approach and say, I mean, when I talk, when I use the term net benefit, I'm not just looking at the quantifiable, um, although that's usually the way we discuss it in testimony, but I think at the end of the day, the decision has to be made on balance. Does this entire um, transaction, including the potential good and bad for events in the future, provide a net benefit, is, is it likely to provide a net benefit to ratepayers? And in fact, we're probably not even gonna know that until you know, five or 10 years after the merger, whether, whether we were right or wrong. But I think you have to look at the entire transaction, um, including all those sort of uh, non-quantifiable elements that are out there. And admittedly, that's, that's tough to do. Okay, my your, your, time's, your time's up, Ms. Nazi. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Borman, I have uh, 20 minutes reserved. Thank you. I won't use nearly all of that. Um, good, good afternoon, Ms. Crane. Good afternoon, Mr. Borman. Now, now I know it was a long time ago uh, before lunch, but in, in response to a question from Ms. Winters, you said that 
you reviewed the second stipulation to see if there was anything problematic in it. Do you recall that? Uh, that was probably a very ineloquent way of saying that I reviewed it. And, um, and, and frankly, I really didn't have any comments on the second amended stipulation because I found it very close to the first. Okay, but you, do you recall having said that or anything uh, like that? I, I recall that general discussion, yes. Okay. And, w well, when, I, when you say you kind of looked to see if there was anything problematic, can you tell me what you meant by that? Sure. Um, I was not involved um, in, in well, as I mentioned, I was not involved in the first, in development of the first stipulation either, but nor was I involved at all really in the second. I mean, I had sort of heard there may be an amendment, there may be an, an amended version filed. And then, um, and my m sitting here today, as I mentioned, I think that I, I think that I may not have actually even seen that second amended stipulation until after it was actually filed. So what I meant to say was that I reviewed it um, to see if there was anything in there that gave me great concern and that it was, whether it was materially different, for example, from what I had seen previously, because I was not involved at all with, um, you know, with the discussions that resulted in that. When I looked at it, I saw that it was, in my view, virtually identical, except for one paragraph to the initial stipulation. So I sort of didn't give it much more of a thought because I'd already kind of focused my efforts on analysis of the initial stipulation. Okay, th well, thank you. And, and just so I, I wanna make sure I'm clear on this, but it sounds like what you said is you had no input into the first stipulation, is that correct? I said I was not directly involved at all oh, okay. with negotiating it. I said that I reviewed um, a couple of like maybe two or three um, versions of, a re of regulatory commitments and um, provided some thoughts to the attorney general. Okay. And for the second, you said you looked at it perhaps even after it was entered, correct? I, I think it was maybe even after it was entered. Okay, and your review was basically to the extent of looking to see what particular changes might have been inserted from the first stipulation. Correct. Okay, thank you, I have no further questions. Okay, uh, okay. is there any redirect? No, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Okay. Well, Who great. said that? Uh, that was Gideon Elliott, Mr. Lee. Mr. Examiner, this is Nan Winter. Yes. Uh, before we release this um, witness, I wanted to just make a brief offer of proof, if I might. Go ahead. All right. Um, um, in accordance with uh, rules of evidence 103, 702, 703, 705, New Mexico statutes annotated 38-6-6 and civil rule of procedure rule 26, um, um, I want to uh, suggest that no privilege attaches to the testifying experts and that I would have asked um, Ms. Um, Crane had she, if she had recommended the initial stipulation to the Attorney General and I would have asked if her opinion was different then than it was today. Uh, so with that, I just want to make that for the record and future reference. Thank you. Okay. Uh Ms. Crane, thank you. Thank you for your testimony and uh, you're excused. Okay, thank you very much, thank sir. Very much, sir. Okay, uh, next we were gonna go to Ms. Seguin, I guess the pronunciation is. Ms. Drake, are you here? Yes, and I believe she may be in the waiting room now, if you could check. Yep, I'm, ad I'm admitting her. Thank you. So she's there somewhere. <laughs> I, I see her now. Um, okay, I don't. Right here, Mr. Oh, Hayes. there she is, okay. Okay, go ahead. All right, Interwest Energy Alliance would call Ricky Seguin. 
Ms. Seguin, if you could unmute, there you go. And Mr. Lee, if you could swear her in, please. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give it the matter not pending should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, ma'am. Great. Good afternoon. Hi. If you could please state your name for the record and if you could correct us all on how to pronounce it, because I think we all messed it up this morning. Ricky Seguin. Seguin, thank you. And could you spell that for the court reporter, please? R-I-K-K-I-S-E-G-U-I-N. Great, thank you. Uh, by whom are you employed and in what capacity? I work as the executive director of the Interwest Energy Alliance, also known as Interwest. And on whose behalf are you testifying here today? On Interwest's behalf. If you could uh, please identify the document uh, you should have in front of you that I have labeled Interwest Exhibit 1. Could you tell us what that is, please? This is my direct testimony in case number 20-00222-UT. And that was filed on, on what date? June 18th, 2021. Great. Was this exhibit prepared by you or under your direct supervision and control? Yes. And do you have any corrections to this exhibit? I do not. And if I were to ask you the same questions today, would your answers be the same? They would. Are your answers true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Mr. Hearing Examiner, I move for admission of Interwest Exhibit 1. Any objections? Uh, hearing no objections, uh, Interwest Exhibit Number 1 is admitted. Thank you. I would uh, pass the witness for cross-examination. Okay, uh, Mr. Albright, you reserved uh, five minutes. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner. <laughs> Good afternoon, Ms. Seguin. Hi. Uh, just a couple of questions, obviously, by the time, and I feel I may, uh, if I'm not timely, get keel hauled, uh, which is a nautical term yeah, you may want to may want to look up at some point in time. Uh, but I do have uh, just a couple of questions with regard to the June 18, 2021 testimony that you filed. Um, first of all, I did want to ask whether or not you had had the opportunity to look at Ms. Uh, Reno's uh, testimony that was filed. I have. I have reviewed her testimony with respect to the second amended stipulation that was filed on July 16th, as that addressed many of the items in my testimony. Okay, and that was the testimony I, I was going to refer to. And I assume, and just want to get on the record, that that uh, Interwest um, has no objection to the addition of the rate credits, um, the economic development, the uh, arrearage or other, or the question is, does Interwest have any objection to Ms. Reno's uh, recommended increases with regard to uh, rate credits, the economic development, uh, the arrearage and other financial uh, increases that have been proposed in the second amended stipulation. Interwest does not object to those changes. Okay. And what about a, a rate freeze of some duration? I think Ms. Reno specified uh, no uh, specified June 2022 with regard to uh, the filing of a rate case as far as the, the delay in the time before a filing would be made. Interwest has no position on that and would have to consider it if it came forward. Okay, fair enough. And then would you turn to page three of your testimony as well? And again, I am talking. there. Okay, and beginning at the bottom of uh, page two, but really continuing on page three, you state at lines two and three. Well, let's start at line one long term transmission planning pursuit of participation in a regional transmission organization, RTO, and integrated resource plan modeling commitments. These commitments bring value 
to the state and to PM customers by helping to ensure fair and transparent project planning and selection processes. And then you continue as well. Is that a correct and accurate reading of, of that passage? It is, though I would note that the reasoning also refers to the items that begin at the bottom of page two, starting on lines 19. Okay, and, and fair enough. My, my question on the part that I did was, how does an RTO, a regional transmission organization, uh, bring value to the state and to PM customers? Interest uh, agrees with Mr. Howe's testimony that I believe was filed on June 18th about the benefits of an RTO, but some of the components about the benefits of an RTO and how they would bring value to the state and PNM's customers include centralized transmission planning and cost-effective acquisition of renewables in line with meeting the decarbonization goals in the Energy Transition Act. But what value do those bring to the PNM customers when they have those anyway, even without an RTO under PNM's um, generation and distribution? One benefit of an RTO would be the ability to bring on the lowest cost renewable resources that are needed to meet those commitments. So while the utility will meet those commitments in either case, the most cost effective avenue to do so and the greatest value for customers is through participation in an RTO. But with regard to the RTO and those assets, when the benefits of those uh, accrue to uh, export of generation and or transmission in other throughout the uh, region, if it's a, but it is a regional uh, RTO. I think there are different value streams. Uh, rate benefits are a value. So lower cost power could be one benefit that comes with an RTO as we've seen with participation and one market construct that exists out there now, which I know has come up a bunch, the Western energy imbalance market, saving money for ratepayers. Another value stream could be the economic development benefits that come from the building of renewable energy resources, some of which may well be in the state. Okay, but the Western EIM has been, is very different than an RTO, correct? That's correct. Do you see any overlap between the Western EIM and the RTO? As others have testified to today, I believe Mr. Fr Fridley, um, the joint applicants witness spoke about an EIM being a market and that type of market being one of many layers that could be contained within an RTO. So that is an example of a market that is likely part of an RTO, though the RTO that this stipulation commits PNM to joining may not exist yet. They will develop a stakeholder initiative to form one or join one. Mr. Albright, your time's up. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Seguin. I appreciate your taking the, the limited time we had today to answer those questions. Thank you, Mr. Schoenauer. Appreciate your testimony again, Ms. Seguin. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Drake, is there any redirect? No redirect, sir. Okay, uh, uh, Ms. Seguin, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You're excused. Thank you. Okay, uh, our next witness is going to be uh, Mr. Small. Uh, is that your witness, Mr. Haverly? Yes, Mr. Alexander, it is. And okay, so, if it please you, we call the joint applicants call for Small. I'm here. Would you raise Can you your hand? Okay. Please? This is Forrest Small. Can you hear me okay, Mr. Lee? Yeah, Forrest, Forrest we can hear you. You gotta get sworn in. Okay. Please raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter and opinion shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Small, would you please state your full name for the record? My name is Forrest Small. And Mr. Small, who are you employed by and what is your position? I'm employed by Concentric Energy Advisors. I'm a senior vice president with our firm. 
Mr. Small, you have in front of you what has been marked joint exhibit number 36, joint applicant exhibit number 36. Do you recognize that? I do. What is it? It is direct testimony in support of the second amended stipulation that I prepared, filed on June 18th, 2021. Mr. Small, do you have any corrections or changes to that testimony? I don't. If I asked you the same questions that are contained in your testimony, would you provide me with the same answers today? I would. And those answers would be true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. Hearing Zoner, I move for the admission of joint applicant exhibit number 36. Any objection? Hearing none, joint applicant exhibit 36 is admitted. Thank you. Mr. Small, you also have in front of you what has been marked joint applicant exhibit number 37. Do you recognize it? I do. What is it? It is July 29, 2021 rebuttal testimony that I prepared and was filed on July 29th, 2021. Do you have any corrections or changes to that testimony, Mr. Small? I don't. If I asked you the same questions that are contained in that testimony, would you provide me with the same answers today? Yes, I would. And those answers would be true and correct? Yes. Mr. Hearing Examiner, I move for the admission of joint applicants exhibit number 37. Any objection? Hearing none, joint applicants exhibit uh, 37 is admitted. Mr. Hearing Examiner, I have no additional direct and I tender the witness for cross-examination. Okay, uh, Ms. Winter, you'd reserved uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, no questions for Mr. Small. Okay. And the only other party going across my spreadsheet here is a staff. You, you reserve 20 minutes. Uh, I have no questions for Mr. Small. Okay. All right. I have no questions either. And um, I assume there's no redirect. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, Mr. Small. Uh, thank you for your testimony. You're excused. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Okay, my notes here. That concludes the, the direct case for uh, the joint applicants. Yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. We do not have any additional witnesses. Okay. Uh, next witness, I believe, is Ray's uh, witness, uh, Mr. Long. Is he available? Who's witness, Judge? CCAE. Yes, Coalition. Your Honor. Um, I'm going to get him. This Mr. Small went really quickly, so he's not in the waiting room, uh, but we'll be getting him right now. And CCAE stands for Coalition for Clean, Affordable Energy. That's correct. Is that you, Ms. Sir? Judge, was that Ms. Zerr speaking? Yes. Thank you. So we may get to uh, Douglas Howe today. So Mr. Long is getting on right now. You may want to check the waiting room. Yeah, I am. I don't see him yet. Okay.
He's not in your waiting room yet. He told me he was getting on. Don't see him. Okay. He's here now? No. There he is. So he should be there somewhere on your screens. Okay, see he's there connecting. You. So CCA would call its uh, witness Noah Long. Dr. Long, if you could unmute yourself and show yourself on the screen, please. Can you see me and hear me? This is Noah Long. Yes, we can. Yes. Mr. Lee, will you swear in uh, my witness? Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter now, Penny. Should be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Long. <clears throat> Could I get you to please state and spell your full name for the record? Sure. My name is Noah Long. Uh, that's spelled N O A H. Last name Long, L O N G. And by whom are you employed? I'm an employee of the Natural, excuse me, Natural Resources Defense Council, which is a national nonprofit environmental advocacy group. Do you have two exhibits before? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, environmental advocacy group. Thank you. Mr. Long, do you have two exhibits before you that have been marked CCAE Exhibit 1? and CCAE Exhibit 2? I do. And could you tell me what is CCAE Exhibit 1, please? CCAE uh, Exhibit 1 is my direct testimony, uh, and CCAE Exhibit 2 is my uh, testimony to the supplemental stipulation. And did you prepare uh, your direct testimony? I did, yes. Did you also prepare your supplemental, uh, I'm sorry, your testimony in support of stipulation? Yes, I did. Do you have any corrections to your testimonies? No. And if I were to ask you the same questions that are found in your direct and testimony in support of the stipulation, CCAE exhibits one and two, would your answers be the same? Yes. Are they true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I would request to admit CCAE exhibits one and two. Any objection? CCAE exhibits one and two are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. I pass the witness. Okay, uh, Ms. Winter, you're up first. You reserve 10 minutes. No questions for Mr. Long. Okay. Uh, Mr. Albright, you reserved 15 minutes. Uh, yes, I did, uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Long. Good afternoon, Mr. Albright. Um, again, for the record, uh, Jeff Albright uh, with uh, Jeff Albright Law, LLC, and I'm representing uh, Bernalillo County in this proceeding. Uh, so, Mr. Long, I want to, if we would uh, turn your direction to your uh, testimony, to get the right one here, of your um, direct uh, testimony. The, the original testimony or the testimony on the stipulation? Well, I have, I have them both. I think it is uh, on the uh, stipulation. Okay. Testimony in support of stipulation. Yes, sir. Okay, I believe at the top it may have been listed as direct testimony uh, of each of the pages, but I believe it is your testimony in support of the stipulation. That's where I'd like to focus our attention. Okay. Okay, so um, again, I have some, uh, uh, if you'd 
turn to page four, please. I have some questions related to the, uh, the RTO. Sure. And uh, roughly beginning, beginning at line six, you talk about enjoining a regional transmission authority RTO and reducing carbon emissions associated with PNM's generation portfolio to an amount equal to or greater than the emissions associated with PNM's 13% share of four corners upon abandonment. Did I read that correctly? I believe you did. Okay. Um, and then you go on at line nine, at lines nine and 10, and you talk about revising or rescinding the sale to NTEC and exiting the Four Corners power plant in a way that promotes rather than hinders early closure. Do you see that? Yes. Lines 10, 11? Yeah. How, how would that happen? How could, how could the joint app, or I'm sorry, yeah, how could the joint applicants rescind the sale to NTEC? Well, um, I don't believe it's a it's subject to the issues in this case. Uh, I think that those issues will be resolved in the Four Corners case, which is uh, about to be heard at the PRC. But of course, contracts change uh, or amended all the time, and I think it's conceivable that the parties to that that agreement or sets of agreements could could change those agreements through renegotiation or otherwise. And did you have the opportunity to look at Ms. Reno's uh, testimony? Um, I believe I've seen it, but I, I wouldn't want to be questioned on it in detail without having a chance to look at it now, if that's all right. Okay, no, that's, that's fair enough. Do you realize that Bernalillo County's position as well is that, is that there should be an exit from Four Corners as quickly as possible and to minimize the pollution that results if NTEC uh, were to continue it, try to work out something that would preclude it from continuing to, to yeah. cause those, those problems. Are you aware of that? I am. And if I can just say for a moment, you know, I think the, uh, at a high level, to the extent that this merger has motivated quicker action by PNM to exit Four Corners as a minority owner, is overall a good thing. I've, I've seen a number of coal plants around the West move towards retirement. And often the first stages are when minority owners decide uh, that the plants are no longer cost-effective, they're highly polluting, and they are no longer merit a position in the portfolio. That, that stage can be a very complicated stage because often the operator is the majority owner has a greater stake, including you know, for a whole lot of complicated reasons, not always in the consumer or environmental interest to keep it I'm open. Sorry, sir. Majority owner has a reason for for keeping the plant open, which are not always consistent with the consumer interest or the environment's interests. Um, but generally speaking, the push from minority owners to exit more quickly can hasten retirement, which I think is in the public interest. Now, how that happens can both be complicated and the details matter. And I hope that they'll be resolved favorably in that Four Corners uh, decision. And of course, NTEC is a minority owner as well, correct? That's correct. So also focusing on the other issue with regard to joining a regional transmission authority, your understanding that the proposal that's part of the second amended includes joining an RTO and, and not creating, not for PNM to create an RTO, correct? That's my understanding. Uh, uh, and I looked at, if I may reference uh, Mr. Howe's testimony on that issue, you know, and I, I think I agree with his overall conclusions, which are that, uh, and again, I'll, I'll state them for my own purposes, not to put words in his mouth, but that uh, the way that RTOs tend to be formed is that motivated utilities within a region find good reason to work together to, to bring these things about. So there's, I suppose, a gray area between forming and joining um, but I, I don't suppose that PNM, which is a relatively, or for that matter, avant grade PNM, if the merger is approved, uh, a relatively small utility in the region would form its own RTO 
and then invite all of the other re, uh, utilities in the region to join it, but rather that it would work with other utilities to form an RTO, perhaps building off of one of the existing entities in the West uh, to serve that purpose. And along those lines, with regard to the RTO, um, would you envision that it would need to include um, SPS and El Paso Electric and the other uh, IOUs, uh, as well as perhaps the electric co-ops? I would envision that that would certainly be preferable. Uh, the more utility members within a interconnection region, in this case, the WEC, that are participating, the more cost effective, the more resources that can be shared, the more renewable energy resources uh, that can be utilized uh, across a diverse geography. Um, so for all of those reasons, I would strongly encourage all of those entities to move as quickly as possible towards an RTO as I would encourage PNM or PNM Avant Grid. The, the inclusion or exclusion of any single one of those utilities, I don't think makes or breaks uh, the value of the RTO, but certainly the more, the more the better. Would that be better resolved through a rulemaking proceeding than through some kind of task force as is envisioned here, since it obviously would impact uh, and somewhat of a compound question, why include that as a condition of the merger? Uh, well, I guess that is, yeah, that is a couple of questions. So as to whether a rulemaking would be more appropriate, let me, let me say, I think a, a, a broad, inclusive stakeholder group would be useful in helping PNM or PNM Avant Grid move in that direction to bring in a range of perspectives and expertise. As to whether a rulemaking is needed, I, I think it might be premature at this point. You're not looking at a specific um, rule or set of regulations that's needed. It may at some point down the road be appropriate, but I think it'd be premature. Um, and then as to why to include it in the merger, you know, I think there are a whole range of conditions on the, on the merger and in, included in the stipulation that I think advance the public interest broadly and ensure that the, the utility, the combined utility, if, if approved, would be one that would pursue the public interest more uh, in, in, to a greater degree, whether it's for consumer benefit, for environmental be benefit, or in many cases, both. And I think this is an instance of both. And so we've seen PNM unfortunately move relatively slowly towards advancement of an RTO in the past years, although there is forward progress. And having this condition included, I think advances uh, the public interest and does so in a way that really builds upon the unique or at least somewhat unique characteristics of on grid as a, as a major renewable energy and transmission developer. And I think having greater sway and opportunity to move those conversations along in the West. Now, two, two follow on questions there. If it's premature for a rulemaking, isn't it premature to embark on establishing an RTO? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, establishment is a is a broad term in this context. We're not a few days away from you know cutting a ribbon on a west wide RTO here. I think we're in a even in the best case circumstances a multi year process. So, I, I don't mean to oppose a rulemaking at some point. I just don't think that there would be a sufficient details for a PRC rulemaking at this point. Now, I could be convinced that uh, for, through further conversation that maybe that's also appropriate but I don't think that's to the exclusion of the stakeholder process that's been discussed in the, in the stipulation. Okay, and, and with, uh, with regard to the <clears throat> creation, isn't it true that there is no existing RTO anywhere in the Western region, correct? Well, RTO slash ISO, these terms are often used uh, interchangeably. So I would note that there is obviously the California ISO, there's the uh, SPP uh, ISO slash RTO, which comes close to our region. Um, but no, there's not a region-wide RTO that's ready for us to join tomorrow. It does, it will require uh, groups of utilities working together to, to build and establish that. And I'll just again, refer to Mr. Howe's testimony where he noted that I'd say both the SPP, the Southwest Power Pool and the California ISO have advantages, but also disadvantages uh, in their current formation. I don't think particularly the California ISO's disadvantages uh, can't be overcome, which is, sorry, let me Thank phrase you. that differently. I think they could be overcome through changes in governance, but I don't think that it's likely that we would join it in its current form. And I say we- I'm sorry, changes in- it could be overcome from changes in, and can you in, slow down? 
Sure, in, in governance, in its governance structure. Um, I was going to Mexico say the Cal- likely to join. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to step on your answer there. And the, and the and Cal ISO is not- hold, to- hold on, hold on. Yeah, Mr. Long, could you speak a little slow? slow? I, will work, I will endeavor to do so, I apologize. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Mr. Albright, go ahead. And Mr. Long, there's, there's just to be clear, uh, the Cal ISO is not uh, an RTO, correct? I think that's fair to say. Okay. Um, before I, I run out of time, I do want to ask uh, again, being somewhat familiar with Ms. Reno's testimony, she proposed some increase in, in rate credits, um, some additional uh, relief as far as arrearages go, uh, economic development, um, some uh, uh, and a potential rate uh, freeze uh, with a rate filing no sooner than June of 2022. Um, do you um, have any objection to those um, to those proposals from uh, Ms. Reno on behalf of the county? Uh- I certainly don't have objections to increases in, in rate credits uh, or payments towards arrearages um, to the extent that they don't undermine the broader stipulation and agreement. Um, economic development. Economic development as well. Um, again, to the same, to the same, with the same condition. As to a rate freeze, I would note the line of questioning that I, I briefly saw from Mr. Michael earlier. I think to the extent that a rate freeze would prohibit a net decrease through securitization and abandonment, I, I may have concerns, uh, even if that includes uh, an increase for the bonded uh, component with a decrease from the reduction in, in uh, base rates. Um, but otherwise, uh, I, I don't have concerns. Does that answer your question? It does, it does. Thank you for that. Two minutes, uh, Mr. Albright. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner. And then with regard to, uh, I guess it's on page eight, where we talk about page seven and page eight, with regard to um, item number 43, with regard to the commitment number 43 there on the carbon reduction task force plan for decarbonization. Do you see that? I do. Um, In your column that's labeled let me get back to it here with regard to in table NL1 on that page regarding it. Um, it recommends industry representatives for this task force, including state agencies of NMED, EMNRD, New Mexico Attorney General, and NMPRC. Uh, do you see that? I do. Okay. What experience does EMNRD, for example, or NMED have with regard to utility regulation? Well, uh, specifically with regard to utility regulation, I'd say relatively little, but with regard to the broader decarbonization, renewable energy, and carbon regulation, which I'm of sorry, course- sorry, with this, regard to? I'm sorry. Uh, it, I'm having a hard time remembering exactly the words I use, but I'd say decarbonization, <laughs> carbon regulation, renewable energy, all of those are expertise uh, that held by those two agencies and important to that task force. And why include that? I mean, one of the concerns for the county is the fact that this appears to commit them to being involved in this if it is approved, even though there's representation about legislation, but you're committing you're committing to have a, a legislative move and, and at least get involved in that process where they may or may not want to do that, you know, from an elected elected body. And the same is true, of course, for the NMPRC, where this is being put out there as working toward proposed legislation, where they may or may not. And I agree, it states that everyone may take their own position with regard to specific legislation, mm-hmm. but the way it's structured, doesn't this bind uh, participation for at least certain groups to participate in drafting or putting together legislation? I, I see the, I, I guess I read it a little bit differently than you do, Mr. Albright. Um, okay. I see the task force is working towards the decarbonization goal and resource planning, 
which could be independent uh, of any proposed legislation. And I think those agencies, as well as the PRC and the other stakeholders would have a lot of value in that process. Uh, it may be useful and it may end up being critical to have legislation to meet that target as well. And, and I have found in, in my experience working on legislation in New Mexico that early consultation and involvement of state agencies in that process is very useful. And uh, I, I'm not sure that the PRC has jurisdiction to bind other state agencies through this stipulation, but in binding the applicants to at least endeavor to include those stakeholders um, in order to create a more robust, both resource plan, decarbonization plan, and potential legislation, I think is a good thing. Okay, Mr. Schonauer, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Long, appreciate uh, your discussion and your testimony today. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Nanazi, you reserved 50 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Long. Good afternoon, Ms. Nanazi. Um, The, is one of the premises of your support for Avangrid coming here that they will be um, a beneficial partner that demonstrates um, ability to implement renewables and sustainable energy development? I'd say that overstates uh, my support for the stipulation in an overly broad manner. Um, Avangrid and its subsidiaries certainly are world leaders in renewable energy development. And I hope that we're able to capture uh, some benefits from that leadership role and investment opportunities. Uh, but the stipulation is more narrow and I support it as, as written, which is to say, I think the stipulation requires the joint applicants to pursue uh, rapid decarbonization and renewable energy development in, the, in New Mexico, um, joining of the RTO, significant consumer benefits, benefits to low-income customers through low-income energy efficiency program additions, more rapid investment in electric vehicle infrastructure in the state, and other benefits. Um, so I was prepared, as, as you'll probably note through my initial testimony, to oppose this merger if those benefits weren't clear and concrete. I believe, as written in the stipulation, they are, um, and, and I'm prepared to support it as written. And do you know that solar and wind um, and even storage at this point are the most cost effective um, energy resources um, to be had? I do, I'm thrilled to see it. Um, I mean, in the last few years that we've all been working on this, I've seen just a revolution in the energy landscape and it's enormously gratifying to see that uh, not only are those resources the most uh, sorry, the, the lowest polluting, um, but also the most cost effective. I, I would note, if I, if I may, that, that uh, to not jump ahead too far, uh, but that doesn't always mean that they're the preferred resources by many utilities in the Western US or, or elsewhere, nor have they always been the preferred uh, resources of PNM. Um, and potentially, nor would they always be the preferred resources of Avant Grid. So I think having the policy background uh, and policy requirements to achieve rapid decarbonization remain just as relevant and important as they were 10 years ago, say. Um, are you aware that Avangrid Ibadrola has, well, specifically Ibadrola, excuse me, strike that. Are you aware that Ibadrola has less than 2% solar in its energy portfolio? When you say Iberdrola, are you referring to the parent company, which includes a variety of uh, utilities? Yes, including Avangrid. Including Avangrid. Uh, I wasn't aware of that specific number, uh, and it's disappointing. Um, and while they get an A um, in uh, in coal because they have no coal on their um, on their in their energy portfolio. They have like a, a D in um, too much gas and too much nuclear. Are you aware of that? I'm not sure what grading system you're referring to. So no, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, um, it's like, anyway, I'll, all right. Um, but are you aware of the uh, intense 
investment by both Avangrid and Ibadrola in gas, particularly, but nuclear as well? Uh, again, I, when you say intense investment, I, I prefer some greater quantification if, if it's possible. I, I'm certainly aware that the utilities that they own in the Northeast are invested in both gas and, and nuclear. And um, for those reasons, I think the New Mexico statutory context, as well as the commitments in the stipulation, are important to make sure that we drive towards a truly zero carbon uh, resource base in the state as quickly as possible. Is there anything in the stipulation that takes action to clean up the San Juan generating station? To require further mitigation than otherwise is required by law, you mean? Correct. Not that I'm aware of. And is it your understanding that PNM's current plan or in action is to let the San Juan generating station retire in place um, for 25 years and um, and then allegedly clean it up. Are you referring to the um, the plant itself? I'm not aware of the full details of that plan. Um, if 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 their plan, if PNM's plan is to retire San Juan in place for 25 years. Do you believe that that is an intergenerational shift? By intergenerational shift, do you mean this generation causing harm to future generations through inadequate cleanup of environmental harm? And also that um, in 25 to? years, if somebody was born today, they're gonna be having to pay for a cleanup of the San Juan generating station and didn't even get the benefit of the electricity. If uh, I mean, I, I guess I would say I strongly approve of uh, coal plants, other fossil plants being retired and cleaned up. Um, and I would say that to the extent that the premise of your question is that this stipulation doesn't address all environmental concerns of all plants in New Mexico. I, I think that's probably a fair assessment. Um, I do think it makes significant bounds, or, uh, progress towards some environmental harms and some environmental cleanup, including uh, in the Northwest corner of the state uh, and the Four Corners power plant. But it's certainly fair to say that it is not all inclusive of all environmental uh, cleanup that is required either otherwise by law or needs to be pursued through a new policy. Well, I'm not talking about all plants, but specifically, let's start with San Juan. You know that um, Mr. Eisenfeld, for instance, um, uh, submitted testimony that, and then some of the other community groups, um, Dene Care and Tinoja, Tinoja, um, also wanted um, cleanup of first the San Juan plant, um, but there is no commitment in this stipulation. I mean, that was in their direct testimony and um, there is no commitment to modify that um, in any significant way to begin cleanup of San Juan. I'm, I'm not sure what the question was there, I'm sorry. That there is nothing in the stipulation despite that testimony mm -hmm. um, of, from the people who live there, from the impacted communities to actually begin cleanup when the plant closes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you'd have to question them on their rationale for ultimately supporting the stipulation. Um, but I would recognize that, you know, all parties made requests that and not all things ended up in the stipulation. I think Ms. Crane said a few minutes ago when, you know, when she's looked at things, she often looks for getting at least half. I think, you know, we'd like to shoot a little bit higher than that, but it's certainly true that it doesn't resolve all issues. And I'm just trying to get you specifically to acknowledge that it doesn't um, require the cleanup of yeah, not to As I said, I think before, I, not to my knowledge, it doesn't address that. And it also doesn't address um, the cleanup of Four Corners power plant when it closes. Is that correct? Uh, not, no, not as to my knowledge, it does not add any additional requirements other than what is already required under federal or state law for mitigation or cleanup of either the plant or the mine. And would, you, would it be fair to say that you would agree that the state of New Mexico has been lax in enforcement of, um, of environmental rules specifically regard in the last 10 years? with regard to Four Corners and San Juan? Yeah, I, I, 
I mean, I, I have lots of opinions about New Mexico environmental policy, but that's a very broad question. And I don't know that I'd want to agree or disagree without further specificity. I mean, I, I would say, generally speaking, that the previous administration did a great deal, the, the Martinez administration did, it, unfortunately, a great deal to defund the environmental reg regulatory capacity of our state. And we have not fully rebuilt that capacity. I strongly support rebuilding that capacity, including through enforcement, but also additional requirements uh, for cleanup and mitigation, both of power plants, but also the oil and gas sector in the Northwest and the Southeast and elsewhere. You agree that, that um, Four Corners divestiture is a contingent of the merger? Uh, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, I, I think it's fair to point to my initial testimony where I where I called on that concern. And I, I'd like to just, if I may, answer the question uh, a bit broadly, and then we can get to the specifics. But I'd say since that initial testimony, a, a great deal has come to light, both with regard to PNM's um, discussions about exiting the coal plant and the specific possible contract with Entech well before the merger, their ongoing commitment to that Four Corners docket and abandonment, as well as the sales, uh, proposed sale, uh, with or without this merger. Um, and I think, as I said previously to Mr. Albright, to the extent that the merger motivated PM to ensure that they move away from coal, I think that's broadly a good thing. I, I did have concerns, and I continue to have concerns with some of the specifics about those, I, I believe that they can be fully and without prejudice addressed in the four corners proceeding. Um, so will, but you agree that it's a, um, with your prior testimony that it is in fact a contingent and the four corners divestiture is a contingent of the merger. It, I mean, I think it's clear in the, in, the stipul in the stipulation as well as the initial application that certain movement towards divestiture was, was a contingency that they mutually agreed upon. Um, I think it, it wouldn't be fair to say that full divestiture is a contingency. I don't think that that will be resolved prior to this case. And I, I haven't seen either applicant withdraw or make movement towards withdrawal from the merger as a result of the fact that it's still to be, many of those issues are still to be resolved in the other case. Will p &M's current plan for abandonment and sale to NTEC, that's N-T-E-C, result in the closure of Four Corners Power Plant? Not to my knowledge, no. And is it um, in fact just the opposite? Does the transaction between p &M and NTEC require p &M to vote against early retirement should it arise? It does. And, and as I said, I, I have very significant concerns with those details. If I may some, you know, restate what I said to Mr. Albright, which is that I think the movement by minority owners away from coal plants tends to have uh, momentum towards closure. And, and I think you may be aware, for example, that APS is currently in conversations about legislation towards, uh, for securitization uh, of the plant. And my hope is that these divestments, along with the reduced demand for the power, which I think is very powerful here, um, will motivate early closure. But I agree that the specific requirement uh, in that sales agreement of, for PNM to vote against uh, early retirement is very problematic and uh, I think should be addressed fully in the Four Corners docket. And do you also think that it's hypocritical of Avangrid to say, um, well, it's not on our books, but, and, and it won't uh, quote unquote account um, against us. But if the NTEC um, PNM agreement is approved as currently applied for in the 2117 UT docket, um, that, that, that would be contrary to what you want, which is to have the plan closed. I think it's probably going a bit far to say it's hypocritical. I mean, I think it's fair to say that they that that contract could have and should have been negotiated better and more more consistently with the objective of early retirement. Um, that said, I do think that their encouragement of uh, of P and M to move, continue to move towards divestiture is a, still a good thing. And in your in your direct testimony, you stated that you believed that it was contrary to the public interest 
for P&M to negotiate an agreement with NTEC that includes provisions impending, uh, sorry, impeding um, an early closure of the plant by other parties. Is that right? Yeah, and I continue to disagree with that provision of the contract. As I said, I, I hope it'll be addressed and I expect it'll be addressed in the Four Corners docket. Um, you were involved in the writing of the ETA, correct? Um, I think, sure, I, I guess that's broadly fair to say. We, I worked on that bill in a variety of ways, including advocating for its passage. Um, but, you were, but specifically, you were involved in um, the crafting of the actual language in the ETA. I think it'd probably be more fair to say I was involved in the stakeholder process and, and negotiation. The drafting is done by legislative council. Um, but you provided some drafts to legislative council, is that correct? Uh, drafts, comments on drafts, recommendations, uh, concerns, <laughs> uh, support, uh, all of the above. Okay, and so you spent many, many, many hours involved in um, the ETA, is that right? Absolutely fair, yes. Um, what would you say is the broad purpose of the ETA. I'm going to object here, Your Honor. I just don't see the relevance. ETA is not an issue in the case, and you sustained an objection earlier that the Attorney General made for the same reason. And I, I join in the objection. This is Rick Alvedras. Mr. Nancy, what? How's this relevant? It's really just one, literally one preliminary question um, that I'm going to go back to. Um, after, um, around the, what I believe Mr. Long will say is that the purpose of the, of the ETA is to transition away from coal and then tie it back to this issue about NTEC. Okay, objections uh, overruled. Okay, well. Say broadly, sir, what sure. you believe um, the purpose of the ETA is or well, I, I'd say there's a, as I often described it at the time, sort of a three-legged stool uh, that underlies the purpose of the ETA, which is um, uh, environmental benefit, um, consumer benefit, and uh, just transition. And the idea is to support a movement of New Mexico towards a 100% clean economy while supporting those three legs of the stool. So... You know, I can go into sort of specific provisions and how I think they achieved each of those elements, but I, I'm, I think uh, that's good. I think it's fair to say it's a three a three legged stool. Okay, so but clearly one of those legs, one of the primary goals was to transition from not only coal but ultimately fossil fuel um, investment. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. Um. So do you believe that it is a net public detriment to allow P&M to sell its Four Corners power plant shares to NTEC, which as currently written in the agreement will continue to allow coal to be burned? I think it's more complicated than that, unfortunately. I mean, I do have very significant concerns with that provision. As I've said, on the other hand, I think minority owners that also have demand for the power moving away from uh, utilization and ownership tends to have a cascading effect towards earlier retirement, notwithstanding the, the, those provisions. And I, I still believe that that's very likely in that, this case. Um, there are other elements, of course, of the stipulation now, out, again, outside the, the specific contract that you're talking about that I think very strongly support just transition, including direct investment with the community uh, that have brought about my support and that of the, many of the community groups. Twelve and a half million dollars is an inadequate amount of money to support um, all the harm that's been done to those impacted communities for the last 50 years, is it not? I would say that it is. It's also twelve and a half million more than I've seen in most coal plant retirements around the country. Um, so while inadequate, it's a strong step forward. I, and I would also note it's, it's not the only money that will be in re reinvested. The ETA itself allows for further reinvestment. And I very much hope that, uh, that any funding from this will be uh, an example that 
the Arizona Commission will follow in in uh, requiring significant investment from the majority owners. Mr. Chanel. Mr. Nassi, did you say 50 years or 15 years? 50. Could you tell me how many more minutes I have? Uh, you have, uh, <clears throat> let me see here. I have you down for until uh, 10 to four, so until 3.50. But I think, I think we've been going a little while now. I'd like to take a, a shorter break, a 10 minute break and come back and then you can uh, finish uh, at uh, four o'clock. So let's take a break till uh, uh, 3.30. Thank you. Thank you. Judge. Recess till 3.30. Judge, if you could remind the witness to slow down again as we go on, I'd appreciate it. Okay. I heard you and I will, I will try again. I apologize. I know if, if that's your habit, there's just about nothing you can do about it, but just do the best you can. I, I, I will and please feel free to interrupt me to tell me to slow down as I go. I apologize. No, sir. Thank you.
Ready when you are, Judge. Okay. Uh, Mr. Long, uh, Ms. Nanazi, are you both, uh, can you turn on your videos? Mr. Long? Okay, uh, Ms. Nanazi, uh, you have till uh, four o'clock. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Long, do you, want, do you know um, if Kit Carson will be 100% um, daytime solar by next year? I don't know. Uh, I have heard that that their goal is to achieve 100% daytime solar. Uh, I think by 2022. I'm not sure at what time. I also don't know what specific hours of the day they refer to when they say daytime solar. Whether that's adjusted over the course of the year, or if it's a an eight uh, standing sort of eight to twelve hour period. Um, do, you know what, do you know what um PNM's current renewable energy um is in uh, relative to the rest of their portfolio, what percentage of it is? Well, I know that the ETA required 20% by 2020. Uh, as to today's percentage, either daytime or otherwise, I'd welcome your reminder. Um, other than renewable energy credits, is PNM 20% renewable? Does PNM have 20% renewables um, in their portfolio today? It's 2021. Ms. Nanasi, I would appreciate your reminder of their specific compliance at this time. So you don't know? I don't know their exact percentage today. Um, the, the stipulation states that the signatories believe that the merger agreement is fair, just, and reasonable, and in the public interest. Is that right? I believe so. And is it your testimony that you believe that the merger agreement is fair, just, and reasonable, and in the public interest? Yes, I do. I, I, I you know, it's been amended once, so it's the second amended stipulation, I believe it's referred to. No, I'm not asking no. you stipulation i'm asking about the merger agreement oh I, I i agree to the stipulation that that it's fair just and reasonable as an originally uh, apply uh, that original application i had significant concerns but it's the commitments have changed significantly since then but sir i'm asking very specifically is the merger agreement not the stipulation but the merger agreement is it fair just and reasonable and in the public interest I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm not quite sure what you're, what you're asking here. I mean, I, I think my initial testimony stated very significant concerns with the merger agreement as applied. The merger agreement, as I believe we're discussing for the purposes of these hearings is the stipulation, um, which I do support. Okay, so I'm asking you, so does, is that, does that mean that your testimony is that the merger agreement itself, you don't believe is fair, just and reasonable and in the public interest. Absent the conditions in the stipulation. Yes, I had significant concerns with the merger prior to the uh, conditions in the stipulation. And so do the benefits in your, as you understand them from the stipulation, outweigh the negative um, impacts of the merger agreement?
Well, I, I'm not sure that I would phrase it that way. Let, let me take a step back, if I may. I think the merger agreement, as I understand the requirements in New Mexico and in many other states, uh, if approved, or you know, including the conditions in, in stipulations, if approved, uh, are required to have a net benefit for customers uh, and, for, and for the public interest. I believe that with the stipulation, it, it does. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that uh, it's a matter of outweighing negative impacts as much as in ensuring positive impacts. I think there are a number of ways that the initial proposal fell short of ensuring clear positive impacts for customers, for the environment, and for the public interest. And I outlined those. Uh, as amended and in the stipulation, I believe they, the agreement contains clear and specific benefits for customers, the environment, and the public interest. It's, th there is obviously a question of risk for, for, all, for all of those parties, whether it's customers or the environment or the public, uh, that a stipulation entails by bringing in a new company that's going to have a management role and an investment role uh, in overseeing a, a public service utility. Uh, and I think that the, the net benefit is intended to overcome that risk uh, that comes with, with the change in ownership. But I'm not sure that I would characterize it as clear and obvious negatives per se. I think uh, prior to approval of a merger and potentially after approval of a merger, uh, this company will be held by shareholders that uh, have shareholder interests in mind when making significant investments. So it's critical that the regulatory commission and the statutory framework maintain a public interest for, for any owner. And I, I do believe that in, in this context, the merger applies clear requirements uh, if approved as stipulated, and sorry, in the stipulation uh, that will ensure that those risks, uh, such as they may be, are, are overcome. When you wrote your direct testimony, it was in response to the merger application, correct? Yes. Um, CCAE, you're testifying for CCAE, correct? Correct. And CCAE has no expert witness in the Four Corners power plant abandonment um, and securitization case pending in 21-00017 UT, does it? You'd have to ask our attorney in that case. You don't know? I, you know, I'm not aware of the full schedule of that proceeding and whether uh, we may still have opportunity to provide testimony. Um, or, and so, no, I think you'd be better off asking the attorney about our, her plans or our plans for, for that full proceeding. Okay, as it stands today, um, do you, does CCAE have an expert witness in the abandonment securitization four corners, four Check corners abandonment yes, securitization. Overruled. Again, I would say uh, I am not aware of this, all of the plans of our attorney in that case. And so I would uh, request that you ask, ask our attorney in that case. I know, but I'm not allowed to ask your attorney questions, so I can only ask you. So do you know, do you know if there's an expert witness that has been tendered as of today's date in the Four Corners Abandonment and Securitization case in 21-00017. I'll repeat, I, I'm not aware of our attorney's uh, plan, all of her plans in, in that case, uh, including what experts she may have already been in communication with or otherwise be working with. Um, are you aware of the recent decision in the Arizona Corporation Commission regarding Four Corners Power Plan and Imprudence? I am at a high level, although I have not re reviewed it in detail. Could you share what you understand, what the recommended decision states regarding Four Corners Power Plant? Chair Examiner, I, I object uh, on relevance ground. Uh, the, the witness says he's not really familiar with this, but in addition, uh, there hasn't been a decision. What there is is a recommended decision uh, involving Arizona Public Service Company and that has no, no bearing on this case. Mr. Nazi. 
I believe it has bearing on the case because this merger agreement requires Four Corners divestiture and a, a, a recommended decision. I said it was a recommended decision. Um, ha, has influence given the fact that Arizona Public Service Company um, is the owner and operator um, and it's a neighboring uh, regulatory agency regarding a plant that PNM is invested in. Overruled. Can you restate the question? Can you can you please explain your understanding to the extent that you have um, regarding the Arizona Corporation Commission's decision regarding Four Corners Power Plant and um, and imprudence? I believe you're referring to the recommended decision that recommends disallowance of certain costs associated with pollution control. Correct. Yeah, and I believe that the recommendation is to disallow uh, significant costs with regard to the uh, pollution control required for the regional haze rule uh, that was installed and invested by by APS and the other members of the uh, member owners of the power plant. And that decision came out just a couple of days ago, specifically 15 days ago or so. You'd have to tell me the specific date, but I believe, yes, it was a recent, recent recommended decision. Okay. Um, and the amount that was disallowed is approximately half a billion dollars. I don't have that number in front of me, um, but if, if you can cite it to that recommended decision, I'd be happy to affirm it or deny it. Um, sir, let me ask you something. You said that you, in your testimony that you, that, um, you were concerned about low income customers. Is it, generally, that's a true statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe perhaps overly, overly broad uh, to the point of sounding like, uh, sort of a, a general liberal malaise, but I think there were specific uh, low income provisions that I was concerned about, including low income energy efficiency programs in particular um, and arrearages um, that have been addressed in the stipulation. Okay. That's what I wanna to talk to you about is okay. the arrearages, sorry. But um, so does the stipulation wipe out the arrearages? Uh, again, I, you know, there's nothing in my testimony that speaks to this specifically. So I don't have the specific numbers. If, if you have a table that you'd like me to take a look at or, or calculations you'd like me to affirm, I'm happy to do that. My general understanding is that the stipulation does not by itself uh, wipe out the arrearages. I did see uh, Mr. Darnell's testimony the other day saying that he thought when combined with other available funds, it, it may do so. I hope that that's the case. Um, but my general understanding is that by itself, it does not completely wipe out the arrearages. Is it a concern of yours that, um, that three P and M, um, senior management stands to gain close to $30 million, $29.6 million approximately, um, which exceeds the total amount that would go to 500,000 approximately re residential ratepayers. Ms. Nanasi, if you could point to me either in my testimony or somewhere else, the comparison that you're looking at and how those are conditions of the merger, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Um, as a general matter, you know, I, I think that uh, equity is an important consideration and support for low income customers are important considerations. And I think the components of the stipulation that put significant dollars towards those are meaningful. I think, you know, the, the status quo, of course, is that none of those commitments are made, um, not that some greater amount or for all of corporate compensation somehow move towards either low income arrearage repayment or low income energy efficiency payment. Having been involved in these types of proceedings, including low income energy efficiency proceedings, proceedings in a number of states, it's simply never the case that the commission views itself as having jurisdictions to I'm sorry, jurisdiction sir. to. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Sir. Low I'll income slow down. energy efficiency proceedings in a number of states. It's simply never the case 
that uh, utility commissions believe that they have the jurisdiction to reach into corporate compensation and instead fund either low income uh, energy efficiency programs or uh, to support arrearage repayment. So in my view, any significant movement, and, and by that I, I don't mean you know, some purely symbolic amount, but significant movement towards arrearage payment uh, or low income energy efficiency investment improvement uh, is a is a is a benefit, and in this case, I believe the amounts that have been committed to are significant when compared to both the status quo and um, the amounts uh, in other states that are that are being committed to. Okay, so if I told you that the evidence in this case is that three P and M officers will make. $29,575,049, three people, and then approximately 500,000 average residential rate payers, which according to Mr. Darnell will receive $26,046,014. Do you think that that is an equitable uh, ratio. Mr. Chairman, Examiner, I object. The question has been asked and answered. In addition, an insufficient foundation has been laid because this witness testified that he wasn't, you know, clear of the particulars. And so he I asked object. me to give him the particulars, which I just provided. Well, so. Uh, I, I do disagree with the premise of the question. I, I have heard a, a number of witnesses, although I haven't been able to follow the entire hearing. But what I've seen is that there is ongoing conversation at the least and maybe even dispute as to whether Mr. Darnell's testimony will be the only interpretation as to how the uh, rate credits will be distributed. And uh, to the extent that it doesn't unwind the stipulation, I would strongly support a per customer allocation of those uh, credits, which would change the numbers into your calculation very significantly. I've also heard significant dispute as to whether the uh, payments towards executives, uh, which I agree are ungodly high, uh, will in any way relate to the merger specifically. So while you know, I'd be very happy over a, a, a glass of wine or a, or a cup of coffee to go over with you my deep concerns about uh, inequitable executive compensation and how that relates to uh, worker compensation uh, over the last you know, 50 and 70 years. And I have deep concerns about that. I don't necessarily agree that the comparison in this case is an apt one because I'm not sure that their compensation is specifically tied. Uh, the compensation you mentioned to those executives is specifically tied to the merger. I don't think the amount that you mentioned for customer uh, rate credits is necessarily the right one. Um, and even if it were, I'm not sure that an apples to apples comparison is appropriate. Um, sir, you've heard a bunch about um, Avangrid and Ibadrola's conduct here in Maine, in Spain. Um, first, I'd like to talk to you about corruption and dark money and investments um, in uh, PACs and advertising as opposed to just uh, a hearing on the merits. Um, what's your position and has, has it caused you concern through the process? Sorry about that. There was a motorcycle or something going by. Um, has that, has that caused you concern during the process of um, this case? Objection, Brian Haverly, argumentative. Uh, I heard statements about dark money and other uh, things that are not in the record, Mr. Hearing Examiner, so I object to that question. Rephrase your question. Mr. Long, have you, um, in, in the course of this proceeding, have you, um, been concerned about um, sort of the nefarious ways um, that Ibadrola and Avangrid have conducted themselves um, here in Maine um, and in Spain. 
Objection, Mr. Aaron Zander, Brian Haverly, argumentative, nefarious. Sustained. Have you, um, Mr. How would you characterize Mr. Long, what you've heard about the actions um, or inactions of Ibadrol and Avangrid um, in Spain and Maine and here? Well, if I may, I'm sure I'm not, um, I'm sure I'm not uh, aware of every detail that you may be referring to. I mean, these, this is a gigantic company with multiple um, subsidiaries in multiple jurisdictions. And so I'm sure that their corporate behavior and corporate compliance um, is varied as it is in many large companies. Um, that said, I, you know, I am aware of some instances of concern with regard to uh, discovery requests here in this proceeding, uh, concerns with regard to uh, reliability uh, in some of their utilities in the Northeast that I think are significant concerns and should be taken seriously. I mean, I think that's the whole purpose of the regulatory environment that we have here in New Mexico and that we have at the federal level, whether it's NERC or FERC the PRC uh, or other regulatory agencies and the statutory framework that's required for monopoly utilities, which candidly without regulation would be very dangerous entities for, for consumers and for the environment. Um, so I think it's critical that this agency pay very close attention to uh, compliance and requirements with regards to its laws, uh, regulations and proceeding orders uh, to ensure compliance, whether it's PNM, which certainly does not have a crystal clean, uh, spotless record with regard to compliance, uh, or, or or a or a combined company of uh, of Avant Grid PNM. So I guess you know to generally answer your question, I'd say uh, I haven't seen anything in the context of this proceeding that would lead me to believe that this parent company is inherently unacceptable as a utility uh, owner or partner with p and um, But like many parent companies uh, and like many utilities, I've seen every reason to believe that the regulatory environment that we have here in, in New Mexico and in parallel form in many or every state is critical to ensure that the public interest and consumers are, are protected. Um, Mr. Long, what is the Committee to Protect New Mexico Consumers? The Committee to Protect New Mexico Consumers, I believe, has been dissolved. It was a 501c4 uh, nonprofit organization uh, advocating for utility reform in New Mexico. Sorry, utility commission reform in New Mexico. And what was your involvement in it? I was on the board. I'm going to object, Your Honor. What's the relevance of this line of questioning? I believe it goes, I haven't gotten there quite yet, but I believe it will go to um, bias and credibility. Bias towards what? I mean, what would it go to prove that's an issue in this case? Ms. Nanazi? Do you want me to answer that question? Yes. Um, Without, I think that it will, the couple of questions that I have for Mr. Long about that um, will elicit, he, he just spoke about the need for regulation um, in order to be robust. <laughs> against um, the possibility of different wrongs that may be committed by a monopoly utility. And I think that his views about this commission um, are such that they haven't been um, robust. And I wanna make that connection. The, the objections overruled. Can you restate the question? 
I forget what I asked. Could we have Mr. Lee um, stated, please? Give me a second here. Thank you. And Ms. Nancy, you have six minutes. Um, there was actually no question pending. Mr. Long may not be, uh, I'm sorry, what is the Committee to Protect New Mexico Consumers? The Committee to Protect New Mexico Consumers, I believe, has been dissolved. I believe it was a 501c4 nonprofit or organization advocating for utility reform in New Mexico. Sorry, utility commission reform in New Mexico. Question, and what was your involvement in the answer? I was on the board. And what did the Committee to Protect New Mexico consumers advocate? We advocated that New Mexico's uh, current constitutional arrangement for the uh, Public Regula Regulation Commission, which allows for uh, elected rather than appointed commission uh, commissioners, uh, may have been in, may be inadequate and pointed to the fact that um, I believe 38 states have uh, appointed commissions um, and that there were a variety of reasons to think that an appointed commission uh, might, be, might be better for New Mexico, particularly in light of the very significant, complicated and technical issues before the commission with regard to decarbonization, uh, electrification, uh, energy efficiency, just transition, and so forth. I, you know, if you, the, the organization uh, um, we obviously had specific materials, so I'm not citing from the specific materials, but that was our general purpose. And so is it true that the Committee to Protect New Mexico Consumers really was um, in reaction to the fact that the commission in your mind did not act quickly enough to implement the ETA? No, no, I mean, I've, I've uh, been concerned with elected commissions around the country uh, for a long time. I've worked in Montana, in Arizona and New Mexico that all have elected commissions. I've also worked in Colorado, Oregon, Washington, uh, Utah and California that have appointed commissions. And it's been my longstanding view that appointment is a superior uh, form of uh, selecting commissioners for these expert expertises, the expertises needed to conduct that this job. And, you know, I've had spirited and good hearted debates with a whole range of folks, I believe, including yourself, uh, current sitting commissioners on that who, um, you know, supported the initiative. Um, uh, or, and some that opposed it. And, you know, I think ultimately, uh, based on the record of about 20 years of having elected commissioners and a whole range of concerns that have arisen during those 20 years, um, whether it was uh, lack of expertise or otherwise, um, there have been, I think, good reasons to believe that an appointed commission is a better, better way to select those commissioners. It wasn't about any particular commission, commissioner or any specific issue, uh, but rather a long range good government reform that brought me to support it. And you know, I believe it's the same set of issues that brought a majority of New Mexicans to ultimately support it when, when the issue was on the ballot sometime later. Did PNM contribute to your PAC and its purpose? The Your Honor, organization I object, we had, we had uh, you know, uh, questions there are, this is entirely irrelevant and obviously is, you know, interposed by NEE to try and inflame uh, the, the commissioners who opposed the uh, constitutional amendment. It's, it has nothing to do with the, the, this case or the merits of the case. Uh, it also infringes upon PNM's First Amendment rights uh, with respect to um, campaign contributions and what have you. You already ruled in the context of uh, a motion to compel by the uh, Albuquerque water utility that uh, this information was not discoverable. It, by definition, it's not uh, relevant. And so we, we do object to this line of questioning on relevance and also um, 
First Amendment grounds. Is that Mr. Alvidrez? Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Lee. Thank this, you, sir. This is Ms. Zur. I'd also like to add that this was not within the scope of his testimony. Mr. Nazi, do you have a response? It just goes to bias, and I believe it's relevant, and it wasn't in his testimony. He wouldn't put it in his testimony for obvious reasons. Um, we're going to sustain the objection, and Mr. Nazi, your, your, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's, oh, yeah, is there any redirect? Yes, I just have a couple of questions. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Long, could you please pull up JA Exhibit 2, which is the notice of filing of second amended stipulation? Yes, I will endeavor to do so. Yes, I've, I've pulled it up. Could you please turn to page, um, I'm going to give you the, the page 28 of exhibit A. In the PDF. I'm document, sorry, exhibit, which, which exhibit number? It's page 40 of 45 of the PDF. Okay. And could you read paragraph 56 to yourself? Yes. I think Ms. Nanasi asked you about the adequacy of the $12 million contained in the stipulation towards impacted communities. Um, would you agree that 56 targets additional, I'm sorry, I'm on, forgive me here. Uh, I'm sorry, 56, okay. We were talking about, she was talking about the San Juan decommissioning and I think you stated that the stipulation didn't address that at all. Do you wanna change your answer after reading paragraph 56? Yes, I appreciate the reminder. And it does look here like uh, it does address uh, working with stakeholders to find uh, alternative commercial uses uh, and, and, on, and on decommissioning. Okay, could you also, um, look at paragraph 47, which is um, on page 36 of 45 of the PDF. Yes. And did you read paragraph 47? Yes. Okay, and I'm sorry, I got my questions mixed up. I started asking you about that one earlier. Um, in addition to the 12 million for impacted communities, what does paragraph 47 provide as far as stipulation benefits for impacted communities? Alvin Grid commits to work with one or more of its affiliates to develop uh, at least 200 megawatts of uh, energy resources in the, in the affected community within two years of closing the proposed transaction. Okay, thank you. I don't have any additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Long. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, you're excused. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner, and thank you all. Okay, uh, Ms. Sir, uh, your next witness. Um, I CCAE calls Ona Porter. I hope she's in your waiting room right now, or she's entering the space. There she is. Just a moment, Judge. Ms. Porter, would you raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter not pending. Should be the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Good morning, Ms. Porter. A good afternoon, Ms. Porter. <laughs> it's been a long day. It has. Um, could you tell me if you have before you what's been marked as CCAE Exhibit 3? I do. Okay, great. 
So let me start by having you state your name and spell it for the record. My name is Ona, O-N-A, Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R. And what is your employment? I am the interim CEO and clean energy leader for Prosperity Works. On whose behalf are you testifying in this case? CCAE. All right. So um, could you identify CCAE Exhibit 3? What is that? That is my testimony on stipulation number two. Was that prepared by you or under your direct supervision? It was. Do you have any corrections to make? I do not. If I asked you the questions contained in your testimony in support of the stipulation, would your answers be the same today? Yes, they would. Is it correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is. Uh, CCAE moves to admit CCAE Exhibit 3. Any objection? CCAE Exhibit 3 is admitted. Did, do you have any more questions for Ms. Porter, Ms. Sir? I don't have any questions for her. Okay, so we can go to cross-examination. Uh, we'll with uh, the uh, Water Authority, uh, uh, Ms. Winter. No questions for Ms. Porter. Uh, Mr. Albright. Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner, just a couple. You reserve 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Porter. Good afternoon, Mr. Albright. Um, Again, Jeff Albright, Jeff Albright Law LLC on behalf of Bernalillo County. Uh, so just a few questions and it relates uh, to, your, uh, to your testimony in support of the stipulation. If you could turn to that, please. Yes. Uh, the um, beginning on page two and continuing to on page three, you talk about the, the benefits to, uh, to low income. Uh, customers. And on, uh, well, first of all, let me uh, uh, ask a question related to, uh, I guess it's on the uh, page, it's labeled as page three at the top. And uh, on that page, you list a number of counties with regard to those that have um, percentage between 20 and 37 percent of their income on home energy do you see that list I do do you do you happen to know what that percentage is for residents within Bernalillo County uh, it's certainly a range among low-income people but um, on average it exceeds 10 percent okay and what about Sandoval County or Santa Fe County I'm uncertain about Santa Fe specifically, but okay. Sandoval is higher than Bernalillo. Sandoval is higher than Bernalillo. Yes. Okay. So as far as, uh, as Ms. Reno's testimony uh, goes with regard to the rate credits and the arrearages, making adjustments in arrearage, increasing the rate credits, um, the economic development, um, and increases there, do you have, uh, well, does your organization have any objections to those requests by Bernalillo County? I'm not sure specifically what those requests are. If you can refer me to that, I will um, answer your question. I'm sorry. Right, well, let me just ask, uh, have, have you looked at uh, Ms. Reno's uh, testimony by any chance? In I have not. Uh, that addressed it, the second uh, amended step. Okay. okay, then that's fine. And so how would, with regard to the credits that are given to the, the uh, low income or not credits, but how would this program work with regard to the uh, identifying the low income that would be eligible for the uh, financial assistance? My assumption is that it would follow 
very much what is um, used today. And that is either a percentage of median income or it is the um, uh, actually the poverty line. And, and so based on that, would, would it be made by the uh, electric company? Would it be made by the PRC, some kind of combination or, or the community? Obviously the communities I would imagine would have some input, but can you explain how that would work? Well, as it's designed right now, it is the company that sets those standards. And does your organization interface with the company? Yes, we do. Okay, and if you would explain your role or just the mechanics of how that comes together, I think that would be helpful for my client to know. So um, the example I can give is, a, is a, a one that is current, and that is around uh, energy efficiency, the PNM Low Income Energy Efficiency Program. Right. And we um, have a partnership with PNM that has allowed us in the last 18 months to provide energy efficiency resources to 300 homes. We are about to launch 200 more in the, um, in the South Valley and 50 more in the International District. And uh, in our relationship with them, uh, there have been a couple of agreements that have been reached that have been very useful. And one of those is that um, there is no application process and uh, customers self-certify their eligibility. It certainly sounds like a worthwhile program, but how, um, what mechanism do you have in place to prevent somebody from fraudulently making a claim while you know, the person next door may be, be in dire straits? So, um, there are some broad categories that, uh, that sweep people into eligibility. One of those is if you're in a Title I school district, you're eligible. Another is if anyone in the home is on SNAP benefits, you're eligible. And the third one is actually presentation of um, a chart, which essentially uh, uh, relates family size and family income. And you indicate... Uh, it, which area, which one uh, applies to you. And then you are eligible, again, without application and without proving uh, that that's the case. It is self-certification. Could there be someone who would um, uh, cheat? <laughs> I suppose there could be, but in the communities where we're working, um, it's unfortunate for me to have to say that everybody's poor. And given the fact that there is such a broad need uh, mm -hmm. in our communities, I mean, and we see it in Bernalillo County, you know, I've done some volunteer tut tutoring in the, some of the poor sections of, uh, of Albuquerque uh, to the students and stuff. How do you prioritize with, with the limited resources that are there? Is it a first come first serve basis or how, how do you make sure that it's, it's spread either equitably or that you, you uh, reach, reach the ones who are most severely impacted? So um, we have an energy burden map. Uh, we're the only state in the nation that has one for the whole state. It was created by a group that's called GreenLink and they um, uh, begin with energy burden, but there are 10 other factors that are layered onto that that have to do with educational level, income, uh, family size, a whole variety of things. And that map is very accurate in targeting those most in need. And uh, we utilize that. But in addition to that, we have what I call a community to community model. I'm and sorry, that, could, you, could you repeat that, please? I missed I miss that. Sure. We have a community to community model. And what that means is that we have um, a relationship with trusted organizations in community that have trained uh, leaders and uh, trained and compensated leaders 
who identify uh, and qualify individuals in the community who are in need of this resource. And, um, and I think we really do an excellent job of that. With this model, we actually were able to complete 218 homes in 10 weeks last year. You have two minutes, Mr. Albright. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Uh, any interface at all with the schools? Uh, yes. And I just bring that up because uh, uh, I know, again, where, where I did uh, some of the tutoring, it was for Highland High School and the International District, you know, at Van Buren Middle School, some of our more, um, let me just say, econ economically challenged uh, folks that live in, in those areas. So do you interface at all with the uh, public schools at all and as part of this process? So specifically, you mentioned the International District and our project that we're doing there. And actually, one of the referral sources is an APS liaison. Okay, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I have no further questions for Ms. Porter. Uh, Ms. Porter, thank you very much for the information and the update and uh, your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Albright. Um, Ms. Zer, do you have any uh, redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Porter. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, you're excused. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, we're moving on to uh, Western Resource Advocates. Uh, Doug Howe. Uh, Ms. Beatles, are you going to, is he available, in fact? Uh, yes, I've been keeping him informed about the progress of the hearing and I, he knows that he's about to come up, so he should be uh, trying to log in to your Zoom hearing shortly. Mr. Schoenauer, this is Mr. Marks. Yes. Uh, I have also been keeping my witness informed. Uh, we were thinking he was planning to uh, give testimony tomorrow afternoon. Uh, it looks like Mr. Howe has 35 minutes reserved and then uh, Mr. Eisenfeld 20. No, but things have been moving pretty quickly. Can I assure Mr. Fisher that we will not be calling him today? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hearing Examiner, Peter Gould, uh, in the interest of moving this along, we are gonna waive our cross-examination of Mr. Howe, if that would help to move the hearing along. In addition, uh, since we're on a kind of a little delay here, uh, we spoke to Mr. Gorman, and he is available to appear on Wednesday if uh, he's needed to. He's currently scheduled for Thursday. Mr. Dauphiné uh, cannot, uh, however, he is only available on the 19th. Um, so if tomorrow it, it uh, appears that it would be helpful to have Mr. Gorman on, if we could establish a, a window of time at that, at that uh, time tomorrow. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll take care of that at the end of the hearing today. Let's sure. let's Thank you. With, uh, with Doug Howe. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I apologize. This is Kyle Tisdell with Community Groups. Yes. Um, yeah, I would just noted that um, Mr. Eisenfeld is scheduled to be the first witness tomorrow. Um, if you plan on getting to him this afternoon, I would have to let him know that. So um just want to confirm what what your plans are with him doug howe's going to be the last witness for today okay thank you so much and miss beatles go ahead thank you western resource advocates calls douglas j howe i'm here and would you like mr lee to swear him in your yes. honor yes Mr. Howe, would you please raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give the modern updating to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, sir. Okay, Dr. Howe, uh, for the record, could you please state your name and your profession? Uh, my name is Douglas Howe, and my profession 
is as an energy consultant. And you are currently self-employed and have been for some time, is that correct? That is true. On whose behalf are you testifying today? On behalf of Western Resource Advocates. So now I'm going to be seeking to admit the testimony that we, um, we helped you cause to be filed in this case, uh, referring to your direct testimony filed on April 2nd of this year, which we have labeled as Exhibit 3, WRA's Exhibit 3. Um, do you have that before you? I do. Um, do you have any changes or corrections, or did we make any changes or corrections to that testimony? Uh, we did not. If you were to answer today the same questions contained in WRA Exhibit 3, would your answers be the same? They would. And are they true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. I move the admission of WRA Exhibit 3. Any objection? WRA Exhibit 3 is admitted. Uh, now, Dr. Howe, please refer to your testimony in support of the stipulation which was filed in this docket on June 18th. Do you have that? I do. Uh, please note that we have labeled that as WRA Exhibit 5. Um, do you have any, or did we make any changes or corrections to WRA Exhibit 5? We did not. Yes, and if you were to answer today the same questions in Exhibit 5, would your answers be the same? They would. And are they true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. Okay, I move the admission of WRA Exhibit 5. Any objection? WRA Exhibit 5 is admitted. Okay, now referring to the third and final piece of testimony that we caused um, to be filed in this case. It's test, your testimony dated July 29th in response to stipulation opposition. Do you have that before you? Yes, I do. Uh, please note that we've labeled that as WRA Exhibit 7. Uh, did we make any changes or corrections to that either? No, we did not. And if you were to answer today the same questions in WRA Exhibit 7, would your answers be the same? They would. And are they true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. I move the admission of WRA Exhibit 7. Any objections? WRA Exhibit 7 is admitted. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. I now pass the um, witness, Dr. Howe, for cross-examination. Okay, uh, Ms. Winter, do you have any uh, cross for uh, Dr. Howe? No questions for Dr. Howe. Okay, Mr. Albright. Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. You reserve 10 minutes? Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Howe. Good afternoon, Mr. Albright. Well, we do have uh, something in common in, in that we're both self-employed. <laughs> um, I am with uh, Jeff Albright Law, LLC, and uh, as a sole practitioner, and uh, I'm here on behalf of Bernalillo County. Uh, I do have some questions, and if you would turn to your testimony in support of the stipulation, uh, a few specific uh, things that I want to cover. Um, would you hold on for just one minute while I um, access that? Sure, and that's the June 18, 2021. Okay, that is the stip testimony, that is the testimony, testimony in support of the stipulation. Support. Right, okay, I have that. Okay, and um, on the on page two of that, uh, you highlight the stipulation paragraph forty two with regard to the regional transmission organization. Do you see that? I do. Okay, and you quote there that the that uh, beginning at line twelve, you have an extensive quote uh, or the list the the provision in the stipulation with regard to PNM customers of PNM joining a regional transmission organization or independent system operator. And then you go on to explain that. Um, 
Is it your understanding that this would be for PNM joining the organization and not creating an organization on its own? Well, it it could. I think the answer to your question is no. Let me rephrase that. Let me let me start over again. I think the question that you're asking me is: Does this constrain PNM to join an existing RTO or ISO? or does it require PNM to create one of its own? And the, the paragraph, uh, as I understand it, uh, does not require PNM to join an existing RTO or ISO and leaves open the option that it, in coordination and conjunction with other utilities, could potentially create their own RTO or ISO. Okay, and looking at page five, you talk about the EIM entities and CASO as well. And you previously had a relationship or a position with CASO, correct? Correct. And what was that? I'm sorry, that's C-A-I-S-O. Thank you. And what was that relationship? I was on the governing body of the EIM. And with regard to the, you mentioned the creation of, uh, let me start over late in the day, I think. The EIN entities and, and CALSO or CASO are working on developing an extended day ahead market uh, EDAM and that this would not fulfill this commitment. And you go through an explanation. So with that as background, my question really is, has there been any update with regard to how the EDAM would work and what its uh, projected benefits would be since, uh, it, since you filed this testimony? Uh, no, there has not been an update. The initiative to develop this has been put back on track after having been taken, more or less pushed offline for a while, uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, the initiative is back on track and I expect there will be updates coming in the next several months. And if you'll go down to the middle of page six, you talk a little bit more about that, but you also uh, make reference to the transmission tariff uh, that covers the entire market footprint at line 15. That also applies to RTOs as well, doesn't it? Uh, allow me to read the sentence. Begins at line 12, I believe. Okay, could you uh, repeat, uh, repeat your question? Sure, and, and let me rephrase that just a bit. Isn't it also true that under an RTO, the tariffs are allocated among the different participants in the uh, RTO? Um, when you say the tariffs are allocated. Transmission, tariff, transmission yeah, I, tariffs. Yeah, I understand the, the tariff is a document filed with FERC. So I'm not sure what you mean when you say that it's allocated to various participants. Well, what I'm trying to understand is, is whether or not tariffs that are filed with uh, FERC, how are, how are they apportioned among the different participants? Do you, do you mean tariff revenues? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, in an RTO construct, the, the RTO um, operator has basically the authority, the sole authority to change and file the tariff document with FERC. Um, basically what it does though, is that the um, revenue requirement from each of the participating transmission owners is consolidated into one big uh, revenue requirement that formulates the tariff transmission rates, the various tra transmission rates. 
And then the revenues of that are redistributed back by the RTO operator to the various uh, uh, transmission owners uh, so that they are made whole under their revenue requirement. Okay, would you turn to page eight, please? Okay. Um, and then by way of background, I believe it's been stated before that there have been several attempts over the years to create an RTO or maybe a better way of saying it as many years have gone by without the creation of an RTO. And yet we have several initiatives apparently here in Nevada, Colorado, uh, and then obviously this uh, initiative as well. Do you know or have any knowledge whether Avangrid, Iberdrola, or any affiliate has been involved in the Nevada and Colorado legislation that's mentioned on page uh, eight? I do not have any knowledge of their involvement. Have you been involved in any of those legislative efforts? I was involved in the Colorado legislative effort. And you say that has passed to create an RTO uh, in Colorado, not later than January 1, 2030? Uh, subject to certain uh, caveats, yes. Okay, and what are those caveats? That it be in the uh, public interest, there has to be a public interest finding by the Colorado PUC. Uh, the final design has to be subject to, uh, not FERC has the final uh, approval, obviously, but it has to go through the Colorado PUC approval process first. And it has to meet certain criteria that the legislature thought was important, such as meeting Colorado, helping to meet Colorado's 100% clean energy mandate, as well as uh, making some contribution to the economic development of the state. And how would it determine or be determined what companies participate um, or what constitutes the region from Colorado's perspective? Is it a solicitation of companies or what mechanism to determine who would participate if Colorado ends up uh, initiating the RTO? Um, I think the answer to your question is that utilities meet and talk all the time about um, various subjects, uh, but one of them is transmission planning. In fact, under FERC has a requirement that transmission owning utilities band together to talk about joint planning of transmission. And here in the Southwestern United States, that is accomplished through an organization called West Connect, which includes, for example, Public Service of Colorado as well as Arizona Public Service, uh, PNM, and a number of other utilities as well. Uh, that would be a vehicle, for example, where the conversation could well begin. Does it anticipate including um, electric cooperatives? Uh, it certainly could. Electric, but let me just, just add to that. Electric cooperatives are usually not transmission owners. All right, they're, they're generally referred to as load serving entities and distribution utilities. In the particular case of New Mexico and Colorado, uh, most of the cooperatives are served by tri-state generation and transmission. They would be the transmission owner that would most likely be a part of those conversations. And then they have member companies that are part of that, that organization, correct? That, that's right. Mr. Albright, your, your time is running out. Okay, let me just ask one more question and this concerns your additional testimony in general with regard to board makeup. Um, if I mischaracterize your testimony, please correct me. But in general, you oppose having a majority of independent directors and that the independent majority would have fiduciary duty to customers 
instead of shareholders. Is that a fair representation of your testimony on the board makeup? Well, no, I would not frame it that way. Okay. Um, your first statement was correct. I'm, I am not supportive of a majority uh, board consisting of independent directors. Okay, and then why this, not? That's the, that's the following question then. Your and, Honor, um, the experts are allowed to explain their answers. And I believe Mr. Albright cut him off and I understand that he's short on time, but I certainly wanna hear what Dr. Howe had to say. And I, I'm fine with him explaining uh, his answer. Well, as I, I cut you off, Dr. Howe, my apologies to you. Um, I'll, I'll continue with the hearing examiner's permission. Yes, go ahead. Um, my position on independent directors, um, which I laid out in the, that testimony that you're referring to, was that whether they're independent or dependent, they would have a fiduciary obligation to protect the investment of the shareholder. And so I don't see that having a majority independent uh, board of directors it is going to accomplish anything. And I would oppose it if this became a situation in which uh, it caused the uh, applicants, joint applicants to walk away from the merger. I think it offers, I mean, a majority independent board of directors does not offer the customer protection that some think that it will. Um, and that it would not be in the customer's interest to jettison the benefits of the merger um, because of this one issue, for example. Okay, Mr. Uh, Sean Hour, uh, I have no further questions for Dr. Howe. Dr. Howe, thank you very much for uh, your answers and for your testimony, appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Beatles, do you have any redirect? Uh, yes. I would like to give Dr. Howe a chance to um, clear up what I believe are some um, uh, potential for uh, incomplete or inaccurate information based on uh, the way that the questions were framed. I just uh, wanna give him an opportunity to clarify certain issues. So for example, when Mr. Albright was asking you about the difference between PNM joining and RTO. There's some feedback and it must be on my end because I, are you all hearing it? No? Okay. Yeah, I, I hear it a little bit, uh, Ms. Beatles. Yeah, since I didn't hear it the rest of the hearing, I'm thinking it's on my end. I'm not sure what to do about it. Maybe I'll just not project my voice in a certain direction. Um, so when Mr. Albright was asking you, Dr. Howe, about PNM, joining versus creating an RTO on its own. Um, can PNM create an RTO on its own? No, it can't. FERC would not accept an RTO filing from a single utility. It would carry no benefits. It would not meet the eight functions and four characteristics of an RTO. And RTOs have to have more than one participant or member, correct? Yes, one of the characteristics is that it has to have scope and scale. A single utility cannot uh, meet that requirement. FERC has been very clear about that. And a single utility cannot control an RTO, is that correct? An RTO's board has to be independent. And I, I, I use that word with some trepidation in this particular conversation. But under FERC rules, Independence specifically means that there is no financial affiliation between any board member or any market participant, which would include the utilities themselves. Mm -hmm. And is there currently an RTO or ISO that PNM could join? Uh, in theory, it could join the CAISO. Um, that is an RTO. Um, that is the only RTO here in the West. Uh, SPP, which is the RTO um, in the Midwest part of the United States and also 
uh, SVP serves a portion of southeastern New Mexico. Um, they could potentially join that one, but it would be more difficult to do so. Mm -hmm. um, you were also asked some questions about the extended day ahead market, otherwise known as EDAM. And uh, in the context in follow-up to a question about the energy imbalance market, is EDAM a market option available that will become potentially available to utilities instead of EIM? Is that a substitute for EIM or is it in addition to EIM participation? If it becomes available, it would be um, a layer on top of the EIM. So a, any utility that wanted to join this hypothetical EDAM would also have to be a member of the EIM. And are the services offered by EIM and EDAM different? Yes, they are different. EIM offers real-time and balance uh, market. Uh, the EDAM would offer a day ahead uh, energy market. And later with reference to your testimony in support of the stipulation page six, you were asked uh, further questions about EDAM and its transmission tariff. I just want to ask a question to clear up whether EDAM is a substitute for an RTO. No, it is not a substitute for an RTO. RTOs are the single market operator and also uh, manage and maintain, enforce and apply the single tariff, transmission tariff. Um, in the EDAM, the participating utilities would still continue to maintain their own separate transmission tariffs. Okay, and um, one more question, Dr. Howe. Um, you were asked about a question in reference to your statements about the legislation in Nevada and Colorado requiring their utilities to join an RTO by a certain date. And you were asked whether Avon Grid was involved. Do you have any reason to believe that Avon Grid or Iberdrola was involved in that legislation? I have no reason to believe it, no. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, that is all that I have for redirect, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Howe. Uh, thanks for your testimony, you're excused. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's go off the record for a minute and talk about uh, this is for at least a day or two or three. Uh, I mean, looking at the time that's reserved for these uh, witnesses tomorrow, we're, we're certainly going to get, we certainly will get through them tomorrow and very quickly. Uh, which means that uh, we should be moving on also tomorrow with the witnesses uh, that's, that are scheduled for Wednesday. Is, is there a problem? Does anyone have a problem in uh, making those witnesses available um, tomorrow? Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, Kyle Tisdell for community groups. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, we have obviously the bulk of our witnesses scheduled for tomorrow, although several of those witnesses don't have any cross-examination. We have um, Carol Davis scheduled for Wednesday the 18th. Um, she should be available to um, participate on Tuesday. Uh, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, I sent an email in this regard last week, and, and I'm not sure that I saw a response from you. Um, Ms. Davis has asked whether a uh, Navajo translator can be made available for her cross-examination, and so I just wanted to um, raise that issue with you now as well. Well, we, we do not have a, uh, a Navajo translator uh, available. Uh, and I noticed there's only five minutes of uh, cross-examination uh, scheduled for uh, Ms. Davis. So I, I don't really believe that a Navajo translator would really be uh, cost-effective, let's say. 
I, I certainly appreciate that. I just was simply um, passing the request of Ms. Davis along so I can, I can let her know she should be able to uh, make it through those five minutes just fine. But, um, but she is available for, um, uh, she, she will be available for cross tomorrow if, if need be. Well, also, uh, Mr. Tisdale, I wanted to point out that uh, the, we will not need to have Mr. Hernandez or uh, Ms. Kitso be available tomorrow. Their testimony has been stipulated in. So the only, we're, we're going to be starting with Mike Eisenfeld, then moving to Steve Chris, then moving to Jeremy Fisher, then to the witnesses that are currently scheduled for Wednesday. Uh, yes, I, I um, neither Mr. Hernandez nor Ms. Kitso um, are planning on being available because of the their testimony was already admitted. So um, they are they're not planning on um, being available tomorrow. Um, but but thank you for uh, the reminder of that, sir. Mr. Albright, will uh, Ms. Reno be available tomorrow? Um, I I will have to check. I I know that. Uh, she was not going to be available till sometime this week and we would prefer if we could, uh, I can check the, uh, this evening and get back to everybody. Uh, if we could have her uh, either, either late morning or early afternoon since she is on the East Coast, that would be most helpful. Uh, plus some just personal commitment she has with uh, family obligations during the day. Um, I think that would be helpful and I can certainly check and get back to everybody everyone. So she may be available. She may be available. She may be available. And I would say uh, probably late morning or early afternoon at the uh, earliest. Okay. And uh, to virtue, uh, David Arthur and Vince Tamarello, will they be available tomorrow? Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I have informed them of a possibility. Mr. Tamarello has responded saying he is available. I have not heard from Mr. Uh, Arthur at this point. Uh, I would, ex I have no reason to believe he wouldn't be, but I have not heard from him. Okay. And uh, Mr. Gould has already told us that uh, Mr. Duff Duffinet is not available. Wait, he's not available till Thursday. Is that right, Mr. Gould? Mr. Gould, are you there? I, I had to unmute. I'm. I apologize. I had to unmute, and I couldn't find the darn button. Uh, yes, Mr. Dolphin is only available on Thursday, due to prior commitments in other jurisdictions. But Mr. Gorman uh, indicated to us this afternoon that he would be available anytime on Wednesday. On on Wednesday. Yes, I could ask him. He's. He's in St. Louis, so he's already gone home for the day, but I I could send him a text and ask if he could appear sometime tomorrow, if that would be helpful to keep the schedule moving. It, it may be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd appreciate Yeah, if you do check with him. Okay, I will text him and get back to you as soon as I hear. And Ms. Beatles, would uh, Mr. O'Connell potentially be available tomorrow? You're on mute, Ms. Beatles. I know, I was saying wait. Um, thank you, Mr. Lee. Oh, and happy birthday, by the way. It's still thank your you birthday, man. right? <laughs> um, I don't know, I need to check with him. If you, can Can you wait a few minutes, like three minutes while I go quickly confer with him? He's in the office. Oh, okay. I mean, I think we're, this is going to be sort of fluid as we work our way through the next few days. I'm just trying to get a, sort of a pool of witnesses who are flexible enough to uh, uh, testify uh, when we need them, when there's time for them. And, and Ms. Winter, uh, do you know anything about the, the availability of the Garretts? Uh, yes, I made inquiry this morning, Mr. Examiner. Um, Mr. Mark Garrett is available Tuesday, I mean, I'm sorry, Wednesday afternoon. And um, I do have an email in to um, both Mr. Alvidres and Mr. Haverly as to whether or not we could 
uh, get Mr. David Garrett excused or just stipulated in. So um, I, as soon as I know more, as soon as I hear from them on David, I will I can provide you with information. But it does look like Mr. Mark Garrett is available Wednesday afternoon. Okay, thank you. I, I noticed though in my notes that uh, Mr. Albright has cross examination for David Garrett, as does uh, as does WRA. So they would also need to waive cross. Well, I was checking with joint applicants first. If it's an if it's a no go, then um, then I don't okay. even have to bother the other two folks. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Mr. Hearing Examiner. Yes. Yes, uh, Jeff Albright. Uh, I just got an email back from my uh, witness, from my expert, uh, Miss Reno, and she is available uh, late uh, morning or early afternoon tomorrow. Okay. And Ms. Beatles, did you check with Mr. O'Connell? Um, yes, I did check with him. Uh, we would prefer that uh, Mr. O'Connell uh, not go tomorrow. However, um, if you um, do need to move him up um, to, to maximize time, we will be as accommodating as possible and move things around as necessary. Okay. So he's flexible, as I gather. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, let's. Uh, well, we'll get back to it again tomorrow to to flesh this out a little more. But uh, for now, for sure, we'll have uh, Mr. Eisenfeld, Mr. Chris, and Mr. Fisher go first, and then uh, it sounds like uh, Ms. Reno will be. Uh, that was. I mean that. That sequence should fit her. That that would put her on a late morning or early afternoon, and then uh, Ms. Davis, uh, Mr. Arthur, and, and Mr. Tumorello, and uh, and then maybe Mike Michael Gorman. How does that sound? Seminar, would you like me to um, ask Mr. Sandberg if he's available for Thursday? Then yes. Those other people are going on from Thursday to Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously that is the obvious uh, next move is to move those people who are scheduled for Friday, move them up into Thursday. Yes, I will have that answer for you first thing tomorrow morning. And I guess uh, same for staff and. Uh, yeah. Mr. Hearing Examiner. I think the, the only limitation that I understand for staff's testimony is that Mr. Evans won't be available on Thursday. Um, he would be available Thursday afternoon. Okay. okay. Mr. Hearing Examiner, this is Jane Yee for the city of Albuquerque. Larry Blank is available on Thursday. Okay. As well as Friday, if needed. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Hearing Examiner, Mr. Albright again. Go ahead. And who is after Mr. Uh, Tumorella tomorrow? Uh, I believe it would be Mr. Gorman. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I, I, this is Rick Albedris. I, I do have a, a question. I, I note that. Uh, Ms. Davis, Mr. Arthur, and Mr. Tumorello, the only party that signed up for any examination, it seems to be quite limited in time, is the county. Uh, is there any, any thought that uh, uh, the county may, may waive cross of these witnesses and we can move things along even more, more promptly? Um, I do have some specific questions. Um, I've already indicated that to uh, to uh, SJCA with regard to Ms. Davis, and I do have some specific questions for MSR and Los Alamos as well. I don't think it'll take long, hence the short uh, time frame listed, but I do have a couple of things I want to get into the record. Okay. Well, let's go back on the record. Um, Mr. Lee. Yeah, there you 
Okay, while we were off the record, we were talking about, about this order for the next few days and uh, getting an idea of who is, uh, uh, which witnesses are flexible or not. So we're going to start tomorrow with uh, Michael Eisenfeld, uh, then Steve Chris, Jeremy Fisher, Maureen Reno, Carol Davis, David Arthur, Vince Tumorello, and Michael Gorman. Uh, for starters, <laughs> I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll use that order and uh, we'll see how we go uh, throughout the day and, uh, and maybe make uh, additions or some substitutions. But for planning purposes, that's that's what we're we're intending to do tomorrow. Does anyone anyone to talk about before we uh, finish today? Okay hear anything uh, let's uh, we're in recess until tomorrow morning at nine good night